begin our meeting. I see that we are currently being live streamed. So I wanna say good morning to everyone. Welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. We are going to begin our day with committee introductions as always. And then we'll take our bills in the um, order that is listed on our committee schedule. And I will just um, review that for all of those who are listening. First, we'll hear um, LD 585 and then LD 906, then uh, 1907, and we'll conclude with 1665. And um, we will also take up some language reviews on legislation that is ready to be reported out of committee. And we'll probably do that right after we get back from our midday break. And so um, with that, I will just call on committee members to introduce themselves. And uh, Representative Thorne, we can start with you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning from Carmel. My name is Jim Thorne. I represent House District 103, which include the towns of Carmel, Herman, and a portion of Etna up in Mild, Penobscot County. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, all. I am Steve Moriarty representative from House District 45, which is Cumberland and a part of Gray. Representative Babbage. How do you do? My name is Chris Babbage. I am the state representative representing House District number eight, which is most of the town of Kennebunk. Uh, representative Poirier. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Jennifer Poirier. I represent House District 7, which is Oskowian and part of Madison. And I will apologize in advance. I have a couple of other meetings today, so I will be in and out of the hearings. Representative Babbage? Uh, I've, I've gone already. Madam oh, I'm Chair. sorry. My squares are moving around. <laughs> Representative Evangelos. Good morning, everybody. Two Babbages is better than one. Uh, Good morning, Senator Carney and everyone. Um, Jeffrey Evangelos, House District 91, and I reside in Friendship. And, and good morning to all the panelists as well. Uh, Representative Newell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rena Newell, and I serve as the Passamaquoddy Tribal Representative. Representative Reckitt. Um, good morning. My, uh, my name is Lois Reckett and I represent uh, District 41, which is the ocean end of South Portland. Representative Sheehan. Thanks, Madam Chair and good morning, everyone. My name is Erin Sheehan and I represent House District 12, which is part of Biddeford. Thank you and Representative Moriarty, I'm sorry, I know that um, people are, are jumping on and off camera. Have you had a chance to introduce Hi. yourself? Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, and um, Representative Libby. Good morning all, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. My name is Laurel Libby and I'm state representative from Auburn. I represent District 64, which is part of Auburn and all of my niche. Senator Sanborn. Thank you, Senator Kearney. My name is Heather Sanborn, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I represent Senate District 28, which is half of Portland half of Westbrook and I regret that I'll only be able to join for about an hour today before my other committee gets going. Thank you and co-chair Harnett. Thank you Madam Chair and good morning to my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee and the members of the public joining us today. My name is Tom Harnett. I represent House District 83 which includes the town of Farmingdale and the city of Gardner where I reside. Thank you. And we are joined today by our OPLA analysts, Peggy Reinch and Janet Stockwell. And then also by our Susan here today. Thank you. And I'm just gonna give a moment because I think that we might have some um, audio problems going on here. Oh, okay, I think we're all set. All right, and um, I'll introduce myself as well. I'm Ann Carney. I'm the Senate co-chair of this committee, and I represent Senate District 29, which includes 
South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, where I live, and a little bit of Scarborough. And with that, we've concluded committee introductions and we'll start our public hearing on our first bill today. And this is a continuation of a um, public hearing that was tabled in the spring of 2021. LD 585, an act to restore to the Penobscot Nation and the Passamaquoddy tribe, the authority to exercise jurisdiction over the Federal Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010. And um, there is an amendment to this bill, which has been made publicly available um, in advance of the public hearing. And it has um, been posted on the website under the bill number 585. And we are joined now by the bill sponsor, Representative Talbot Ross. Welcome Representative, and I'm gonna turn the virtual floor over to you. Well, good morning. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and the distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Rachel Talbert Ross. I represent House District 40, which is part of Portland. Thank you for this opportunity to present an amendment to legislation I submitted, LD 585, an act to restore to the Penobscot Nation and Passamaquoddy Tribe the authority to exercise jurisdiction under the Federal Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010. It is an honor to be with you today in this pivotal moment in our history and to present this amendment at the request of the Penobscot Nation, Passamaquoddy Tribe, and the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. I would like to start with a heartfelt and sincere thank you to the tribal leaders and members who have courageously fought to restore what has always been inherently theirs, sovereignty. I also want to thank and acknowledge the more than 1,500, 1,500 Mainers from across the state in all walks of life who testified earlier this week and over 100 organizations that have stood together with one voice to say it is time for Maine to right our wrongs. The language of my amendment was shared with committee members and interested parties on Monday. As you know, when a sponsor presents an amendment to his or her legislation, the amendment is often presented after the public hearing at the work session. In this scenario, the interested parties, which includes myself, the governor's office, the attorney general, the Wabanaki leaders and other legislators, wanted to provide the amendment language to committee members and interested parties ahead of the public hearing, given that we are changing the substance of the legislation. The amendment I am presenting today replaces the original language of LD 585 with a new bill that will be entitled, An Act to Enhance Tribal State Collaboration to revise the tax laws regarding the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, the Passamaquoddy Tribe, and the Penobscot Nation, and to authorize off-track betting facilities and federally recognized Indian tribes to conduct sports wagering. The new language reflects the substance of negotiations between the three Wabanaki nations and the governor's office over the past seven months. The attorney general and his staff, the co-chairs of this committee and myself attended almost all of those meetings, which started off every other week and eventually turned into weekly meetings. The leaders of the three Wabanaki nations decided to engage in discussions on those issues to see what, if any, progress could be made. And over the course of the next seven months and hundreds of hours of discussion, there was indeed some progress made. The amendment I present to you today is the fruit of those discussions. However, the provisions of the amendment are not changes to the settlement acts. They are not a restoration of sovereignty. In fact, the amendment reflects the only specific issues that the administration was willing to discuss with the tribal nations. Those include the issues of taxation, gaming, increasing dialogue between the state and the Wabanaki nations and criminal jurisdiction over tribal lands. 
the, con the contained issues in LD 1626, which you heard earlier this week, were not on the table for discussions. The governor's representatives made it clear that she was only willing to discuss the specific four issues and any progress on these issues could not be implemented through the amendments to the settlement acts. I do wanna be clear and honest with the people of Maine. LD 585 is no substitute for LD 1626 and the leaders of the Wabanaki nations do not view it as a substitute. While it admittedly does not reflect our best step forward or what is needed for history to document the right and just action for us to take, it is one that leads us further on the pathway. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. I am in favor of taking this step in the right direction. But I also want everyone to understand that the Wabanaki nations and myself, and hopefully my fellow legislators are continuing to fight to get LD 1626 enacted in law. While this amendment does not attempt to modernize or amend the settlement act, it does represent the first time I am aware of that the three Wabanaki nations and the governor's office have negotiated legislation that would provide economic opportunity to the Wabanaki nations and people. I do believe this amendment is a step in the right direction and hopefully a step towards understanding that the Wabanaki nations are not our enemies, they're not our opponents, but they are our neighbors. We need to start treating them as such, particularly, 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 I said it three times, particularly four times, because it is their Aboriginal land on which we live and work. The Wabanaki nations were here long before any of us, and they will be here long after those of us are here today. The substance of the amendment I present today is comprised of multiple parts, but there are really three main components. The first component of the amendment is about improving dialogue between the Wabanaki nations and the state this is done by requiring certain state agencies to designate tribal liaisons who will be responsible for developing and implementing a policy that promotes positive government to government relations between the state and the Wabanaki nations. This also includes outreaching and communicating with the Wabanaki nations when the agencies are taking actions that might substantially and uniquely affect any Wabanaki nation and their people. Additionally, the governor will be required to meet at least annually with the leaders of the Wabanaki nations in a tribal state summit. The hope is that forcing these conversations to happen on a regular basis, at least once a year, will lead to more progress in relationship building amongst the governments. The discussions over the last seven months led to the provisions of this amendment. So hopefully there can be more progress if we keep the discussions going. The second component of this amendment would implement a few of the same tax rules that apply to tribal nations and citizens throughout the United States. The Wabanaki nation governments and their citizens would not be subject to state sales and income tax for activities occurring on tribal trust or reservation lands. And the tribal nations would be able to generate sales tax revenues from sales on their own lands. These are important and necessary steps to support tribal governments and economies and will also benefit the surrounding non-tribal communities. Additionally, the amendment would change state tax laws to treat the three Wabanaki nations as governments and not try to differentiate between when the tribal nations are acting in a government versus business capacity for purposes of applying the state sales tax and income tax laws. The goal of these provisions are to improve the economic opportunities available to the Penobscot nation, the Passamaquoddy tribe, and the Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. 
Encouraging economic development within these tribal nations and on their lands will benefit them, the surrounding communities, and indeed the state. The goal is also to allow the three tribal nations to keep the taxes collected from the sales occurring on their lands so that they can use this revenue to invest in their own infrastructure and government programs. The third component of this amendment legalizes and establishes a regulatory framework for sports wagering within the state. Up to seven licenses for in-person sports wagering will be available to licensed off-track betting facilities. Each Wabanaki nation will be authorized to conduct mobile sports wagering. 10% of the adjusted growth sports wagering receipts will go to the state with a portion of those funds going towards the Gambling Addiction Prevention and Treatment Fund, the State Harness Racing Commission, and the Cyrus State Fund and the Agriculture Fair Promotion Fund. Lastly, the amendment includes a provision saying that the Wabanaki nations have the right to conduct any future forms of mobile gaming that may be legalized in the state. We need to stop shutting these tribes out of economic opportunities. If in the future, the state chooses to legalize other forms of mobile gaming, then we need to make sure that the tribes are included. I believe the provisions of this amendment will help the Wabanaki nations achieve some form of economic self-sufficiency, but also provide the economic stimulus to rural areas of our state. The Wabanaki nations employs lots of Mainers who are not tribal citizens, and they spend their money locally, allowing them to access these economic benefits or spur the regional economies. The provisions of the amendment I present today will begin to provide economic benefits to the Wabanaki nations, but they do not begin. They do not begin to mitigate. But they do not begin to mitigate the emotional trauma that this state has inflicted on the Wabanaki people for the past 40 years. And please know that the provisions of this amendment are not sovereignty. The Wabanaki nations do not view them as restoring any aspect of their sovereignty, nor are the provisions of this amendment or LD 585, a substitute for the Wabanaki Nation's <clears throat> ongoing efforts to restore their sovereignty through enactment of LD 1626. But this amendment does take three significant steps to help our state government make better informed decisions to provide the Wabanaki nations and their citizens tools to develop rural economies and to deliver essential benefits to Maine's rural communities. This is a first step towards correcting 40 years of wrongs. The benefits of this amendment I present today should not be ignored. So with that, I apologize um, for getting upset, I do, but I offered this amendment to LD 585 in the hope that this committee and this legislature will approve this legislation and pass this legislation, put it on the governor's desk for her to sign this session. Again, my apologies, but I thank you for your time and attention. And on behalf of the people of Maine, I believe it is time for us to do the right thing to pass this uh, legislation, to pass this amendment, uh, but to always work towards our better selves, to always work towards our better selves. And I hope that you will see that way uh, with the passage of LD 1626. 
and bring about the true and right inherent rights of the Wabanaki nations. Thank you very much. Many thanks Representative Talbot Ross for presenting this bill and this amendment today. Um, as you know, from um, being before the Judiciary Committee previously, you're welcome to stay on the panel during the public hearing on this bill. Um, Madam Chair, I will uh, thank you for that. Um, I am going to ask um, the committee for, for one indulgence, and that is I um, am I'm also uh, sitting in as a member of the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee today, uh, and I, I am due in that committee momentarily. Um, so I apologize as I will need to leave to take some votes in criminal justice, but I will certainly, excuse me, be back to this committee um, if I can to sit as a panelist uh, to uh, witness, bear witness to the other testimonies on this, um, on this bill. So I will probably be coming in and out of this committee during the day, um, but my heart will certainly be here with this, with this bill. Um, and I apologize uh, for having to take um, a break uh, during these uh, deliberations. Thank you. Are you, do you have time before you head over to criminal justice for committee questions? I would um, uh, respectfully ask that the committee uh, reserve the questions uh, for the tribal lawyers, uh, for the tribal um, uh, leaders who may be testifying today. Um, and I certainly can be available for the work session, uh, but it would be, um, it would be, um, it would be uh, preferred that I'm able to, to go to um, the criminal justice committee uh, if I could. Uh, yeah. Um, immediately. Yeah, we we understand that. I know that Representative Reckett is in the same situation. So um, we do appreciate you being here in committee. Matt, I see that there are three hands up with questions for the bill sponsor. Please make a note of your questions. And um, I will remember to call on you first when we do the work session on 585. And that was Representative Thorne, Libby and Evangelo. So I will I will make sure of that. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Representative Talbot Ross. Representative Libby, oh, did you have your hand up for another purpose? I, and mine is, I do have questions for the sponsor, but I'm happy to wait till she returns. Um, but I do have, uh, I guess what is a procedural question, having now read the amendment, and it is more probably properly addressed to you um, as the chair, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and that would be that as I've read through this amendment, um, there's a, a great deal that seems applicable to both the tax committee and the committee that handles gaming. And I'm curious if at some point they will be involved in the conversation on this amendment as it is um, so heavily areas that they deal with on a regular basis and that we do not. Okay, thank you for raising that point. I. Um... We'll look into, I will consult with the chairs of those committees and see if they are, um, and think a little bit more about your suggestion. And what I would say is that that's a great um, topic for us to address between now and the work session, but it's um, today is a public hearing and this is really about hearing from members of the public who have signed up to provide testimony on this legislation. So I think, um, I thank you for your question. I will answer it, but not uh, during the public hearing. Thank you. And Representative Evangelos. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Talbot Ross, I just wanted to thank you for your leadership. <clears throat> you served on this committee with me. <clears throat> you know it's the committee of tragedy and tears. Don't ever apologize for the emotions that are evoked in this committee. It runs a full gamut of injustices. And thank you for your leadership. That's all I had, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank you. All right, committee members um, and members of the public who are present, we will move on to hearing from members of the public. The way we will do this is we'll take proponents and then opponents and then neither for nor against. If there are legislators who are co-sponsors of the bill who wish to speak, we would let them speak first. And so at this point, I will 
turn to those in the attendee part of the meeting and ask if there is any member of the legislature who is a co-sponsor or would otherwise like to speak on LD 585 to please raise your electronic hand and keep it raised until we bring you over to the panel. And I see Representative uh, Senator Baldacci. Um, and so he is the only legislator and I will bring him over to the panel and we can hear from him. And hi, good morning, Senator Baldacci. Thank you for joining us. Can you first let us know, are you a, a proponent, opponent, neither for nor against? I am a, a opponent of the amendment, but I'm a proponent of the original bill. So I'm happy to speak whenever the, the uh, committee wishes me to speak. It was, it was uh, unclear which way I was supposed to register when it asked you if you support the bill or not, so. Okay, and are you, um, are you a co-sponsor? No. Okay. There, there are. I'm going to ask you to hold off, and then, and sure. if you could please speak, um, we'll call you first for the opponents. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll um, turn to those members of the public who wish to speak in in favor of the legislation, and ask you to please raise your electronic hands and keep them raised until. Um, I am able to bring you over to the panel to provide testimony. Okay, and um, first we will hear from Jerry Reed, who is the governor's counsel. And uh, Representative Harnett, is your hand up to speak or because you're going to be timing? It, it, it was to check if you wanted me to time and uh, put a three minute clock on all persons testifying. Yes. Could you please, um, and just to let everyone know, Representative Harnett's hand is up because that way he stays in the same place on the panel. And you'll note that he will be running a three minute clock after which we'll open the floor up for committee questions. And with that, um, Jerry Reed, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. You can introduce yourself and begin whenever you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Farnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jerry Reed. I'm counsel to Governor Mills, and I'm here this morning to testify in support of the sponsor's amendment to LD 585. Last summer, representatives of the Holton Band of Malisee Indians, the Passamaquoddy Tribe, the Penobscot Nation and the governor's office began meeting to look for common ground on issues of, of importance to the tribes that could form the basis of agreed upon legislation. We started with two hour meetings twice a month, then moved to once a week, and more recently have been meeting several times a week. We first identified several concepts that we believed held the most promise for agreement, then reduced those concepts to working outlines and finished with the painstaking work of, de of developing statutory language that captured our mutual intent. This amendment is the product of that effort. The issues that we settled on included a tribal state collaboration process on certain state agency decisions that stand to impact the tribes, changes to our tax laws to support tribal communities, and authorizing the tribes to benefit from gaming activity in a manner that is fair and creates no risks for non-tribal communities. We started by negotiating the terms of a tribal state collaboration statute. The idea here is to make institutional changes in how tribal and state governments interact, focusing on matters that stand to have a unique impact on the tribes. Agencies whose work intersects with tribal issues would designate a tribal liaison and adopt a policy that ensures tribes have a meaningful opportunity to be heard before making important decisions that affect the tribes process would improve communication and encourage respectful dialogue, which is the foundation for a strong relationship. 
We then turn to the issue of taxation. With invaluable assistance from Maine Revenue Service and the Attorney General's Office, we examined how Maine's tax laws could be amended to deliver financial and economic benefits to the tribes and tribal members who reside in Indian Territory. The negotiated changes will have little impact on the state's general fund because tribal members make up a small percentage of Maine's overall population. But they should incentivize economic development on tribal lands and provide meaningful relief within some of our most economically marginalized communities. Next was gaming. Our group identified online sports wagering as a way for the tribes to benefit from gaming activity in Maine. This proposal would provide a significant economic opportunity that brings with it none of the controversy that has historically been associated with new casino development. This part of the bill is structured similarly to LD 1352, another sports wagering proposal currently on the appropriations table, and like that bill, would allow licensed off-track betting facilities to offer sports wagering within those facilities. I think we we're all aware when we began these conversations that trust can be hard to earn and easy to lose, and nowhere is that more true than in the context of tribal state relations. It wasn't always apparent that we would be able to reach an agreement on this package. But even if we didn't, we were determined to have a respectful and constructive dialogue that would help to build trust. I wanna thank the tribal leaders who were willing to give this process a chance and the tribal representatives who worked so hard on this effort. The fact that we were able to reach this agreement is very exciting. If enacted, it would be the most important tribal legislation in more than 40 years and should serve as a building block toward further progress. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for your testimony. And I see that there are uh, several committee members with questions. Uh, Representative Libby, you may go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you for being here today, Mr. Reed, on behalf of the governor. Uh, I have a few questions. Um, the first one is regarding um, the tax issue. And I appreciate that the governor and I are on the same page that decreasing taxes improves economic opportunities and encourages economic development. Uh, I am curious about the impact on surrounding areas in Maine. And so I just wanted to ask, does that um, equal sales tax exemption on uh, cigarettes and alcohol and how will that impact surrounding communities near the tribal um, areas? Is it gonna give them a competitive edge over uh, the local stores? Yeah, thank you for that question. And um, at the outset, I should probably lower expectations that I can serve as an expert on, on taxation issues. I'm not a tax attorney and that's why it was very helpful to us to have help from Maine Revenue Services and the AG's office tax team in the development of this package. So some technical questions I think may be better deferred to the work session. Um, but as to that question, the sales tax exemptions that were negotiated are sales tax exemptions that would apply to purchases being made by tribal members and tribal entities in tribal territory. So I think the concern that you, you're raising about um, a competitive disadvantage for non-tribal businesses in the, in the adjacent communities is not implicated by this package. So is there an ID component to this then? Because how will the, the folks at a tribal if they're selling someone cigarettes, how will they know for sure that they're a member of the tribe versus not? Um, and I guess that's what I would be speaking to if, if someone's purchasing cigarettes or alcohol from a store. Um, I suppose they are showing ID for both of those items anyway. Um, how, how will we expect someone to differentiate between a tribal member and someone who is not and avoid that um, issue with the competitive advantage in the surrounding areas? Yeah, so, so these exemptions, they're both uh, sales and income tax exemptions, but they're focused on activity occurring on tribal territory. So um, in some contexts, I think there will be a need for Maine Revenue Service to have some way of identifying tribal members so that they're able to take advantage of uh, or get the benefit that they are entitled to under these changes. But I, I think that the concern that you're raising may not be applicable simply because the sales 
would be occurring on tribal territory. So there wouldn't be a lot of trouble, I think, in a facility that is placed on tribal territory that's making a sale within tribal territory, identifying who is and who's not a tribal member. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I have another question, if I may. Um, I actually, I, I, you've had two questions and I see that another committee member has uh, his hand up. And That's so fine, I'm happy to double back to me after you have a chance. Representative Evangelos, you may go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Mr. Reed. Good morning. I just have one quick question. Um, part one of the bill um, laid out by Representative Talbot Ross I've long advocated for an ongoing um, dispute resolution process. Uh, would you define part one of the bill as sort of quantifying that into law so that we have good communications? Yeah, I, I think that it, it is an attempt to get at that very issue, Representative Angelis, and, and I, I think it may get overshadowed by some of the other parts of the bill, um, this collaboration statute, but I'd like to say a few words about it because I think it's something we should all feel very proud of. Um, Maine would have, if, if this amendment is enacted into law, Maine would have the most progressive collaboration, state tribal collaboration statute of its kind in the country. Um, there are some states that have executive orders that get at this idea. Some states have adopted policies that get at this idea. A very small number of states have statutes on the books that have any form of consultation or collaboration process in law. And the states that do have it in law have a, a version of it in law that is less robust than the bill before you, than the amendment before you. So it's, it, it, it's um, I think it's a really exciting development. It's been a long time coming. Um, there will be some uh, work to do in kind of getting it off the ground and implementing it within the agencies and getting everybody used to how to administer it and take advantage of it and use it in, uh, uh, as efficiently and, and um, constructively as, as it should be used. But it's, it's a big deal and I think it should serve long-term dividends um, for, for tribal communities and for state government and, and restoring and improving relations. Thank you for that. And quick follow up, Madam Chair. So that yes, in, in the future, because this will be codified into statute if it passes, in the future, 10 years from now, um, a governor is elected and uses executive authority, which has happened in the past, um, to abrogate um, a collaboration process. That executive authority, um, will be sort of overridden by the fact that this process is codified into law, is that correct? That's right. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Libby, you can go ahead with one more question. And then I know that um, Jerry Reed will be present at the work session and we have many members of the public who would like to speak at the public hearing today. And so if you could just do one more question and then save the rest for the work session. Sure. Uh, Thank you for the answers to your questions, Mr. Reed. My um, next question, the rest of which will be saved for work session, you, you touched on it a little bit in part A, talks about the um, improving dialogue. And um, I'm just curious if this piece of the amendment is based on a model from other states. Are there other states that do or do not have a similar process? And um, just what that might look like in practical application from seeing it modeled in other states? or not? Yes, we did look at models from other states in the process. And, and there's also a federal consultation process that um, was useful to look at by analogy. So there are other jurisdictions doing various uh, forms of the, the same thing, but we modified um, what we saw in other jurisdictions to come up with something that we felt was appropriate for Maine. So the answer to your question is yes, we did look at that. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, I do have one very quick question, if I could. It would help me prepare for work session if I could get the answer from Mr. Reed today as opposed to at the work session. Yes, please go ahead with one more question. 
Thank you. Um, it's regarding part J, um, the seven total facility sports wagering licenses. Um, are those seven allocated for tribes? Is that um, seven around the state? What is that uh, seven number there? If you could explain that to me. Sorry, I'm new to the betting world. Sure, I understand. I'm new to it also. I, I can tell you that um, in this respect, the amendment before you was intended to operate similarly to how off-track betting facilities were treated under LD 1352, the bill that's currently on the appropriations table. So the, the reference to OTBs there was not intended to be um, tribal OTBs, tribal facilities. It was intended to be existing licensed OTBs that are operating in the state now. Thank you. Thank you. Committee members, are there any additional questions for Jerry Reed? I am not seeing any. We appreciate you providing testimony this morning. Thank you. Uh, and I did want to just let uh, members of the public and committee members know, we did not uh, run a three minute clock actually on Jerry Reed and, and with regard to the elected tribal um, officials who are going to be speaking to us next regarding this legislation, we're also not going to run a three minute clock on them. And thereafter we will be running the three minute clock. Um, and so next we'll hear from Chief Kirk Francis. Good morning, can you hear me? We can, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Long time no see, but yeah, it's great to see you all this morning and um, appreciate the opportunity, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to speak in favor of Assistant Majority Leader Rachel Tabit Ross's amendment to LD 585. As mentioned, my name is Kirk Francis. I currently serve as the Chief of the Penobscot Indian Nation. I've proudly done and held that role for 15 years. Um, so as I begin my testimony today, I want to reinforce to the committee what you've really already heard and uh, that the purpose of the amendments to LD 585 is separate and distinct from the purpose of LD 1626, which is to modernize the Settlement Act between the Wabanaki Nations and the state. Today's amendments is intended to improve communication between the state and tribes and begin to provide us with some economic opportunities that we have been shut out of for 40 years. The amendment does not restore sovereignty back to us and it does not make improvements to the 1980 Settlement Act. The Penobscot Nation did, however, ask Assistant Majority Leader Ross to present the amendment uh, to LD 585 because I am hopeful that it is the beginning of progress. The amendment is the product of more than seven months of discussions between the representatives of the Go Governor Mills administration, Attorney General Fry, the Penobscot Nation, Passamaquoddy Tribe, and Holton Band of Maliseet Indians. Those discussions focused on trying to make changes to state law that will improve communications between the tribal nations and state, promote economic development within and around tribal communities, and allow mobile sports wagering to be conducted by all the Wabanaki nations. Those discussions were productive, and I'm hopeful that we can get today's amendment through this legislature and signed into law. This amendment to LD 585 is the, a foundation on which the governor, attorney general, and Wabanaki nations can build on. I am hopeful that our discussions with the governor's office and attorney general continue, and that we will find ways to progress on additional issues and be back before you during the next legislature. The amendment to LD 585 will improve dialogue between state agencies and the Wabanaki nations and provide the Wabanaki nations and our citizens with tools to create economic opportunities as well as the surrounding communities. While there are several parts to the amendment, it really seeks to address three issues. Again, to improve communication, amend certain parts of the state's tax laws to help improve the economic welfare of the main tribes and allow each of the Wabanaki nations to conduct mobile sports wagering. 
institutionalize in some form of communication between state agencies and Wabanaki nations is a foundational component of strengthening the government to government relationship. The amendment requires that certain agencies identify a tribal liaison. So it is clear who we should be outreaching to when concerns come up. Also, it will be the responsibility of this person to outreach to each Wabanaki nation and keep us informed of any actions that may substantially and uniquely impact us. The federal government has taken steps to better consult with tribes over the past 25 years, and it has proven to be very effective. More and more states are doing the same, and we think doing so here in Maine will help promote a more positive relationship between us and the state. Additionally, the amendment to LD 585 requires that the governors meet at least annually with the Wabanaki leaders in a tribal state summit to address issues of mutual concern. Again, this strengthens the government to government relationship and it institutionalizes a summit so that the conversation happens regardless of who is in the Blaine House. The amendment to LD 585 also seeks to start treating the Wabanaki nations like other tribal governments in the country when it comes to taxation. These changes will take effect beginning on January 1st, 2023, and will benefit our citizens living and working within our trust and reservation lands. They will also help promote economic development within and around our communities. Like other tribal governments in the country, there will no longer be distinguishing between when we are acting in our government capacity versus our business capacity. Like other governments in the country, other tribal governments in the country, we will no longer have to pay sales tax on items purchased by our governments. Like other tribes in the country, any sales to tribal members or tribal entities occurring on our trust or reservation lands will not be subject to state sales tax. And the state will return to us any sales tax collected from other people that take place on our lands. These changes will allow us to invest more in our infrastructure on our lands such as things like roads, sewer, water, cemeteries, parks, et cetera. It will also allow our government to consider developing its own taxes so we can gener continue to generate some revenue to reinvest in our programs and services. Lastly, the amendment to LD 585 will legalize sports wagering within the state. It will do so by authorizing up to seven facility sports wagering licenses to off-track betting facilities, and it will authorize one mobile sports wagering license to each Wabanaki nation. The Wabanaki nations have long been cut out of the gaming industry in Maine. When the settlement acts were passed in 1980, the Penobscot nation had our own gaming facility and it was shut down. We were actually conducting that type of gaming with slot machines, et cetera, and before the settlement acts. And we did not believe that we were negotiating that right away when the settlement act passed. But shortly after it passed, state law enforcement uh, came in and shut us down. Eventually, the state allowed us to do high stakes bingo, but we were repeatedly denied any opportunity to open a casino. In 2004, when Hollywood Slots was authorized in Bangor to open and eventually caused our bingo operations to close simply because we could not compete, we lost 70 jobs and vital revenue that supported our government programs. We again came to the legislature to seek authorization to open a casino, but were denied because we were told that the gaming market in Maine would be saturated. When we focused on simply modernizing our bingo games through new, new technology at that point, we were again denied. And then we watched as another commercial casino opened in Oxford. Last year, this legislature passed a bill that would have allowed the Wabanaki nations to conduct gaming in a similar manner as every other federally recognized tribe in the country. That bill, of course, as we know, was vetoed, which led to a lot of the discussions as to why we're here today. Today's amendment allows the Wabanaki nations to finally participate in the gaming industry in a meaningful manner. States throughout the country are legalizing sports wagering, both in person and online. This amendment allows those entities with existing facilities to conduct in-person sports wagering. The Wabanaki nations will only be allowed to conduct mobile sports wagering. We have consistently been told that we could not have a casino because it would harm existing facilities like the one in Bangor. Allowing us to access the 
uh, the new market of online sports wagering will not impact existing games at either facility. The Wabanaki Nations worked hard to avoid any such negative impact on the existing casinos, which is why you do not have a proposal today that includes casinos for the tribes. And believe me, that was on the table. Nothing in this bill hurts any existing gaming casino. Online sports wagering may be a want, but it is not a need for those facilities. The existing casinos have their markets, so the tribes will focus on the online market and the off-track betting facilities, which includes the one in Bangor, can focus on the facility sports betting. That is fair, and allowing the Wabanaki Nation's access to the new online market is fair. Allowing out-of-state corporations and existing facilities to have everything is not fair. Opening the online gaming market up to only four licenses will prevent immediate market saturation. We were long told that the reasons we were not allowed to build a casino was because the state market could only support two, one in Bangor, one in Oxford. We think the online gaming market can support these four licenses. All of these changes in the amendment before you today will allow us to focus on developing more economic development opportunities that will not only benefit us, but our surrounding rural communities. All of the Wabanaki, Maine, as we, we know, are located in rural parts of Maine. We need to start working more together to develop opportunities that will benefit all of us. Today's amendment is a step in that right direction. No one is more local than the Wabanaki Nations, and any revenues we generate go back into the main economy. So I want to thank Assistant Majority Leader Rachel Talbot Ross, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, Representative Evangelos, and all of you that have poured your time and hearts into this effort. I do not believe we would be making any progress without your commitment to the effort. And I would re reiterate, Representative Ross is a true champion and warrior. Thank you to the governor's chief legal counsel, Jerry Reed, Attorney General Fry, and his staff for your endless efforts and commitment to the discussions over the past several months. We all know about the controversy over the years and the animosity between governments, but thank yous are due here. And you are all in every meeting and invested the long hours to make some progress. I also wanna thank the Maine Revenue Service whose technical expertise helped navigate the longest portions of this negotiation. And again, when thank yous are due, they're due. I wanna thank the governor who I am sure is getting inundated with calls from the gaming industry, expressing concerns about allowing the tribes to conduct mobile sports wager. I appreciate her office standing with us on this issue. Lastly, I just wanna thank, it's been, as you all have seen, a long emotional week. And I wanna take the opportunity to thank my leadership back home, thank the people of the Penobscot Nation, and I'm reminded of how not only lucky I am, but what an amazing uh, group of people we have at the Penobscot Tribe. The amendments to LD 585 presented today is not sovereignty. We will continue our efforts to regain our sovereignty. But today's amendment to LD 585 will provide some meaningful economic benefits to the Penobscot people, our communities, and the local surrounding communities in which many of our people live and work. I myself am a taxpayer in the city of Bangor, a town I very much love living in. And many of the people in the local non-tribal communities work for us. This amendment will provide benefits to all of us. The amendment to LD 585 before you today is not perfect, but it is progress and I do not want to walk away from progress. So I ask the committee members to support this amendment and let's get it over the finish line this session. I appreciate the committee's patience with my testimony and time today. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Chief Francis, for your testimony this morning. And I see that we do have some committee questions for you. And so committee members, I'll ask that you ask one question if you have a follow-up please let me know and then we'll um, rotate through other committee members who will have questions as well. And Representative Libby, you can go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, Chief Francis. <clears throat> I apologize, frogging my throat. Um, quick question regarding the gaming portion. 
Mm-hmm. And I understand the distinction between the seven existing facilities versus the online gaming. And so um, I'm just, I'm looking at the details here and the significant overhead and um, understanding that this gives exclusivity um, for online gaming rights to the Wabanaki nations. Um, that's a significant overhead. Will, will this require and does this amendment allow for partnering with outside agencies or individuals in order to get up and running? Is that something that will be needed? Sure. So um, to your question, I, you know, obviously uh, with any business that the tribe would open or, um, or that any entity would open in the state that's outside their current expertise, you would certainly need um, a transition plan that includes expertise um, for that specific subject matter. So, so yes, to your question, um, it does allow for, for partner and for that expertise sets limits on it. And also um, the tribes would be very, um, very engaged in that process. Also in terms of, of um, learning and transitioning into tribal management and a whole host of other things. So, so yes, the bill does allow for, for that um, in a very limited way. It limits the, the opportunity that's there for any partner, um, focuses on making sure that the entities in this state are the majority um, owners of that situation. And um, so, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. It does. A brief, a brief follow-up, Madam Chair. Yes, go ahead. Um, majority, majority owners, or is there an intention that they would be complete owners? Because what I see here indicates that the tribes would be have ownership, but you spoke to majority ownership. Can you explain that, please? Well, I think um, I think we. Um, I don't want to misspeak on it. I, I think the tribes would be the the complete owner of this situation um, with partnership agreements. I would assume to for that expertise. Again, we haven't gotten uh, that far down the road to get into what our structural setups would look like, but I do know that there's a real opportunity here in terms of at least having the exclusive owner of this right to online mobile sports betting. Um, being here in Maine and all of those things. And uh, I think that's a real opportunity for our communities. Thank you. Thanks. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Good morning, Chief Francis. I I want to uh, follow up on an earlier question raised by Representative Libby regarding taxation. And I speak as one who has never worked with Maine Revenue Services in the drafting of legislation and uh, I, uh, I have all the inexperience that uh, goes hand in hand with that. But I want to, uh, the question has to do with potential uh, um, impact upon areas adjacent to tribal territory. If I, as a non-tribal member, uh, am on tribal territory and make a, a purchase of something which is taxable, do I understand that you would still charge me taxes but that that money would go to the state? Correct. And, um, and then that money is returned on those sales that occurred on the on tribal land. Um, but yeah, that's my understanding, Representative. And like you, I am about four or five years short of a tax degree. So I, <laughs> I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna pretend to, to know those things. So it, to put it in a nutshell, there would be no advantage to me as a non-tribal member living close to a, a tribal store or market to do my shopping there as opposed to off tribal land. Is that true? Fact, I, I would say that that's true. I think the, the thing you see with the kind of tax structures all around the country with Indian tribes, everybody has the same concerns as the questions that were raised here. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to create a tax haven. And that's what, um, that's what really gets avoided with the type of structure that you have so that everybody's held account, accountable in their own jurisdiction first. And then, um, then the, the tribal um, kind of tax laws and structure that are set up get dealt with later when it comes to non-Indians purchasing on, on Indian land. So, so some of those competitive disadvantages 
that were spoke of earlier get mitigated in that type of process. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Representative Thorne, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Chief Francis. Uh, I have about a page and a half of questions, so it's going to be tough to know which ones I'm going to ask you today and which ones I'm going to save for the workshop. But um, you mentioned that you live in Bangor. Is there a provision in this bill, in the language that I haven't seen, that maybe uh, where you are a tribal member, if you live on state land, any taxes you pay come back to you or do they stay with the state? Well, just for me and my house in the bill. I'm just kidding. But I mean, any taxes? No. no. So if you, no. you, if you shop on off tribal lands and you pay a tax, that tax stays with the state, correct? Correct. This, this bill simply focuses on activity within tribal territory, predominantly with tribal citizens. Okay. And a, and a follow-up, if I may, Madam Chair? You may. Thank you. Uh, I noticed that the Aroostook Band of Micmacs is left out of these provisions and the language. Could you maybe just kind of briefly explain why that is? Is it that they belong to the Tobik Nation versus the Wabanaki Nation, or is that they chose not to participate, or could they go off on their own and, and try to negotiate separate agreements with the state? So I, I get a little uncomfortable speaking for another tribe. I, I think that uh, I would leave those questions to someone who represents them that I think will be testifying later. But I would just say that we have to remember that the Micmac Settlement Act is, it, and its language is quite a bit different than ours. Um, they've recognized those differences and I think are um, trying to pursue another path to specifically address the Micmac Settlement Act. So that's about as far as I could explain that. Is there a governor of the overall tribes in Maine, the Wabanaki tribes? Is there a, like a, a overall governor of, of all tribes or just separate chiefs within each Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, mm -hmm. Penobscot. Every tribe is uniquely and distinctly a sovereign and represented by their own leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. You're welcome. And Representative Thorne, I just wanted to ask you a brief question, if you don't mind. You referred to language that you hadn't seen. Have you not seen the amendment to 585? I know that they were printed versions were left on each legislator's chair yesterday morning when we were um, in session. Thank you for that question, Madam Chair. And perhaps I misspoke language that I can't remember reading. Oh, got it. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure you had a copy of the legislation. I don't have an idea memory, so okay. sometimes I, I don't recall. All right, thank you. And Representative Parnett, I know you had a a question and you've been patiently waiting. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Chief Francis, for being here today. It's good to see you again. Uh, I only seem to see you in little boxes on a computer screen though. Um, in your testimony, you mentioned that prior to the Maine Implementing Act being entered into in 1980, that the Penobscots had, gaming, had a gaming facility that was subsequently shut down. Can, can you explain the importance that that facility played in terms of economic development for the Penobscot? Sure. I mean, I remember, and, and the reason I remember this so well is my dad was the original manager there. Um, I think my mom was the original player there, but I think we had, um, um, we had a slot parlor that was connected to our bingo operation that we you know, as we all know, we, we were the oldest Indian bingo in the country. We had started, you know, some 40 something years, 50 something years ago now. And um, so as that started to build out, you could really start to see um, kind of the economic growth start to happen. Uh, really comprehensive community-based benefits, uh, community days and festivals and things that the, the thing would find fun to bring the community together, but also 
to start to build the tribe programmatically as we moved into a, a self-governance stage. So it was, it was really um, significant, you know, coming off um, a century of really extreme poverty in the getting into the early 1970s. And, and just, the, I remember it being, um, and, and trust me, when I say we had a gaming operation, uh, it's not like the facilities we see today. It was, it was basically uh, adding an addition onto our gymnasium and then having um, um, a little parlor in the back at first. And then that started to expand. So, so yeah, it, it meant a lot to the community. The community started to, and the government started to really have resources to start to deal with real issues. And, and that's really what we see um, gaming as. A lot of people get caught up in slot machines and this and that. That's a function. If you look at IGRA and tribes all across the country, it's a function of tribal government. It, it really is about bringing that capital into the system and totally dispersing that into services and, um, and enhancing programs and overcoming um, some things. So, so it's a tool for the better good um, when it comes to tribal gaming. And, you know, and then we've heard, you know, questions today about alcohol and cigarette sales and, and gambling, and, you know, tribes, um, I can speak for our tribe. We, we actually have a ban on alcohol sales, so we won't be having to worry about that. But I think that the, um, the other issue is, uh, you know, no tribe, and the chairman of the National Indian Gaming Association will tell you the same thing. No tribe wants to, you know, do these things, uh, these types of businesses um, in and by themselves. They are really a tool to um, get a short-term tool with a short-term solution in, in capital infusion to get to a to greater good. And I saw that in the 1970s happening. Thank you, Chief. May I have a quick follow-up, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Could you explain, you know, and that was that was the positive side of having the ability prior to 1980. What was the impact on the Penobscot when that facility was shut down in terms of infrastructure and governmental development? Yeah, I mean, of course, we have to keep in mind I was uh, 10 years old um, at the time, but I, I do know that um, it had a significant uh a significant impact on on the tribe economically initially because we have to remember there was quite a period of time between the time it was shut down to the time we even regained our our high stakes bingo license and um, and so you know when we get to um, a few years later after being shut down we we were able to pass legislation for a limited amount of weekends twenty seven weekends a year to conduct high stakes bingo and, and really started to rebuild the, the nation's, um, you know, kind of unrestricted cash flow to come in to deal with um, independent decision-making and thinking that grants and other things don't really allow you to do. So, so, um, and that goes great for like the next 20 years until, you know, the game and market starts to change in Maine, becomes more modernized, becomes more competitive, and we're left with a kind of archaic product that we couldn't, we couldn't uh, compete with. So, and, and, you know, all governments, um, you know, have a contribution from gaming, right? Whether it's the Maine State Lottery, whether it's um, taxes derived from existing facilities, um, governments um, are all using those resources for the very same things. Thank you, Chief Francis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yep. You're welcome. Representative Libby, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question, and I appreciate uh, having a, a further question um, for Chief Francis. Uh, Chief Francis, my question is if tribes with this, the, the exclusive online sports betting, if tribes would still receive cascade funds from casinos in our state? Um, well, we only receive cascade funds from one casino. Um, and that agreement was uh, a Passamaquoddy tribe, Penobscot Nation, um, Oxford representative uh, agreement during the legislative process um, that 
uh, created that cascade. Uh, that cascade is, I think, um, contingent on the fact that um, it would be in place until we were allowed to open a casino. So um, we have not had that discussion, but this bill would have no effect on that uh, relationship with with the Oxford revenues, I, I don't think. Thank you. Yep. Representative Newell, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Chief Francis. Hi there. It's good to see you here and thank you for your testimony. I'd like to raise a question if I may, somewhat follows the line of questioning that we've heard. But Chief Francis, uh, could you answer the question as to why you think the online provisions are fair? Sure. Um, so when we, when we, um, you know, started this discussion around gaming um, last year, we we really after the IGRA bill, we really said, look, we got to focus on a product that that we think benefits us, and it doesn't become a problem for anybody else. And so we, as we started to think about it, everything was on the table. Um, to the governor's credit, everything was on the table. We discussed casino in Southern Maine. We discussed a whole host of things and came to the conclusion eventually that the tribes did, by the way, that, and this was our proposal, that the, um, that the best way to avoid conflict, and of course, you know, it's easier said than done in, the, in, these, in this area, was for the tribes to focus on online sports betting, like tribes all across America are doing, by the way, and um, focus on Maine-based businesses that are licensed, like the OTBs. They would have facility sports betting. The casinos would have their Las Vegas-style gaming. So if you look, for example, so everybody would have their own lane, and that was the, the thought process here. Um, if you look at, for example, what was approved in Bangor, a facility that I have no problem with. It's in my, my town. I, I, it does a lot for the city. I have no complaints about that being there. But when you look at what, that was, what was approved there in terms of a racino at the horse track and then repeated legislative upgrades to that facility over the years. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong, including in 2012, when we were pursuing uh, class two bingo based machines and were denied that same year, that facility was authorized to move to table games and become a full fledged casino. So, what we see in the city of Bangor right now is certainly not what the voters approved back in 2000, whenever it was, for, and, and that's fine, but I'm just saying that the tribes have been consistently left out, and we have neatly put everybody in their own box and in their own lane as to not hurt each other um, with this thing, we, um, with this bill that's in front of us today. So that's why I think it's extremely fair. Thank you, Chief Francis. Did you have a follow-up question? I do not, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you. Committee members, any additional questions for Chief Francis? I am not seeing any. Many thanks for um, coming before the committee today for your statement and for all of your answers to our questions. Thank you all very much. Uh, next, we'll hear from Vice Chief uh, Ernie Neptune. There you go. Everybody hear me all right? We can hear you. Fine, um, but we're not able to see you. Are you able to activate your um, your video, Vice Chief? Oh, you Thank you. Thank you. Oh, boy. Uh, good morning. My name is Ernest Neptune. I am the Vice Chief of the Pasquaporti Tribe at Sibayeg, also known as Pleasant Point. 
I am testifying on behalf of Chief Elizabeth Dana. The chief is tending to her traditional responsibilities following the passing of a community member. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and the members of the Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to address you today in support of this amendment to LD 585. I want to first express our appreciation to Governor Mills for her commitment to engage in negotiations with the tribes. We have been working together since last summer on the many issues we face as sovereign nations within the state of Maine. But we have not covered as, as a, a lot as, I'm sorry, while we have not covered a lot of what we hope to do, this legislation testament to the significant progress we have made on three key issues, tribal state collaboration, taxation, and sports betting. Number one, tribal state collaboration. The collaboration provisions are an important step toward improving tribal state relations and are the underpinning to a brighter future. This legislation does three important things. One, it requires intertribal communication before agency decisions are made. Two, it provides important tools to ensure all communications are respectful and therefore more effective. And three, it demonstrates an ongoing commitment to working with the tribes as fellow sovereigns. The requirement to provide notice and an opportunity for consultation before a state agency takes an action that, I will, that will impact tribes and their citizens allows us to identify and address potential issues before they materialize. The requirement of special training for state employees to interact with the tribes and tribal citizens will promote and help avoid unnecessary miscommunications and misunderstandings. Finally, the annual tribal state summit recognizes that and respects the government to government relationship between the state of Maine and the tribes and will foster dialogue on issues that affect both sovereigns. Two, taxation. For too long, the tribes in Maine have endured a different reality than the rest of the rest of the federally recognized tribes throughout the United States because of the Settlement Act. One important example of the, of the state taxation scheme and our inability to take advantage of certain tax benefits and exemptions that are afforded to all other tribes. I urge you to support this legislation because it is aimed at improving the economic opportunities for the Wabanaki people and to encourage economic development within our tribal lands. As you know, it is very expensive to operate a government and to provide critical services to the people. The responsibility to care for our citizens is important to all governments, but carries a unique cultural significance for tribal nations. Sensible tax laws are an integral aspect of an effective government and the negotiated amendments to this bill will bolster our ability to raise revenue and deliver government services to the Wabanaki people and our neighboring communities. Three, sports betting. The legislature has already expressed its approval of the creation and regulation of sports betting within the state. Similar to LD 1352, this bill authorizes the issuance of two types of sports betting uh, operator licenses, facility license and mobile license. Historically, tribes have been prohibited from conducting most forms of gaming. Today, out-of-state corporations dominate Maine's gaming industry. Mobile sports betting can be an important tool for tribal economic development and will be a significant step toward evening out the playing field. This legislation will also provide important economic stimulus to rural areas of the state and the horse racing industry. As I said by comments to this committee earlier this week, I look forward to a future that is built upon government to government relation and respect and cooperation. I appreciate your time and um, um, I hope you support this, uh, this amendment. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Vice Chief Neptune, for um, providing the statement for Chief Dana, and please um, accept our condolences for the loss of your community member. Thank you very much. And I see that we have some uh, committee questions. Representative Thorne, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Vice Chief Neptune. Thank you for appearing today. Um, how often do, does uh, the Wabanaki tribes, is powwow uh, a still correct term for when they get together? Is that yearly? Sure, yes. And, and is the governor, how often does the governor meet or is that just exclusively a tribal powwow versus outside the tribe leaders? Uh, no, all is welcome. Uh, we try to share our culture and traditions, our dance, our songs, um, and um, unity, obviously, is a, is a big part of having a powwow. Um, but uh, yes, we, we certainly love, love to display who we are. Uh, we're very unique people. Um, but as testimony said earlier, is that we are not enemies of the state. Uh, we certainly want to be an ally on all levels. Um, and particularly with our surrounding communities. Okay, and then would that be an appropriate setting for the governor to sit down with tribal leaders or is that reserved really, for other purposes? Yeah, no, it's, it's really a time to celebrate. Um, and here at Pleasant Point, um, we have one large, um, uh, it's, it's called Passport Party Days, which is a weekend um, celebration. Uh, we get visitors from all over the place that happen to stop by or they plan to be a vendor or, or whatever they wish to, uh, to come and celebrate. So it's something, it, it's, it's sort of a, a weekend of pride to be, um, to, to be who we are. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative, let me go ahead with your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today, uh, Vice Chief Neptune. <laughs> um, so you are the, I think maybe the third, the third person to reference LD 1352, and excuse my ignorance, but I'm not on any, uh, you know, I'm not on the committee that handles gaming. And so um, in mentioning that there are significant similarities, did, did that bill also give exclusive online gaming um, to the tribes or to um, main people in general? I, I apologize. I have not been uh, engaged in a lot of those discussions during that bill. Um, I would politely and respectfully ask you to refer those to um, attorney uh, Michael Corey Hinton, um, who will be uh, testifying. So I apologize for that. No worries. Thank you. I, I will address them to the proper person. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Committee members, any additional questions for Vice Chief Neptune? I am not seeing any. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Vice Chief Daryl Newell. Well, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, Vice Chief Newell. You may begin whenever you're ready. Yes, ma'am. Well, everyone, well, as you go, bow, well, it's pleasure, well. Come on, no, as well, come, guys, well, come on, you close, well, storm, well, yeah. Good morning, um, committee chairs, uh, Senator Carney and uh, Representative Harnett and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Daryl Newell. I'm Vice Chief of the Passamaquoddy Tribe here at Madoc Migog Indian Township. Uh, well, I want to thank you for allowing me to address you um, this morning in support of LD uh, 585 as amended. Uh, since the 1980, um, there have been many pressure points that have caused strain in tribal state relations. 
I believe that if we had functional tribal state relationship with mutual interest in implementing the true intent of the Settlement Act, the Implementing Act, many amendments would have already been adopted. As amended, this bill would not amend the Settlement Act. Amending the Settlement Act is the tribe's sincere and absolute objective. However, we recognize that finding common ground with the state on policies outside of the Settlement Act can provide significant opportunity for the tribes as well. The amended version of LD 585 represents true progress in tribal state relations in three areas, tribal state consultation, taxation and economic development. These issues recognize that tribal governments and the state government have significant mutual interest in improved tribal state communication and in improving the economic of uh, rural Maine. Tribal and state representative negotiated the amendment to LD 585 over many months and countless hours. The amendment represents progress, but much work remains even if 585 becomes law. Regarding tribal state relations, the amendment to LD 585 would establish legal channels of communications between our tribal nations and state agencies. It would significantly build and normalize the working relationship between state and tribal governments. The amendment would also provide the Passamaquoddy tribe with similar tax benefits, similar to what tribes and citizens enjoy elsewhere in Indian country. These benefits will enhance the tribe's ability to collect revenue to fund government services. Finally, the amendment to LD 585 offers significant opportunity to promote rural economic development in Maine through sports bidding. The amendment aims to promote diversity in Maine's gaming market. It will ensure that Maine's gaming industry does not continue to be controlled by out-of-state casino interests that send the majority of their revenues to out-of-state uh, corporate coffers. Our hope is that the majority of revenue earned from sports betting in Maine will stay here and will promote rural economic development in tribal and non-tribal communities in Northern Maine. Thank you for your time and consideration. I respectfully urge you to support the amendment to LD 585. Chiwili thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chief Newell. Committee members, are there any questions for Vice Chief Newell? I'm not seeing any questions for you. Um, once again, we really appreciate you appearing today and providing testimony. Thank you. Committee members, um, we have received a request from Senator Baldacci, who is here to speak in opposition to this legislation, to um, appear before us out of order, and um, because he is due in court for a hearing. And so at this point, I am going to bring Senator Baldacci over so that we can hear from him this morning um, since he, oh, and he is here. Uh, Senator Baldacci, welcome, and you can proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett. Uh, the efforts of the administration and the tribes to make progress are very laudable and very important, but even its supporters admit that it's limited. It has already been testified that it does not restore sovereignty, nor does it change the Land Claims Act. I am here to focus my opposition solely, solely on the arbitrary provisions regarding sports gambling. I'm here to respectfully ask the committee to use a scalpel and not a more blunt instrument in dealing with these solutions. These solutions that we come forward with on issues like this should build unity and not create more division. The solution of arbitrarily shutting out Bangor and Oxford and undermining the city of Bangor's finances is not a necessary step on the road to greater self-determination for our fellow citizens. I fully support LD 1626 as it is currently written. It is necessary, it is historic, it is a landmark bill that needs to go forward. 
but I need to share with you on this particular amendment and solely regarding these particular provisions, I need to share with you the unique position of the city of Bangor. Because as you know, the slot machines and the gambling were not approved by legislative fiat. They were approved by voter referendums, by a majority of the voters of the state of Maine approved the setup in Bangor, approved the setup later on of gambling in Oxford County and in Bangor, and approved the whole administrative structure. Those were by majority votes of the public at large. And based on those majority votes, 15 years ago, the city of Bangor entered into a relationship with Hollywood Slots, where a percentage per year is paid to the city of Bangor, and, current, and it's approximately $2 million per year. That money went into a trust fund that put a $10 million down payment on the construction of the Cross Insurance Center. That is a $65 million building that the city put 10 million down from those earnings. And I and Senator Gratwick and three other city councilors are on the bond order signed 10 years ago for $55 million to uh, construct the Cross Insurance Center. The Cross Insurance Center receives zero federal money. It received zero state money. It does not take from the property taxes. It is solely fund it is primarily funded through the revenues the city has negotiated from Hollywood slots. It's a $3 million a year bond issue, which we have approximately 18 years left to go. But let me just tell you that the building of the Cross Insurance Center was monumental for this region economically. It's not only where the University of Maine and concerts take place, it is also the place where over 100,000 citizens were vaccinated just last year. It is probably the highest quality ven ven venue north of Boston. It draws hundreds of thousands of people to the greater Bangor region. The greater Bangor region comprises of 155,000 people and the city of Bangor itself generates over $1.2 billion in taxable retail sales to the state of Maine, generating more than $80 million a year to our state coffers. Just for comparison purposes, the city of Portland generates about 1.5 billion. So clearly these are the two largest retail areas of the state of Maine and the most important coffers for our state revenue. So, the Cross Center was, was not paid for by any public money, and it has been a huge economic success. It is, was supported by over 75% of the voters of Bangor in the, the referendum that was held about 10 years ago. It is something that people here from both parties have actively supported and actively worked to promote. It has helped us in our efforts to revitalize the waterfront, it has helped us in our efforts to revitalize the downtown. It has been extremely important to our economy and to the regional economy. So I, I, I believe in the need for tribal sovereignty. I believe in the need for self-determination. I believe that those things can happen without having to, to shunt, shunt aside a whole city and its finances. And so I respectfully ask this committee I mean, there are solutions. We could look at giving a percentage of the state lotteries, a set percentage to our tribes. We could do a number of other things, but having a solution like this does not, does not seem right. It does not seem unifying. It seems more divisive. And I think we can come up with a better solution and we can all go forward together, which is what we want. As mayor, I helped uh, bring about the fact the first Indigenous Peoples Day, and I worked with the tribes uh, on that and dealt with a lot of criticism from people in terms of upending tradition. Um, I, Chief Francis is a great leader. He's a good friend, and we've worked together, and I continue to want to work together 
but I have to let the committee know about this important issue and ask the committee to consider it in your deliberations. Thank you, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you, Senator Baldacci. And I just had a quick clarifying question. Uh, you spoke extensively about um, the city of Bangor, and I couldn't tell whether you were speaking on behalf of the city of Bangor or in your capacity as a state senator. I have. I am not speaking on behalf of uh, the city of Bangor. I'm speaking as a state senator who has served 12 years on the city council, and I served twice as mayor. And as I said, Senator Gratwick and I and other councilors co-signed the bond order that yep. uh, was part of this whole arrangement to build the crossing. So I just speak from my own experiences as well as okay. being a state senator. Thank you. It was just, it was unclear to me when you were speaking <laughs> which hat you were wearing, and I appreciate the clarification. <laughs> There are some committee questions. Uh, Representative Libby, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here today, Senator Baldacci. Um, this is a pretty um, massive amendment and with some very distinct pieces to it. Uh, do you think that the sports betting portion would be better served by main people better served by having it as a separate VLA bill? I only think that the veterans and legal, uh, which worked extensively on this bill, would be better because they they um, dealt with a, a large volume of testimony from various viewpoints. So it would be helpful to build on that. Um, I think here you might be starting from scratch, having to, to deal with the same issues. Um, so they definitely have a track record that would be helpful. Thank you, Thank you, Senator. Representative Thorne, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Senator Baldacci. And am I to, uh, I tend to summarize, are you saying that this bill, if passed, could jeopardize the Cross Insurance Center in Bangor, would put a pose a threat to it? If passed and the, there was the only sports betting was there, it could certainly undermine the attraction of this facility right next door to it. And I think it will dilute it. We already saw, uh, it, just remember, this is not a strong economic market. This is one of the poorest, the second district itself is one of the lowest income districts in the country. So by itself, it's not a strong economic district in terms of supporting gaming in general, because we saw a downturn even after Oxford County went on. But yes, I think having that facility so close would pose a threat to the continued strength of the facility and their ability to make payments to the city to keep to, for the Cross Insurance Center which, and I bring that up because it was a city endeavor really without any, uh, without any outside help beyond the, what was contained in, in the referendum. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Babbage, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Baldacci, I, I appreciate your testimony and, and uh, have learned from it. Um, you know, I, I uh, ha have not uh, been, been an advocate of gaming in Maine, but I look to see good that comes from it. And um, uh, I, I have my question actually is to look at the uh, long term. Uh, uh, relationship regarding the the contribution of uh, Hollywood to the city of Bangor. Could you give me an idea if if um, uh, regarding your your budget interests, if that has in increased dramatically over time, and uh, or or if it's been if it's plateaued, or what has been the health of that income to the city? 
And I have to speak that my experience uh, would have ended at the end of 2017. So, but up through that time, it was fairly consistent. There was a set amount and it had really, it had plateaued. Um, it hadn't had huge jumps either way towards you know the last couple of years, but I would have to defer to, because since then we've had a pandemic and a number of other things, but it was uh, generating about two to two and a half million is my recollection. And I don't have the current numbers per year. And the debt service on the cross insurance is just under three million a year. Thank, thank you for that. And if I have one more, Madam Chair, um, you can you tell me if uh, was the cascade uh, set uh, during the Racino days, or uh, has it been changed? And if so, what is the process for that? I could answer that question, but I was not involved, honestly, either um, in in the wording of the that referendum or its law. So, and I uh, so I really couldn't answer that question on how that how that works. But thank you, Representative Babbage. Okay, Th thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Sheehan, go ahead with your question. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Baldacci, for helping us to understand um, Bangor's position in all of this. Um, I just have a couple of questions, and um, I'm very new to this issue, so forgive me. Um, but am I understanding it correctly that Hollywood in Bangor is does actually have off-track betting? Actually, have off track betting. I think they're associated, maybe, but I, I don't know the details of their associations. I think so I, I, couldn't, I couldn't answer that question. Okay. I think they're, I, I they're just, associated. I just, oh, sorry, Representative, but the inception of the whole thing was set, set up through the Horsemen's Association, which means that they have a connection with the Bangor Raceway, the Bangor Racetrack. So there's a connection there. I don't know if there, I'm assuming uh, that there may be an OTB, but I'm not sure about their <laughs> intricate operations. Um, Got it. Um, so maybe that's a question for uh, the work session, um, yeah. whether or not Hollywood will actually be able to participate in, in sports betting, um, because I was getting the sense that um, they were being shut out and if they are an OTB location, um, I'd just like to understand that better. Um, yeah, no, that's a good question. And then I had one other question. Um, you mentioned um, that Bangor and Oxford uh, would be effectively and arbitrarily shut out um, of sports betting, or, or perhaps it's just online sports betting, but um, would you say that the tribes are effectively and arbitrarily shut out of casino development at the well, moment? Well, I would, uh, that's a fair question. I would just submit to the committee that those decisions were made by uh, a majority vote of the state of Maine referendum, uh, through referendum by the people, which are ultimately uh, the ultimate voice. So I'm just saying those decisions however they were made, were made by a majority of Maine voters who we were sent here to serve. But in any event, I would just say that the sports betting bill that we passed last year included the tribes receiving mobile license. So it's not an issue about whether they should have a mobile license. It's really an issue about, you know, shutting out everyone else. So, um, that's the, the essential issue is we've gone from one where um, tribes were guaranteed a license to one where everyone else was shut out. And I, I'm assuming that we can work this out for everybody's sake. I think that reasonable minds can come together, but I think there's gotta be a better solution than that. Thanks for your answer. Thank you. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Senator Baldacci. I'd like to follow up on the question presented by my colleague, Representative Thorne. Um, 
and there there are some disconnects uh, that I perceive in, in the position you've articulated. If mobile gaming and sports uh, online sports betting is allowed on tribal territories, I don't see immediately the adverse impact to the Hollywood casino, and more importantly. I don't see it with respect to the cross uh, center. Uh, what what is the direct connection? Particularly well, if, because if, if there can be no casinos on Indian territory, uh, where's the adverse impact? Because of the proximity of having two gaming facilities within twelve miles of each other is is certainly going to undercut. As I said before, um, even though Oxford County is a couple hundred miles away, we saw a downturn for a period of time when that came into existence. I understand that these are different types of gaming, but mm -hmm. people that are gambling aren't, aren't hung up on distinctions. So I think having two gaming facilities within 12 miles of each other is a problem. I can't hear you. You're, you're speaking of Indian Island and Hollywood Casino? Yes. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, committee members, any additional questions for Senator Baldacci? Representative Newell, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Senator Baldacci. It's good to see you. Good to hear See you. you as well. uh, I apologize that I had to step away um, as you began your testimony. However, could you go back to your initial comments in regards to your recommendations as to how this committee would approach uh, this piece of legislation? Um, did I hear you state anything relative to utilizing a scalp or blunt object? Said that they should use a scalpel instead of a blunt object, like a doctor's scalpel. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, Senator Baldacci, if I may just defer to um, uh, my chair and co-chair. Sure. Just for a second. Madam Chair, Representative Harnett, co-chair. I understand the sensitivity of the, the bills that are before us today that relate to the Wabanaki Nations. I am also wish to put it on record that the stereotypical language that I've been hearing relating to the questions that are being posed, perhaps I would suggest that other language be substituted when referring to questions that are being posed. If the committee would like to hear specific words that I have found somewhat offensive, then I will clearly make note of that. So thank you, Madam Chair, Representative Harnett. If I may proceed with my second question, please. Uh, yes, you can proceed with your second question. And I do want to respond to your, your first point, but I don't also want to um, interfere with your asking your question. So go ahead with your question, please. Senator Baldacci, my second question would be, uh, again, as I was returning back to the laptop to, to hear your um, testimony, I understand that you may have noted some points of references in the benefits that have been gained to the city of Bangor in regards to hosting uh, a casino in the town and city of Bangor. Is that correct? I noted those benefits. Yes, I did. So I would pose this question, Senator, as to whether or not you feel that the Wabanaki nations who have, who have testified prior that have spoken to those same direct benefits that should the provisions that are, that are being called for in this amendment, do you feel that they are not deserving of the same benefits that you described for the city of Bangor? I absolutely feel that they are deserving of the same benefits. I don't know. I support LD 1626. I will support legislation that leads us to self-determination and control. I suggested in my remarks that uh, maybe a better solution 
would be giving a percent, a set percentage of the state lottery revenues to our tribes so that that is shared, uh, the, so that that does not have the same um, punitive effect on the city of Bangor as, as completely eliminating them from this legislation. So I think that there are several solutions that we could reach. And I made that clear in my testimony that this is, that the solutions need to be something that we can uh, create more unity in and not division. I appreciate that response, uh, Senator. Um, however, I would uh, offer a comment of um, inclusion. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I have no further questions. Thank you, uh, Representative Newell. Um, and I, I do want to address the first point you raised because I um, also felt um, discomfort with disrespectful use of language in committee members' questions. And as a chair, I um, am torn between um, restraining committee members' language choices that, that I personally do not agree with and letting people use the language that they um, choose to use in questioning. And I don't always know how to resolve that in the moment. And I really appreciate you raising the issue. And I would just ask committee members to keep in mind that a word um, that you use or, or language that you use can, can be very offensive. And I have done this myself in meetings and apologized for it, but you can use language that is offensive and just to please uh, keep that in mind and make um, decisions about language choice that are consistent with the decorum that we should all be following as legislators and putting our best selves forward for the people of Maine. Madam Chair, may I, I, I will apologize if there was any inference of that. I chose the word scalpel because I felt that the, this legislation took a broad brush and we needed to have more precision. That's what I said in my remarks. And so I uh, don't want to uh, consider having a, um, greatest respect for the Penobscot nation and working with them in the past. So I, I don't want any uh, misinterpretation. And I appreciate the comments by Representative Newell. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Baldacci. Um, and so I, I know that, um, Senator Baldacci needs to go to his hearing and um, it looks like we are done with our questions of him. So I wanna thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, and at this point, we have a couple of more, well, we have Ambassador Dana will be our next person to address the committee. And then after we hear from Ambassador Dana, we will have heard from all of the um, officials of the Wabanaki Nations. And at that point, we will take a brief mid-morning recess. So we will be welcoming Ambassador Dana in just a moment. And Representative Babbage, is your hand um, up anew or from before? Thank you. I apologize. It is residual, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ambassador Dana, welcome back to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. We're happy to see you and please begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. And you'll see me a couple of times today. So <laughs> I'll be a little briefer on this one. Uh, good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Farnett and members of the committee. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to add. I, I think that Chief Francis and others have, have done a really great job of outlining what's in the bill, the amendments, the process as to how we got here. I want to especially thank them for 
giving a great overview of the history of inequity when it comes to gaming for tribes in Maine. I think it's important to point out that uh, this bill does not include a facility, uh, especially not one on Indian Island. So the proximity to Bangor uh, probably shouldn't be a, a factor here. I am testifying as a tribal leader from the Penobscot Nation in support of the amended version of LD 585. You've heard about the amendments regarding gaming collaboration and taxation. Uh, I was thankful for the chance to attend these meetings and I really would like to commend everyone who made this agreement possible. I also want to extend my thanks to Assistant Majority Leader Rachel Talbot Ross. Uh, I, I really, you know, I chair the Permanent Commission on Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations with Assistant Majority Leader Talbot Ross. And we are often steeped in the work of injustice. And as women of color in the state of Maine, it is also woven into our life experience. So her emotions are seen, heard, and felt by me, and, and I continue to be very thankful for her. I think it is important to note that the overwhelming support during the eight hours of public hearing that this committee heard on Tuesday was for LD 1626. Uh, I think it shows where the hearts and spirits of the tribal nations are. We see the only real path forward on healing this relationship is amending the 1980 Maine Indian Land Claims Settlement and Implementing Acts. The provisions in 585 as amended will be beneficial to our communities and we're glad for progress. Uh, we're thankful for dialogue as always. We hope for more meaningful and lasting change in the future, but we are here to support this amendment today. With that, I, I think I can wrap up my remarks. I'm happy to take any questions and I reiterate my uh, thankfulness for the, the thought and care that this committee has given to all of these tribal bills. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Dana. Committee members, are there any questions for Ambassador Dana? Representative Harnett, go ahead. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and thank you for being here today. And I just want to make sure that the record is clear, and I think you did point out the discussion of a physical location 12 miles from Hollywood slots is not in this, um, the bill that is before us today. Is that correct? That is correct. And, and actually, if I might add, we did used to run a high stakes bingo on Indian Island. And uh, since Hollywood slots opened, it was a contributing factor in the demise of that bingo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Committee members. Any additional questions for Ambassador Dana? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dana. And at this point, uh, committee members, we are going to take a five minute break and we will return at, um, well, let's say we'll return at 1110. We'll give us a couple of extra minutes and resume with taking proponents of LD 15, of LD 585. Thank you all.
Hi, committee members. If you are back at your computers and desks, please activate your uh, video so that we can begin. Representative Thorne, I see you have your hand up. I'm gonna wait till the committee members return. Thank you. It was simply an offer to take Representative Newell up on her words that she found offensive that were used today. Okay, if you can just wait until we resume, that would be helpful. Thank you. Waiting. All right, it looks like most of us have returned from the break and um, Representative Thorne, did you wish to address the committee? Yes, I, uh, Representative Newell offered that she had some words that she found offensive that were used in committee today. And I was just wondering if she would share those with us in order that we may not repeat them during what lies ahead. Actually, um, Representative Thorne, if I could, and with your um, consent, Representative Newell, I would like to address that. Representative Newell, is that okay with you? Yes, ma'am. Sure. Okay, thank you. And um, thank you for starting us out on this conversation, Representative Thorne. I did want to speak to this because um, the use of, of the words powwow and the context in which they were used were disrespectful, um, both to the committee and to the Wabanaki nations who um, have brought this legislation forward and are testifying in behalf of it. Basically, it's denigrating what is a cultural community and family celebration. And it's also denigrating the intent of this legislation, which is um, not to create a uh, celebration, but really to create a framework in statute for government to government relations. And it's very important that we all recognize that what we are working on here today is creating or considering legislation that would create a framework for government to government communications and relationships between the Wabanaki Nation and the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I think that we can all appreciate and respect the importance of cultural traditions in our own cultures, and in this case, in particular, in the culture of the Wabanaki Nations. Mm -hmm. And so I would just ask us all to think um, carefully about the importance of language and how important it is to show respect to our colleagues and um, the people we represent and everyone here in our state. And I thank you all for your thoughtfulness on that point. May I respond, Madam Chair? Uh, yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Newell, are, are you of like mind that I, I used that powwow in asking uh, Vice Chief Neptune if that was an appropriate time to meet with the governor? Representative Thorne, Madam Chair, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of this committee, when I was appointed to sit amongst you, and at the very onset two years ago, there were language that were used that I noted to this, com to this committee that I found were not appropriate. And I noted then, two years ago, that each and every time that I felt that words that would be reflective to describe 
any indigenous person less than respectful and deserving, then I would call that out. And so today I did hear those words. I provided testimony two days ago that words inflict, words are powerful. They enlist our response. They're derived directly from our thinking. As I sit amongst you, I am more than available to be contacted by phone if there's any uncertainty as to any way to address any member of an indigenous community that could potentially be received as offensive. That would be my response today. Thank you, Representative Noor. Madam Chair, then if I said that and it was taken offensively, I will say that I did not intend it to be offensive, that I obviously misunderstood the meaning of the term and was asking for clarification from Vice Chief Neptune about that meeting an annual meeting and whether or not that would be something that would be appropriate for the governor to meet with the tribal chiefs. So I offer Representative Newell, Chair uh, Carney, and the rest of this committee my apologies if those words, which obviously did cause harm. I am sorry. Thank you committee members for the discussion um, today. Um, we are going to proceed with our um, testimony on LD 585. Uh, Representative Harnett, your hand is up because you'll be timing. Thank you. Um, so we are going to proceed with our um, hearing on 585 and we will be taking uh, testimony in support of the amended version of 585. And I would just ask those in the attendee portion of the meeting who wish to speak in favor to please raise your electronic hands, keep them raised until you have been brought onto the panel. And from here forward, we will be running the three minute clock and rest assured that committee members will be able to ask those who are testifying follow-up questions. And um, we are going to start with Lakota Sanborn, uh, who was first in line when we took our recess. Lakota, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. You may proceed with your testimony when you're ready. Hi there, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Committee on Judiciary. My name is Lakota Sanborn. It's good to see you again. Um, I'm here testifying in favor of LD 585. Uh, though this bill is not a substitute, as Representative Rachel Talbot Ross stated, um, this bill is important as it honors the collaboration with the tribes in the state of Maine. This act aims to restore, at least to some degree, the government-to-government -government relationship that the Wabanaki tribes, as federally recognized sovereign nations, have always had the right to engage in, but have been denied the right to do so by the state of Maine due to the Implementing Act of 1980. The right to self-determination for the tribes is deeply important, and though I am in support of this bill as a means to increase these activities and freedoms, which aim to put the tribes on a similar playing field as other federally recognized tribes, I also feel this bill showcases continued levels of state oversight and racially charged paternalism that continues to incorrectly view the tribes as wards of the state. The ways in which the, the, the ways in which Maine has conducted itself for the past 40 years fundamentally goes against the canons of federal Indian law. Maine exists in a completely unique situation is essentially playing by its own rules in relation to tribal state relations. 
Maine's tax laws should not apply to tribal territories because we are sovereign governments. Likewise, the Federal Indian Gaming and Regu Regu Regulatory Act should include the Wabanaki tribes and the tribe should not have should have the full, full ability to practice gaming in any way we see fit, not just parameters the state of Maine agrees to. So though LD 585 represents a collaboration of tribal state relations and an important step towards economic development of the Wabanaki nations, there is still a severe disparity at play here. I am in support of LD 585 and I'm hoping that this is but a small step towards the ability of the Wabanaki nations to engage in their sovereignty and economic development. However, I hope that this bill is not viewed by this committee nor the governor's office as an alternative to 1626 and that these levels of compromise will not be championed as equally important if 585 passes, but 1626 is ultimately vetoed by Governor Mills. Though this bill doesn't go far enough and only exists because of Maine's continued denial of Wabanaki tribe sovereignty, I want to respect all the thought and effort put into this bill by Rachel Talbot Ross, um, tribal community members, the tribal nations themselves, and my elders. LD 585 is an important bill and I urge the members of the judici judiciary to vote ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Committee members, any questions for Lakota Sanborn? I'm not seeing any. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Molly um, Obamsawin. And Molly, I apologize if I have mispronounced your name. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, honorable members of the committee, Deluzi Maliakit Obamsawin, uh, Nujia Odenak. I live in Cornish, Maine, and I grew up in Farmington. I'm in favor of the amendment to LD 585, although I believe that this and the several other legislations being heard today would not be necessary if LD 1626 is passed. It is clear to us watching that the governor's office intends the legislations introduced today as a replacement for the sovereignty that would be restored by 1626 and as a means to appease the Indians without recognizing the sovereignty that is their right. Just as the governor can put point to symbolic examples of progress like Indigenous Peoples Day instead of giving the justice that the public is demanding. The language in LD 585 and the questions being asked by legislators in this committee have already been thoroughly explored, decided, or litigated by courts across the country when these rights and questions were given to other the other 570 federally recognized tribes. Maine would not have to re-explore all of these complex subjects like taxation and gaming every session if the state relinquished its uniquely paternalistic status that it holds over Wabanaki tribes. Maine will continue to have a lot more hassle reinventing federal Indian law at home in a way that avoids recognizing sovereignty than it would by simply amending the Settlement Act. This would surely also improve tribal state relations. Um, and it is evident by the language and exchanges this morning that there is a lot of cultural and legal ignorance that impedes good relations as it stands. Jerry Reed cautioned on Tuesday that passing 1626 would mean the legislature gives up the and I quote, unilateral ability to make decisions over the tribes without their consent. It is clear that the fear is about losing this ability to dominate and the requirement of consent itself. LD 585 is a band-aid that would not be necessary if the state would give up its jurisdictional chokehold that it has over Wabanaki people. And I'm in favor of LD 585 because of the hard work, mental and legal gymnastics that tribal nations and allied legislators have endured to try to present a version of justice that might pass within the bigoted dynamic that creates that is created by Maine's interpretation of the Settlement Acts. However, I implore legislators to solve the problem at its root by passing the amendments to the Settlement Act so that Wabanaki people can truly self-govern as we have for millennia and so that the state can focus on governing itself as it has been for the last two centuries. Uh, all my relations, Maloney. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions? I am not seeing any. Um, and Molly, thank you very much for appearing before us today. Next, we'll hear from Michael Corey Hinton. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee today. I'm Michael Corey Hinton. You may begin when you're ready. 
Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to address you today. When Dolly was Corey Hinton, Nujayal Portland, Wapo Nagiyik, Nuda Beg Zibayig, Naga Balans, Best Good God Neil. My name is Corey Hinton. I live in Portland in the ancestral territory of the Wabanaki Confederacy. I am from Zibayig and the Francis family, and I am proudly Passamaquoddy. I'm here today as a lawyer for the Passamaquoddy tribe to testify in support of LD 585. I would like to start by giving my thanks to the Wabanaki leaders and to our communities for committing such tremendous time and resources to the improvement of tribal state relations. The state of Maine is a better place because of the Wabanaki nations and their continued to commitment to the improvement of the fabric of life in our communities. I would also like to thank the governor's office for the extremely constructive and productive dialogue that has unfolded since the summer. I look forward to continuing our work after today's hearing. And I would finally like to thank the Attorney General's Office and all of the, the lawyers um, that work under Attorney General Frey who have participated in our dialogues and who have been significant contributing members to those uh, policy discussions as well. This amendment would regulate the sports betting industry in the state of Maine in a manner similar to how already approved legislation um, would do. The legislation will authorize the state of Maine to issue and regulate two types of sports betting licenses, facility licenses and mobile licenses. Off-track betting operations would be the only entities eligible to obtain facility licenses and federally recognized tribes would be the only entities eligible to obtain mobile sports betting licenses. Entities eligible for a sports betting license could contract with vendors and management companies to support sports betting operations. Very notably, with respect to the tribal operation of sports betting, the language specifically ensures that the tribes are not only the sole owners of their operations, but that the significant majority of revenue from mobile sports betting will remain in tribal communities where it will circulate exclusively in our areas and within the state of Maine. This is in stark contrast to the state of Maine's current gaming industry, which exports the majority of its revenues to out-of-state corporate coffers. The amendment would include a revenue sharing cascade to allocate state income from sports betting to cover the cost of regulation, to address gambling addiction, and to support the horse racing industry. Voters approved a racino in Bangor. Voters did not approve a casino in Bangor. After the racino was passed, the legislature voted to expand gaming by allowing additional types of gaming so that the Bangor Casino could become a casino. The state of Maine lobbied for legislative action to expand casino gaming in favor of what is now the Hollywood Casino. The state of Maine simultaneously lobbied against gaming by the tribes and the tribes gaming efforts have been routinely opposed since then. Taxation as is included here would not and has nothing to do with cigarette and alcohol sales. It has nothing to do with existing state taxes that regulate these issues for the public health of the state of Maine. And I just wanna make that significant clarifying comment for those members of this panel who have specific concerns about whether state cigarette and alcohol taxes would be affected by LD 585. That is absolutely not the case. Tribal state collaboration is extraordinarily important to the long-term health of the state of Maine. This state is stronger when the Wabanaki nations and the state work together. Kachi Waliwan, thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there any questions for Michael Corey Hinton? It looks like there's gonna be one question for you, hang on. Representative Babbage, you can just um, unmute and ask your question rather than looking for your electronic hand, go ahead. I'm using two mouses and it didn't. Uh, um, Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and, and uh, great to see you, uh, Mr. Hinton, again. I can always rely on some wonderful information uh, from you. And I don't know if I've expressed it before, but the fact that we have um, approved uh, uh, two casinos and LD 1352 last year, and that the, well, other than a small portion of Oxford, that the tribes have not benefited um, as a result of those, uh, uh, has always uh, troubled me greatly. 
Um, you uh, you talked about money leaving the state with the ownership of the two casinos. Um, can you? The last that I've read, I, I know a casino was approved in another state where the managing uh, uh, management company had had negotiated a uh, a, uh, a a take of the of the proceeds at twenty five percent, and I know uh, some casinos are much higher than that. I, I is can you shed any light on if um, uh, the amount of funds that uh, would be uh, uh, benefiting the tribes from online betting would be at any better percent than, than that? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the question. It's good to see you again. Um, the amended language for LD-585 places a very explicit cap on the amount of fees that operators could pay to vendors or management companies. Um, the, the, the intent is to track a, a very important principle from federal Indian law, which essentially provides that tribes must hold the sole proprietary interest in their gaming operations. Limits on the amount of fees that can then be shared from tribal gaming operations to non-tribal entities are capped under federal law. And LD-585 as proposed for amendment would carry forth similar caps to ensure that gaming revenues are predominantly benefiting tribal communities and their neighbors. That's new information to me. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Committee members, any additional questions? Representative Newell, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Luis Bazuel, Corey Hinton, it's good to see you. It's good for you to be here. I appreciate your testimony. I'd like to pose the same question to you, Corey. Uh, that I posed to Chief Sabatis earlier this morning. Uh, I know that we, uh, we've heard testimony in regard to uh, taxation and cons consultation, and, and we've heard uh, a number of comments directed towards gaming. Um, however, I would like to pose this question. Why do you think the online provisions of this bill are fair? Well, there's a couple of good reasons for that. Thank you, Representative Newell, for raising this. <clears throat> First and foremost, the Wabanaki nations in this state have been forcibly held out of gaming, the gaming industry in this state for decades now. The future of gaming in the world, but most certainly in the United States, lies with um, mobile gaming activities. This legislation recognizes that the way that Maine's gaming industry has evolved, has explicitly left out and has discriminated against Native Americans. This legislation recognizes that inequity must be addressed and that the playing field can be leveled by providing significant opportunities to tribes to conduct um, economic development in ways that would specifically enhance rural communities in Maine. This legislation is about recognizing that casinos in Maine um, have dominated the landscape, that the majority of revenues from those casinos go out of state and that LD, LD-585 as amended would keep those dollars to not just support tribal communities, but to support the horse racing industry and economic development in rural Maine. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Uh, committee members, any additional questions? I am not seeing any. Um, Corey Hinton, thank you so much for um, providing testimony today. Hold on. Uh, next, we'll hear from Sean Mahoney. And it, he'll be, uh, he's moving through cyberspace and will be with us in just a moment. And I'm also bringing Maureen Druin over. She will be next. Sean Mahoney, uh, welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. You can begin your testimony when you're ready. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, good morning, Senator Carney, 
Representative Harnett and uh, members of the um, committee. I'll, I'll keep this very brief. Um, I know you've had long days. Um, my name is Sean Mahoney. I'm the vice president of the Conservation Law Foundation here in Maine, and I'm here to testify in favor of LD 585 as amended. Um, in short, uh, we see 585 as the representation of good faith and hard work by uh, the Wabanaki tribes and their elders, uh, the Mills administration, um, and this legislature and the preceding legislature, the 129th, um, to start to re-examine and reset the relationship between the state of Maine and the Wabanaki tribes. Um, we don't see this uh, legislation in and of itself as a solution to all of the issues um, that need to be redressed in order to reset um, that relationship and address the injustices that have been brought to the Wabanaki tribes over the last four centuries. But this is a significant step forward. And uh, we, uh, we want to support um, these efforts and the continued uh, communication and collaboration between the legislature, between the tribes, between the administration. And I neglected in my written comments to also recognize the work by Attorney General Frey and his colleagues at the Attorney General's office. Uh, so we are in favor of uh, LD uh, 585 as amended um, by uh, Representative Talbot Ross. Um, the final thing I would like to say is just to acknowledge um, uh, Representative Newell and, and her, um, her courage and her willingness uh, to speak up today uh, about the importance of language and um, what it can mean. And uh, I just want to acknowledge and respect that. Thank you. And thank you um, uh, for all of your work on this committee over the last two or three years um, to move these issues forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean Mahoney. Committee members, any questions? Not seeing any, we appreciate you providing testimony today. Next, we'll hear from Maureen Druin. And um, I will bring over uh, Whitney Parrish and Michael Kebeda, who are also proponents. Um, and that will finish the proponents for today. And um, Maureen Druin, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Hartnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Maureen Druin. I'm executive director of Maine Conservation Voters, a statewide organization representing more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democ democracy. I wanted to provide brief testimony, and you'll be hearing from me later on LD906, in support of LD585 as amended. Recognizing the sovereign rights of the Wabanaki nations is central to protecting our air, land, water, and shared climate future in Maine. While well, LD 585 does not address the underlying issue of sovereignty, it is an important step forward in repairing tribal state relations. This bill provides some benefits to the tribes in Maine that are already available to other federally recognized tribes in the areas of taxation and sports betting. While narrow in scope, LD 585 is progress, and Maine Conservation Voters urges you to vote ought to pass. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions for Maureen Druin? I'm not seeing any, we appreciate your testimony today. And next we will hear from Whitney Parrish and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney. Good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Whitney Parrish and I'm the Acting Executive Director of the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Tribal, Indigenous and Tribal Populations or the Permanent Commission. I'm honored to offer testimony today in support of LD 585 as amended. We're deeply gratitude, uh, grateful and extend our gratitude to Representative Talbot Ross for introducing this bill and to the tribal and state leaders who have worked uh, so hard on this issue. The Permanent Commission is an independent entity uh, with a mission to examine racial disparities across Maine and to work toward improving the status and outcomes for per, uh, currently and historically disadvantaged racial, indigenous, and tribal populations. So it is our deep honor to be here. As Vice Chief Daryl Newell of the Passamaquoddy at Matagakuk has said, as amended, this bill would not amend the Settlement Act. Amending the Settlement Act is the 
is in the tribe's sincere and absolute long-term objective though. However, he and others articulate recognition that finding common ground with the state on policies outside of the settlement act, settlement act, excuse me, can provide significant opportunity to the tribes. We stand in solidarity with our tribal and native family, friends, and neighbors today and believe their words and sentiments are the ones to whom you should defer. For the love we hold for this place, we now call Maine and all the people in it, we must seek justice for the Wabanaki nations. This bill is a step in the right direction, though as Chief Kirk Francis of the Penobscot Nation notes earlier, it is not full sovereignty and we will continue that fight so long as we are welcome. The Permanent Commission stands in solidarity for any measure that will improve lives and outcomes for Wabanaki people. Thank you for your time and consideration and we respectfully urge you to vote ought to pass on this bill. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Committee members, are there any questions for Whitney Parrish? Not seeing any. Um, and I'll ask, I, I think that there are, are more people than I was expecting who wish to testify in support of this legislation. And so I'm uh, turning to those in the attendee part of the meeting and asking that if you are here and would like to speak in support of LD 585, please raise your electronic hand and keep it raised until you've been brought onto the panel to provide your testimony. And um, next we'll hear from John Diefenbacher Kral and then Martin Chartrand. Uh, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. John Diefenbacher, Crawl, you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is John Diefenbacher, Crawl, and I proudly serve as the Executive Director of the Wabanaki Alliance. I submitted written testimony that I think is available to you, and so I'm not going to go over all the organizational history of the Wabanaki Alliance. What I do want to say is LD 585 has been noted by the distinguished Wabanaki leaders who have already appeared before you today is a product of discussions that have been taking place between leaders of the Holton Band of Malisee Indians, the Passamquoddy Tribe, Penobscot Nation, their legal counsel, and Governor Mills and some of her top advisors, along with the ever faithful involvement of Representative Rachel Talbot Ross. The Wabanaki Alliance has welcomed these discussions as the Wabanaki leaders have directly told you. The Wabanaki Alliance supports all initiatives that recognize inherent tribal sovereignty and of the five tribal governments, and it favors government to government dialogue. We support the proposals to institute tribal state collaboration to amend tax laws as they apply to the Maliseet, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot tribal governments and their citizens and provide the Wabanaki with an opportunity to pursue a form of gaming. I remind the Judiciary Committee that both Governors Baldacci and Governors LePage issued executive orders instituting tribal consultation. I know that because I was directly involved in drafting both of those executive orders. Um, I think there is a benefit to enacting in statute tribal state collaboration that will provide more permanency to the process and somewhat protect it from political upsets in the relationship. While dialogue and policy proposals from the executive branch of Maine state government are welcomed by the Wabanaki Alliance, the Judiciary Committee should understand we remain firmly committed to LD 1626. You have received what may amount to a record number of testimonies in any proceeding before the Maine legislature in its history two days ago. I've been appearing in the legislature since 1990, and I think I've offered testimony in every biennium since then. I urge you to evaluate 585 on its own merits 
but it is no substitute for LD 1626 and the unparalleled public support for the urgently needed changes to the Maine Implementing Act. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions, committee members? I'm not seeing any, we appreciate you being here today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, next we'll hear from, um, actually before we move on, we have four proponents who would like to speak in favor of this legislation. Sometimes when I am trying to bring people over onto the panel, the they um, are not available. And so what I'd like to do is to try, I'll try once to bring everybody over. And if you're not available at this time, we will rely on your written testimony. And uh, you know, again, you can supplement that if you would like. Um, so next we will hear from Sage Neptune. Uh, hello. Welcome, Sage Neptune, to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. Uh, please begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you very much to all of you. I am in favor of LD 585. Um, and thank you very much for giving me the time to speak today. <clears throat> uh, one thing in particular I wish to say today, perhaps we get nothing for it. They take the fish in the rivers that they don't get up to us. They take them with the wares. They take them with dip nets. They are all gone before they get to us. We get none. If you can stop them so that we can get fish too, we'd be very glad. There's another thing, our hunting privilege. They come and spoil all the game. They catch the young ones and the old ones. We take the old ones and leave the old young ones till they grow bigger and are worth more. They take the timber. They have teams and oxen to haul the trees. You see us now here very poor. If we were not poor, you would see us better dressed. We want you to give us something so when you see us again, you will know us. Those were the words of my great, 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 great grandfather, Lieutenant Governor John Neptune, the very same man whose portrait still resides in the state capitol. He spoke these words through a translator 200 years ago, shortly after the founding of Maine as state, as it was a colony before that, before that time. I thought I would be, I thought my best course of action would be to repeat his words, considering that even after two centuries, much of what he said then, said then, uh, beyond what I repeated here, is still pertinent in the modern day. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony, Sage Neptune. Committee members, are there questions for Sage Neptune? Not seeing any um, with appreciation, thank you. Next, we will hear from Martin Chartrand. Hi, good morning, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, you'll hear from me later with my prepared remarks. I, listening here to the testimonies, I felt moved to add, I am a resident of Penobscot lands in Bangor, and uh, I work as a installation contractor and weatherization technician and writer. And I remember when I moved to Bangor in 2007, because I grew up in Rockland, that uh, very soon after there was a referendum about, I believe the Penobscot people or other Wabanaki people having a gaming facility and that it got uh, voted down. And that that same year construction began on the Hollywood Casino Tower that uh, is now one of the biggest buildings when you drive up to Bangor on the skyline. And uh, that struck me as very unjust 
given the history of uh, dispropriation of the land of, of Wabanaki peoples and the many injustices that they've faced. And uh, I also feel that this, this bill LD 585 is not sufficient to restore sovereignty and rights to the Wabanaki nations, yet it's, it's a necessary step. And I think that uh, the fact that Wabanaki peoples are coming to the table uh, to have dialogue and engaging in this process, this legislative process with, with good faith and a lot of patience, even after all those injustices is tremendously generous and tremendously uh, shows the faith that is, is, is part of their culture. And I think that it's, it's a call on all of us as settlers to engage with the same good faith in this process and the same hard work and passing this bill is one step in that. So I urge you to support it, uh, LD 585. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there any questions for Martin Chartrand? Not seeing any again, we appreciate you providing testimony today. Next, we'll hear from Representative Benjamin Collin Collings. Good morning, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Arnett, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Representative Benjamin Collings, representing part of the city of Portland. I apologize for not being earlier. I was in um, taxation committee meetings, and thank you for allowing me to speak um, later on in the testimony for this bill. I am a proponent of this legislation. Um, Any time that the executive branch uh, can agree on on terms with our um, federally recognized tribes. I think that's a great step forward. However, as others have said before, I in no way want this to be uh, a replacement of any ongoing work to fully reform uh, sovereignty to a level that's consistent with most of the nation and with federal law and Supreme Court intent from back to the 1800s. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Um, as far as the parts of um, taxation, I think that's very fair in many other states. Tribes have uh, various rights on taxation, and I believe that that would be one step to um, leveling the playing field for the, uh, the federally recognized tribes here that neighbor with us. Um, the consultation is always uh, a wise part as um, has become a precedent in um, federal law. I think we should do it as much as possible here. And of course, on the, uh, the matter of economic justice with the um, component of sports betting. Um, the state for many years has had a monopoly on, on gambling with their state lotteries and other games. Um, two out-of-state corporations for years have had a monopoly, uh, in essence, on um, class three gaming. Um, so sports betting is becoming something, it's, it's legal nationally. Uh, it's, it's starting to roll out um, throughout the country. It's gonna be everywhere soon. And so, it's going to come to Maine eventually. We're at the point of moving forward on it. So based on what I said about who's been able to benefit from gambling and who hasn't, it's very clear that the tribes should have some uh, ability to compete. And I think most people in the legislature and in the state feel that they've been left behind in this regard. And so I think it's more than fair that they are given an advantage here where they've been given every disadvantage and other um, gambling opportunities which is very inconsistent with uh, federal law that benefits most uh, tribes across this country. To the point that m may have been made earlier about um, the casino in Bangor and if this will affect them, I can say having worked with um, uh, tribal casinos throughout the country and to some extent being knowledgeable about uh, the online betting, um, I see no way at all um, in this market in Maine that um, the tribes having sports betting would do anything to uh, hurt Bangor to, to the degree that would be exceptional. And um, I think Penn National is a very large, savvy national company throughout the, the country that competes in many states. I have no doubt that they will be fine if they feel somehow that 
Um, they don't want to do business anymore in the state. I know many people that would love to buy their company and would do exceptionally well. So uh, that's my thoughts on the bill. I hope that you will, again, continue to work towards uh, better fixes overall on sovereignty um, and not to replace those efforts by passing this bill. So I would encourage you to pass this bill as a step forward and continue to work to pass other more comprehensive pieces of legislation um, that would be more fair to um, the Wabanaki tribes. Thank you very much. I appreciate you letting me speak here. Uh, Thank you for providing testimony, uh, Representative Collings. Committee members, are there any questions for Representative Collings? I'm not seeing any questions for you. Once again, many thanks. And uh, I think our final proponent is Michael Kebeda. Welcome, and you may begin when you're ready. Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and uh, members of the committee, tribal chiefs and elders. Good morning. My name is Michael Capetta, and I'm policy counsel for the ACLU of Maine, a statewide organization dedicated to advancing and preserving the civil liberties and civil rights guaranteed by the state and federal constitutions. It's our general policy to support Indigenous self-government and sovereignty. We submitted written testimony in favor of the original version of this bill. We also urge you to support the amended version of this bill. This bill will advance the sovereignty, independence, and dignity of tribal nations in Maine. It is fundamentally unfair to restrict tribal nations from prospering from the same activities that the rest of Maine engages in and proper, prospers from, resulting in part in the enrichment of out-of-state corporations. But that has been the state of affairs for over four decades here, where Wabanaki peoples have lived since time immemorial. Considering that Wabanaki nations have protected these lands forever, the status quo is deplorable. Today, the state of Maine's behavior toward tribal nations is partly responsible for the extreme rates of poverty and unemployment among Wabanaki peoples. A 2015 United Nations report found that, quote, structural inequalities contribute to Maine tribal members experiencing extreme poverty, high unemployment, short life expectancy, poor health, limited educational opportunities, and diminished economic development. This bill, will improve Wabanaki health and welfare by encouraging rural development. Development that will be a rising tide that lifts not just Wabanaki nations, but also surrounding communities. Although this bill is no substitute for sovereignty, we still urge you to vote ought to pass. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm happy to try to answer questions. Thank you. Committee members, any questions for Michael Cabetta? I'm not seeing any, we appreciate your testimony. And at this point, um, we have one more person who wishes to speak in support of LD 585, and that is Sherry Mitchell, and she'll be joining us in just one moment. And Sherry Mitchell, when you have, um, when you're, oh, great, thank you. Um, welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. You may begin your testimony when you're ready. Uh, thank you, Senator Carney. I just want to clarify that I had uh, signed up to speak neither for nor against, but I have another meeting that I have to go to that's going to take me through 1.30 and I didn't want to miss the opportunity to testify. Is that, is that okay with the committee? Yes, you may proceed. Thank you. Uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for hearing my testimony this morning. 
Uh, I'd like to offer a special greeting to Representative Evangelos and say how nice it is to see you here this morning. Um, my name is Sherry Mitchell, I'm from the Penobscot Nation, and my family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy Tribe at Tabayak. I am not here today to speak in support or opposition to LD 585. I am here to simply speak some truths about the history and contemporary reality that is connected to these proceedings. As stated by others, I think it is important that we all acknowledge that no matter how committee members vote on this bill, that this is not a compromise to LD 1626. Considering this as a substitute for LD 1626 would be to deny the Wabanaki Nation sovereignty and right to self-determination. And it would narrow, as it would narrowly limit the rights of Wabanaki peoples to economic interests. It would fail to recognize the full humanity of Wabanaki peoples and their self-determined right to choose the path forward that is most aligned with their cultural values and traditional ways of being. Since Maine was granted statehood, the state has seen us as little more than a line on a ledger. Our humanity and our nationhood have consistently been reduced to, to a financial equation. In fact, many of the questions posed to this committee this morning have been about the Wabanaki Nation's impact on the economic interest of others in the state and the implication that equitable economic access for the tribes is somehow a threat to Maine a position that emphasizes the long history of exclusion that is at the heart of the racist infrastructure that has denied people of color an equitable position within the society. Though I readily acknowledge that this move does provide a needed opportunity to improve the financial conditions of Wabanaki peoples, it should not be viewed as an acknowledgement of our full sovereignty as Wabanaki nations. The ongoing reality of racism that we face in the main legislature and from the governor's office is heartbreakingly obvious to many, especially to the Wabanaki peoples who are forced to first witness these ongoing moves to deny our full sovereignty, and then to experience the racist fallout that accompanies those denials. It is no small thing to be subjected to unending discrimination and dehumanizing language and treatment by those in leadership positions in the state. It results in a trauma that can only be healed when the actions causing those harms ceases to exist. I would like to take a moment to honor Representative Talbot Ross for her heroic advocacy of the rights of Wabanaki peoples and her ongoing efforts to further the path of justice in the state of Maine. Her willingness to demonstrate her compassion and humanity in presenting this bill to the committee is an admirable demonstration of the type of humanity that we must all strive to achieve. I'd also like to recognize all the Wabanaki leaders who have had to enter into these negotiations in order to gain some long overdue forward movement for the people with the full knowledge that these measures fall far short of the goal of being recognized for the sovereign nations that we are. Before I close, I would like to offer a suggestion to the Judiciary Committee based on some of the questions that I've seen come out of this committee in the past and certainly some of the questions and comments that I have seen today. That in the future, this, require, this committee require that all entering lawmakers be giving an introductory course on the history of the Wabanaki Nations and the Wabanaki Confederacy, as well as some form of diversity, equity, and inclusion training. In closing, I say to all Wabanaki, Pasilda and Dilnabama, Kamach Kazalmo, and to the members of this committee, Kachiwiliwan, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sherry Mitchell, for your testimony today. And I see that we, excuse me, we have a question from Representative Evangelos. Go ahead, Representative. I just wanted to um, recognize Sherry Mitchell and for the wonderful thing that you and your nation did for me. But I was laid up. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Representative Babbage. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just uh, uh, wanted to ask if uh, I thought Ms. Mitchell's uh, testimony was you know, important. And I wondered if she had submitted it in writing for, for us to review later. I have not yet, but I will do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any additional questions, committee members? Not seeing any. We appreciate your providing testimony today and also that you'll uh, file it so that we have it in writing as well. And with that, I believe that we have heard from um, everyone who wishes to speak 
in support of LD 585 as amended. So now we'll move on to those who wish to speak in opposition. And I would ask that you raise your hand, your electronic hand, please, and keep it raised until you've been brought over to the panel to provide your testimony. Then again, this is a call for those who wish to speak in opposition to 585, raise your electronic hand and, and keep it raised until you've had a chance to speak. Many thanks. First, we'll hear from Chris Jackson. And next we'll hear from John Williams. John, I'm going to bring you over just because it takes a little bit of time to get from one spot to another. Chris Jackson, welcome to the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. You can begin when you're ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. I wasn't quite ready to be called on. I was sipping my coffee, so I'm <laughs> I'm glad I didn't make a mess of things. Um, my name is Chris Jackson. I'm a resident of Bodenham. Uh, I'm a partner in the lobby firm of Mitchell Tardy Jackson here in Augusta, and I'm here to testify in opposition to LD 585 on behalf of our client, the Hollywood Casino Hotel and Raceway in Bangor. Um, as you've heard, Hollywood's been licensed as a slot machine operator since 2005, following a statewide referendum and a city vote in 2003, and following a countywide referendum a casino operator with table games since 2012. Since that time, we've paid out $162 million in total payroll and have contributed almost $400 million in total gaming taxes to the state of Maine. And I hope we all agree, uh, whatever our position on this bill, that's a significant contribution to the state and the greater Bangor region. Since the Supreme Court overturned the prohibition on sports betting outside of Nevada a few years ago, 33 states in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have legalized sports betting. Many, if not all of the remaining states have legislation pending that would legalize and regulate betting on sports, including here in Maine, which passed LD 1352 uh, last session. That bill gave retail and tethered mobile sports betting licenses to the tribes, OTBs, commercial tracks, and the casinos. The model in that bill has proven itself to be the safest, most responsible model that has also benefited the states the most. With the exception of this legislation, we've been very engaged in the sports betting dialogue that has taken place in the legislature these last four sessions. Um, but you know, to be candid, we find this bill to be a, a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, when the governor issued her initial veto on sports betting, she said, among other things, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, to be clear, my words, not hers, that she did not want Maine to rush headlong into sports wagering, that we should wait and gain from the benefit of other states' experience on the matter. Uh, but this bill is, is a one of a kind. It removes casinos entirely from sports betting. Uh, nowhere in the country where there's commercial gaming is a model like the one before you employed. You may be pro-gaming or you may be anti-gaming, but I believe at least it stands to reason that if we are a commercial gaming state, which we are, the casinos should not be excluded from a large and growing segment of the industry that we at least are partially responsible for building. It's like saying you can build the Cross Insurance Center in Bangor, but you can't host the high school basketball tournament there. Our client operates 24 retail sports books and 11 mobile sports books throughout the country. They're hyper-regulated entities and they're compliance-driven operations, and they happen to be very good at what they do. With a retail sports book at our Bangor location, and a tethered mobile license. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Maine will benefit uh, from enhanced revenue generated by the increased foot traffic into retail sports books. I'll stop there, um, ask you to oppose this bill and happy to try to answer any questions if I'm able. Thank you very much. Committee members, are there questions for Chris Jackson? It looks like Representative Harnett has a question, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Nice to see you again, Mr. Jackson. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a simple question. I, I'm not finding uh, written testimony filed. Do you plan on filing your testimony today? I'd be happy to file that if, you, if you'd if you like, sir. You would. Thank you very much. Yep, happy to. Thank you. Um, Representative Babbage? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, actually, I, I too was 
interested in your written testimony. So I thank you, uh, Mr. Jackson, for following through on that. But now that I have you, I, I, I wonder, we don't know, well, I don't know the projections as to uh, uh, how successful online wagering would be uh, numerically, uh, uh, you know, financially in Maine. But can you enlighten me uh, as to what is a typical contract with uh, with um, uh, uh, online betting managers and so forth as far as uh, sharing proceeds? Uh, I, I really can't, Representative Babbage, um, for the simple reason that our client has, has actually spent a lot of time and money becoming vertically integrated throughout the industry over the last couple of years. So we would ideally be able to offer mobile sports betting on our own platform without having to contract, for example, with, um, you know, some of, some of the other um, vendors that, uh, you know, the, the, the tribes may, may or may not contract with. Um, there, I will say LD 1352 that's pending on the special appropriations table did have a positive fiscal note. I, I, I struggled to remember, Janet may know off the top of her head, I'm thinking it was Four to four to five million dollars over the biennium, uh, and and if I and if I may may just elaborate on that uh, quickly, the 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 a, a physical retail sports book in and of itself for a, a casino like the Hollywood Casino, I can't speak for Oxford, is uh, really a, a a bit of an amenity. It's it's marginal dollars. The, the greatest benefit from a sports betting license comes with an attached or, or tethered, you've heard that term, uh, mobile license that's connected to the license at the brick and mortar facility. So you can generate foot traffic for the small percentage of people who prefer to bet in person, 80 to 90%, depending on what you read um, of the market is indeed mobile and it's growing. But for the small percentage of people who want to bet in person, you drive up food and beverage sales, hotel room stays, uh, increase your slot drops revenue. And that benefits not only the facility, but the state of Maine through our, uh, our slots cascade, which goes towards scholarships for Maine Maritime, the University of Maine System, community colleges, the Fund for a Healthy Maine, veterans, harness racing um, industry, and, and on and on and on. So... Um, that's really the, the model that other states have used. If they have a physical location, they have a mobile license that is attached to the physical location. So it's a long-winded answer, and thanks for thanks for indulging me. Thank you. I pre I appreciate the detail of that answer. Um, if in fact, though, in these in these contra Representative contractual, Representative Savage, did oh, you want to follow? Did you want a follow up question? Is that is that okay, Madam Chair? Yes, you may. Um, thank you. Uh, I. I um, uh, would appreciate uh, any information you have on what a range might be of the online segment of that. Thank for the work session. I mean, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Representative Sheehan, go ahead with your question. Thanks, Madam Chair. And thank you, Mr. Jackson. Um, thank you. We've heard a lot today um, about how this negotiated compromise um, will hurt the city of, of Bangor and, and also your client. Um, as I said, I'm new to this. So to help me and, and the committee put, put this in perspective, um, I'd love to know, I'd love to get a sense of the yearly revenues of the Bangor facility. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and that is just just for your information. I'm happy to provide it to Janet. She can distribute to the committee for work session. But that is all public information, and it is um, held um, by the Department of Public Safety and the Gambling Control Board right on their website. But I'm happy to I'm happy to um, I'm happy to provide that to Janet, and she can distribute to uh, to the committee. Thank you. Yep. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Jackson, do you uh, acknowledge that there was never a statewide referendum on converting what previously was Hollywood slots into a full casino? That was my understanding was it was a countywide referendum, statewide so people, referendum to get the initial license and a countywide to go uh, add table games. So the people of the state never spoke on that issue. 
Uh, no, not on the table games, but on the slots and the initial casino license. It was a statewide. It was a statewide vote. It's uh, it's, and you know, uh, an editorial comment, if I may. A statewide vote is an extremely high bar to clear to get a gaming license. There's there's nothing in the law that prohibits anyone, frankly, from obtaining a casino license. It's spelled out very clearly in in Title VIII the the process for getting one. But it's not easy. But it's but but the procedure is there, and it's the one we followed, and it's the one Oxford followed, and so we would just, you know, um, just like to have that acknowledged. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Committee members, any additional questions for Chris Jackson? Not seeing any. Thank you so much for being here today and for answering our questions. Thank you all, have a good day. And next we will hear from John Williams. John Williams, welcome to the committee and you can begin your testimony when you're ready. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett and the uh, respected members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary for having me here today. Um, once again, I'm John Williams. I'm the executive director of the Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce. And um, I'm here to testify against LD 585. And our opposition to this bill specifically is in response to the 11th hour amendment made public just this past Monday that would basically circumvent the Committee of Jurisdiction, which is the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee to institute a massive expansion of gaming in the state of Maine without any consideration for Maine's existing casinos. Now, our problem with the bill and the amendment is that as, um, uh, as Mr. Jackson has said before, it cuts out any participation in sports wagering, both mobile and retail for the casinos. This is an issue with us right off the bat because we feel as though we should have fair and equal, basically, treatment when it comes to having the opportunity to also engage in sports wagering. One of the things I think that is so important to remember is that sports wagering is, is an economic engine to the entire state of Maine. You know, it's, it's happening all over the country. You know, we're, we're just beginning to see, obviously, the importance of what it means to have sports wagering here in the state of Maine. And, and it's, it's an economic engine for the future. So this testimony is, is not to oppose the betterment of Maine's recognized Native American tribes, but to call attention to the manner and venue to which the policy is being pushed forward. And when it comes to what the Oxford Casino has been able to provide for the state of Maine in the last 12 years, comes down to a cascade revenue donations to interest of over $250 million, of which, by the way, because it was mentioned earlier in testimony today, almost $25 million of that has gone to the uh, Penobscot and Passamaquoddy tribes, which is something that the casino wants to do, will continue to do, and wants to be able to do. What we are looking for right now is an opportunity to take advantage of online accessibility, because frankly, everybody, Online accessibility when it comes to this type of thing, sports wagering, is critically, critically important to its success, not only from the perspective of the tribes, but also from brick and mortar entities like, Holly, like Hollywood Slots and also the Oxford Casino. So what we're looking for more than anything else is an opportunity to take advantage of this as well and also be part of the diversity of growing sports wagering here in the state of Maine, we think it's the economic future of this state, these kinds of things. And certainly as an advocate for business in the greater Oxford Hills and in the Oxford County area, it's critically important to us because it will help to grow the Oxford Casino, frankly, which means that it will provide more opportunities for the Oxford Casino to share in its revenues. And I'm being told that I've run out of time, so I will let it go at that. But I appreciate you listening to me, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that I can. Thank you, John Williams. And let's see if there are committee questions for you. Uh, yes. Uh, Representative Libby, go ahead with your question. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I'm slow with my tech. I have to do two different buttons on my iPad to hit all the all the things. Thank you for being here today, uh, Mr. Williams. Um, I guess my, my question would be, we're hearing a lot about corporate this and corporate that with the casinos. Um, it, is that what we're looking at with Oxford Casino? And, and can you speak to uh, how, uh, has there been any community partnership, any community growth? I'm, I'm just trying to see the difference between a brick and mortar and the online world that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, I think from the perspective of what it has meant to the community, two things. I'll start right off by saying that, you know, when the, when the, when the casino, uh, when it passed referendum, and it took several years to get to that point where it passed a state referendum, and we were able to build the casino, it immediately provided nearly 500 um, full-time jobs in the greater Oxford Hills area. We were in a bit, we were in a significant economic malaise before this casino was built. So it has had a significant impact on the area when it comes to business, when it comes to attracting new businesses to the area, because we have had new businesses come into the area as a result of the casino being there. We consider that to be part of the economic growth that is critical to the area that we represent, that I represent as an executive director for the Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce in the 13 towns that uh, we umbrella. So from that perspective, yes, um, uh, Representative Libby, I don't think there's any question that they have not only partnered with our, with our communities, but they also provide support for, and I know this firsthand because of my uh, association with the uh, uh, casino and things that we do in the community, they have been very willing to support uh, financially, from a revenue perspective, many of the activities and events that occur in the greater Oxford Hills. And we expect that that would increase. Um, and there's an opportunity with, with online sports wagering for not only for revenue to be increased, but also for the participation of the casino in the communities that they represent. A follow-up, if I may, Madam Chair. You may. Thank you. Um, I had ha asked a question earlier regarding the, the cascade. Um, uh -huh. Given that that agreement is still in place and uh -huh. that the tribes will still benefit from the casino, yes. uh, how much revenue has the Oxford Casino generated for Maine tribes since 2012? That's $25 million. Since 2012, um, $25 million has been provided to the, uh, as I said, to the uh, Penobscot and Pascamaquoddy tribes. And I and I, you know, I can't speak specifically from the perspective of the administration at the uh, casino, but I can tell you that everything would indicate that that would continue, uh, that we would continue to support that, as we would with things like K twelve education, which is obviously uh, something that is required. You know, we support the university systems, we support uh, the main college community system, and we also uh, support the main harness racing. Association. So from that perspective, we only see this type of thing enhancing on our, our opportunity to, to provide more revenue from that perspective. And, and I think that this, I think that it's a true collaboration as opposed to, you know, the fact that, that, you know, that the Native American tribes would have exclusivity. That's not the issue here. The issue is let's all share in the opportunity to grow what I believe to be from the perspective of a business advocate a very, very strong um, opportunity to grow our economy with sports wagering as it is doing all over the United States right now. Thank you. And Madam Chair, I do have one quick last follow-up if I may. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Williams, given the 25 million that the, the casino revenue has generated mm -hmm. for Maine tribes in the last decade, would you anticipate the same carrying forward for the, for the next decade? I expect it will increase. That Thank would be you. my that would be my that would be my feeling. Anytime you add an opportunity like online sports wagering, all that's going to do is enhance the opportunities for um, a company like the Oxford Casino, and I'm assuming also Hollywood Slots to contribute to that. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee members, any additional questions for John Williams? Uh, uh, Representative Newell, go ahead. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand earlier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Williams. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, good. Representative Newell. It's good to have you here. I appreciate your perspective, but if I may just ask uh, one or two questions. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Uh, I think I picked up, uh, but could you just clarify that you're speaking for the chamber rather than the casino? I'm speaking on behalf of the Oxford Hills Chamber, but I was asked to sp speak and be here today uh, on behalf of the Oxford Casino as well. Yes. Yep. Thank and you. And I've been a spokesperson on their behalf before. Yep. Thank you for that response, Madam Chair, if I may. Mr. Yeah, Williams, go ahead. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Williams, you mentioned equal treatment. Yes. Can you please elaborate on whether or not there has been equal treatment in relation to gaming up until now? You know, it's, it's, it's a good question. I, I don't know as I have a clear answer to that. What I will tell you is that, as I mentioned before in my testimony, the process that we went through in Oxford County, okay, to develop, you know, this casino and the, um, the lobbying and the campaign and the statewide referendum. That we, that we had to go through to, to build this business in this area. You know, that is something that the entire state of Maine supported. And at, that, and at that point, what the casino is, is what the casino is from that perspective. When it comes to the way we look ahead and we look ahead to um, gaming and gaming rights and also things like online sports wagering, you know, my feeling is, is that, yes, we want to have Native American tribes be able to be fairly and equitably treated. We feel the same way about the way that we look at it from the perspective of the business that I support in the greater Oxford Hills. And of course, the Oxford Casino is not the only business that I represent. We have some 300 businesses that I represent in the Oxford Hills. But I think from that perspective, I'm not sure I'm answering you specifically, but what I'm saying to you is that I believe that we are moving in the direction where that will happen. My hope is that this doesn't become divisive, that we can get to the point where everyone is taking advantage of the opportunities that sports wagering will bring to the state of Maine. And to me, that's a positive step forward. I appreciate that response, Mr. Williams. Madam Chair, if I could just follow up. Yes, go ahead. Mr. Williams, you mentioned earlier um, your comment in regards to uh, wanting to have uh, I believe it was, let's all share. Uh, would you agree that the Wabanaki tribes in Maine have not had an equal share of that same opportunity that you're speaking about as this form of online gaming um, moves forward in the future? Would you know, this, yeah, oh, I let have, me just. No, that's all right, go ahead. Would this, uh, would this, um, online option in any way, you know, uh, have a, a, a adverse effect on the casino that you're speaking about? Um, and how would this opportunity primarily benefit small business and the tribes? I think that, I think that this, I think that if the casino and I'm, I'll speak specifically about the Oxford Casino, did not have an opportunity to be a part of this uh, bill and, and, and share in this opportunity for online revenue through sports wagering. Um, I think it would have an adverse effect on the communities, communities that we represent because it is an area that is very rural. We have many, many people that take advantage of obviously what happens at the Oxford Casino and they come there to, to gamble, they come there to enjoy food and entertainment and the events that go on there. But I also know that we have so many people in the state of Maine that, that, that are mobile. We're a very rural state. And, and getting back to your original point, I really believe that by giving us the opportunity to be a part of this, as I said before, to sort of share in a fair and equitable way, I really believe that this enhances the entire state of Maine. And it isn't just the Oxford Casino trying to get, you know, uh, trying to take advantage of, you know, something that will generate more revenue for them. We know it will. We know that it will, as we know that it will, and it will be a great enhancement as far as I'm concerned, from an advocacy perspective for the Native American tribes. We feel that we can work in an equitable and fair way with the Native American tribes to make this successful. 
for the entire state of Maine. I appreciate your responses, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Madam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, any additional questions for John Williams? Representative Babbage, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Williams, you uh, seem quite knowledgeable, so I'm I'm going going to ask you a, a question as as to uh, as a representative of the casino, perhaps. Um, could you enlighten us um, uh, as to the uh, over the last decade, perhaps what a what a, a chart would like would look like as far as net income from Oxford, and uh, to follow up on that. Um, do you know your the demographic of your clientele, Oxford County, Maine people beyond Oxford or out of state? I mean, I'm just throwing this out. Anything like and then and then uh, uh, would would the the demographic of of online uh, betting be be different uh, as you could see it? Do you what what can you tell me about any of those? Well, I. I I'll be honest with you. I don't have figures for net income. That is something I do not uh, have access to. And, but you probably could uh, get that information by going directly to uh, the state and, and they will be able to provide that for you. Um, and as far as the demographics go of the casino, uh, Representative Babbage, we, we know fully well that, you know, many, many people from the southern part of the state, uh, from New Hampshire, um, and even down into Massachusetts, come up to the Oxford Casino. Now, having said that, and I just want to make a, a note about this, there are other casinos that are being built, that have been built, that are now in competition with the Oxford Casino when it comes to demographics from the Massachusetts, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire um, area, and, and, and even in Southern Maine. So when it comes to that, we feel as though the Oxford Casino still offers a tremendous destination point for these people when they want to come into the state. No question about it. We feel that the online presence and demographic is going to enhance the customer base for the Oxford Casino. And I think also from the perspective of what it offers to the people of the state of Maine, because we are such a rural state. And, and I, I'm involved in broadcasting and I'm involved in, um, in talking with people about sports and sports wagering. And one of the things that I'm finding is that sports wagering really uncovers and, un, and, and, and really attracts new people to, I guess you'd call it gambling, sports wagering. But the fact is, is that it creates a demographic that perhaps we have not seen before. And that is something that I think would enhance not only the casino, no question about it, but it would also enhance the Native American tribes who could take advantage of that new demographic and the interest. And there's an enormous amount of interest in sports wagering as it is all across the country. It would also transfer to right here in the state of Maine. Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Representative Sheehan, go ahead. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, I hope I'm not um, splitting hairs here um, off of uh, Representative Babbage's question, um, but since you had at your fingertips um, the revenues that have gone from the Oxford Casino to the tribes, I was wondering if you had um, maybe a clearer or easier number um, such as yearly revenues of the casino? Well, again, and I, and I apologize, perhaps I should have that, but I don't. And, and instead of me throwing some wild number at you, which I would prefer not to do, I won't do that. But I think that probably you can, once again, you can get that information. It's accessible, it's public. And, um, and I'm sure that they would be happy to share that with you, uh, Representative Sheen. I honestly and truly, I am. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee members, any additional questions for John Williams? Not seeing any, again, we appreciate your testimony and your answers to our questions. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Carney. And thank you all very, very much. Have a great day. Next, we'll hear from Carol Conley. And I'm going to also bring over John Mandel, Dan Walker, and, uh, uh, Henry Bear, and call on you one at a time, but I'll bring you over to the panel now. Just ask that you be patient 
while um, we hear from the others. Can you hear me? Yes, Carol Conley. Could you, you also please activate your audio? I mean, your video, excuse me. I apologize. I will do that. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. Welcome to the uh, shores of Pushaw Lake. Um, Chairpersons, Karen and Harnett, members of the Judiciary Committee, my name is Carol Conley. I'm the director of the Christian Civic League. I thank you for the opportunity to speak in opposition to LD 585. It's not going to surprise anybody that the Christian Civic League, uh, who has historically uh, and consistently stood against any expansion of gambling, and that's our position here. Uh, what may surprise some people is that uh, I have a Native American lineage myself. My great grandmother, Mary Taylor, the full blooded Malisey. And she married my great grandfather. Unfortunately, due to shame and prejudice, uh, she concealed her heritage and we didn't find about that until a couple of generations later. I'm also a former history teacher and I'm well aware of the grave injustices that have been perpetrated upon Native Americans. And while many may have the best of intentions to try to rectify these horrors of our past, I am fully persuaded uh, that bills like LD 8585 will actually increase suffering in injustices. We just celebrated Martin Luther King's birthday and his opinions regarding government sponsored gambling are very clear due to their corrupting influence. And one of my favorite quotes regarding gambling comes from Dr. Martin Luther King's biographer of the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Taylor Branch when he said state sponsored predatory gambling is essentially a corruption of democracy because it violates the most basic premises that make democracy unique, that you can be self-governing, you can be honest and open about your disagreements as well as your agreements, and that you can trust other people because you're in this together. That's what a compact of citizens is, and that is the first step. The first step away from that is to play each other for suckers, saying we're going to trick them into thinking they are going to get rich but they are really going to be just paying my taxes. Obviously the Christian Civic League would be in favor of getting rid of all forms of gambling, including the lottery, because of the toll that we believe it takes upon the poor. At one time, that was a reliable progressive position politically. If the scope of LD 585 were limited to simply reallocating sports betting under the auspice of Native American interests, it would be difficult for us to stand against it because technically it wouldn't be an expansion. That is not the case of LD 585. The language regarding facilities clearly moves this legislation towards future casino expansion. And therefore we do urge you, uh, please to vote ought not to pass for LD 585. And I do want to also pass on um, the good wishes that we heard from uh, Sherry Mitchell. It's good to see Representative Evangelos and see our prayers were answered that he's doing well. Thank you, Carol Conley. Committee members, are there any questions for Carol Conley? Representative Babbage, I think that your hand is up from prior. Okay, great, thanks. And I am not seeing any questions for you. Thank you for providing testimony today. Thank you. Oh, it looks like Representative Evangelos' hand is up. Representative, oh. go ahead. I just wanted to thank you um, for all the well wishes. I never had so many conservatives write me so many good <laughs> wishes, so thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank You're welcome. you. Okay, and next we will hear from John Mandel. Good afternoon, representatives, chairpersons Carney and Harnett. My name is John Mandel, and I'm testifying today on behalf of the Sports Betting Alliance, which is a coalition of the leading mobile sports betting operators in the United States and includes FanDuel, DraftKings, BetMGM, and Fanatics. SBA has submitted written testimony, and I'm here this morning to respectfully urge this committee to reject Part J of the proposed committee amendment to LD 585. SBA wants to make it clear that we do not have a position on the other aspects of LD 585 and the amendment as well. There is currently a bill, LD 1352, which you heard about, 
that is the product of multiple years of work by the Veterans and Legal Affairs Committee, Mainers and industry stakeholders that would provide the federally recognized Indian tribes in Maine the opportunity to offer mobile sports betting. Also, unlike LD 1352, Part J of the amendment limits the number of companies eager to provide innovative and engaging products to Maine, including existing contributors to the Maine economy. As this committee knows, the legislature passed the sports betting bill three years ago with tremendous support in the legislature, but it was ultimately vetoed by the governor. Last year, the VLA committee, SBA's members and stakeholders alike worked together on a new proposal, LD 1352, that afforded in-stake stakeholders greater economic security and addressed the important public policy concerns raised previously by the governor. LD 1352 was further shaped by a public hearing three work sessions, and a separate voting session. LD 1352 passed in the Senate and House with overwhelming John Mandel, support. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. You're pro providing us a lot of testimony about 1352, and that is on the appropriations table. Can you please focus your remarks on 585? Absolutely, Senator. Thank, Thank you. you for that. Well, so while states have taken slightly different approaches on sports betting, one thing is clear, uh, an online marketplace with multiple qualified and experienced operators is a critical aspect to the legal sports betting framework success. Because as you've heard from today, about 90% of sports wagering takes place online. And that was trending even before the pandemic. And so Really, it is the sort of truly best solution in eliminating the illegal market, which is flourishing as we speak. Uh, I could send you screenshots of uh, a numerous apps of, and websites available right now to Mainers through offshore sites. Uh, and we can provide also data around the size of the illegal market. Part J of this proposal unfortunately caps the number of mobile options to four, but could leave Maine with just one which would lead to diminished revenue, fewer options for consumers, and continued infiltration by the legal offshore market. Conversely, LD, and I won't go too far into 1352, but- yeah, Just please uh, just stick to 585. We really appreciate that. Completely Point of understand. order, Madam Chair. Uh, point of order, oh, Madam Chair. Thank you. I, I, I'm not, where in the rules does it say that uh, if someone wants to spend their three minutes discussing um, another bill that they feel ties into this bill that that is not allowed. I just would like some clarification on that. If that is in our rules, um, I, I will certainly appreciate knowing where that is. Yeah, just a second. I suppose my point would be, I would like to allow Mr. Mandel to use his three minutes in whatever way he feels is best served regarding testifying on this bill. Yeah, I appreciate that. And that is why I did let him uh, speak to the contrast initially, but when it seemed like he was only going to be advocating for, for 1352, which again uh, has passed and is on the appropriations table, I um, thought that he was going way beyond what is germane to 585 and speaking I, I, exclusively I have, about, please don't interrupt me, speaking exclusively about 1352. And so, um, and this is a public hearing on 585. When we conduct public hearings, they focus on the legislation that we are conducting the public hearing on. That's why we have um, the public notice on our committee rules. And it's not a question of anybody can just speak to anything they want during the three minutes. It's really, supposed to focus on the matter before the committee. I appreciate that, Madam Chair, but I, I do appreciate that he was referring to it. It's helpful to me. This is not um, a, a bill that we have in our jurisdiction typically. It's a completely different topic that's outside of what we usually hear. And I, for one, certainly appreciate hearing his reference. And um, well, certainly given the number of folks who spoke in support of this bill and also referenced the same bill, um, we'll be looking that 13, whatever it is up after this hearing, because I, I didn't hear you say the same thing to the proponents um, of 585 when they brought up the bill earlier. So um, I do think that other people mentioned 1352, particularly some of the opponents, but not as extensively as Mr. Mandel. 
And again, to me, it seemed like he was advocating for that measure rather than opposing 585, which is the bill before us. And so with respect for your raising the point of order, I'm going to do two things. One is to ask Mr. Mandel to continue his opposing testimony, focusing on your opposition to 585, the proposal before the committee at this time. But before you start talking, I feel like we have used up all of your three minutes on this point of order. And so Representative Harnett, could you please um, let Mr. Mandel know how much time he has left? Because I want to be fair to him and give him the time that he needs to speak to 585. Uh, I actually stopped the clock when the point of order was raised and uh, Mr. Mandel had one minute and five seconds remaining at that time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mandel, please take another minute and we'll be a little generous. And again, if you can just speak to 585, we would most appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think I won't even need the whole minute. Um, to some, Part J of the proposal, uh, Part J of this proposal, unfortunately, caps the number of mobile options to four, but could leave Maine with just one, which would lead to diminished revenue, fewer options for consumers, and continued infiltration by the illegal offshore market. That is why we again respectfully ask the committee to vote down Part J and look towards other options of including the tribes in a existing gaming framework that helps eradicate the illegal market, protect consumers, and generate tax revenue and investment in the state. So thank you for letting me finish my testimony, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And it looks like we do have a couple of questions. Uh, Representative Babich, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Mandel, um, can, can you please elaborate on, uh, because I don't understand the process real well, uh, could you please elaborate on what uh, the illegal market is and how LD-585 um, might be impacted by that? Thank you for the question, Representative. And uh, I could certainly provide either through a shared screen or separately offline uh, a, a, an example just to show you if you were to Google Maine and uh, sports wagering right now, numerous illegal offshore websites would become available that suggest, in fact, they are legal because, quite frankly, they're offshore. Um, there is a, it's very difficult to enforce without a legal framework in a state. Um, and they offer very misleading advertisements. Um, we estimate based on data that we've seen, and it's sort of substantiated by what we've seen over from the legal market, that there's probably about 276,000 Mainers currently wagering in the illegal sports wagering market right now to the tune of $620 million annually. Um, so when we talk about the illegal market, I know uh, for sports wagering, the, the, the image comes of a, of a bookie at a neighborhood bar, but it's, it's, it's quite the opposite. It's a very sophisticated offshore uh, website and even mobile app operate, mobile app that Mainers right now are accessing and folks across the country particularly and disproportionately in places without legal sports wagering options. May I have one follow-up, uh, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. And thank you. Um, so th thank you for that. That was that was interesting and helpful. Uh, so uh, are Mainers uh, wagering in New Hampshire and and not being uh, identified? Great question, Representative. I can't speak to how, what number of, of Mainers are are sort of going over to New Hampshire, but undoubtedly they are. I, I for we, what we see across the country is places that have legalized sports wagering see quite a high percentage of folks from states where there isn't legal sports wagering come over to wager. Uh, an example you may have read recently was about a quarter of the uh, wagers placed on the Super Bowl in New Hampshire came from uh, Massachusetts. A similar statistic, I think closer to 20%, was true in New Jersey before they also legaled mobile sports wagering. If I could just clarify one thing, Madam Chair, those people that wagered from Massachusetts or Maine physically went to New Hampshire to do so. Is there 
a mechanism to prevent people from wagering at home uh, in those states? Absolutely. And it's a great question, Representative. There's a very sophisticated geocomply fencing program. It, essentially, these apps are inoperable by for those who are regulated and licensed in the states uh, to place wagers from outside of the states. So we can even provide you maps to show you the number of individuals who come across a, a border from a state where there isn't legal sports wagering. And, uh, you know, I, I myself live in New York City. And uh, there's a well-known uh, McDonald's uh, uh, across the river in New Jersey where you see quite a high volume of wagers uh, taking place. This was, of course, before mobile sports wagering was legalized in, in New York, which happened last year. So we expect that, obviously, to, uh, to be reduced. But absolutely, there is a very sophisticated system to prevent well, what you have described there, Representative. Thank you uh, for your questions, Representative Babbage and, and John Mandel. Thank you for that information. I think that was new information that was really helpful for the committee to hear about. Um, Representative Newell, you can go ahead with your questions. And um, actually, just one minute. Um, Henry Bear, you're waving your hand. Are, are you, um, can you just let us know what your concern is? I think I thank you so much for uh, noticing that I was signaling. Uh, I'm in an unusual circumstance, uh, and I was hoping to uh, get the indulgence of MIDI and uh, pending witnesses that I might be able to provide a brief statement and rush off. Even though I prepared him, you know, some trays of stuffed peppers and some uh, shepherd's Wait, pie you know, and lasagna, you know, I have yeah, to tend to my brother. I have okay. to leave and tend to my brother who had open heart surgery this past week. So I wanna rush away to help him and cook for him. But can I give a presentation next uh, and then I will leave uh, the committee with my written testimony for all the bills this afternoon. Thank Is you. Is that yes. possible? We will call on you next. Thank you. Um, uh, Representative Newell, I apologize um, for the interruption. And if you could go ahead with your question. Let me recenter there, Madam Chair. Um, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Mandel. Thank you for being here. Thank you for providing uh, testimony to this committee. Um, might I ask you the size and uh, revenue earned um, by the companies that uh, reflect part of your coalition? And uh, the follow up to that would be do you know how that compares to the uh, size of tribal economies uh, in Maine? And uh, I know I'm pushing this, Madam Chair. Um, if this bill passes, would your clients work with the tribes? Well, thank you for the question, Representative. I, 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 for one, do not have the information uh, about the revenue figures. Several of our companies I believe, are, are private, some I, I, I believe are public, so there might be some information publicly available. Of course, a number of these companies also uh, are currently provide other products, for example, uh, in Maine, um, DraftKings and FanDuel are daily fantasy sports operators, as an example. So there, I could certainly inquire, but I do not have that information. And I believe the next question, Representative, was uh, whether the companies would be interested in, in partnering with um, uh, the tribes. I, I can certainly say that uh, the members of our coalition have partnered with tribes in other states. Um, th this question is more of a, a, I believe, a business question that goes to specific companies. But I can tell you unequivocally that you know these companies have partnered with tribes in other states as well. Thank you for providing a response to my questions, um, Mr. Mandel, and thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Libby, go ahead with your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's a similar question or same question I had for someone earlier and they suggested that uh, someone who would be testifying later might be better equipped to answer it. So uh, Mr. Mandel, I'll ask you the same question. You seem to have familiarity. Um, multiple people, including yourself, have brought up LD 1352. And I guess my question would be, does that do the same thing that Part J does here and give exclusive online gaming rights to uh, the Wabanaki nations? 
Representative, I appreciate the question. And if, if the chairs wouldn't mind, I, I may indulge the, the answer to this question. It's, it's, I'm not sure I even understand the question. Representative Libby, I just want to um, remind you of committee rule seven and then ask you to ask the question again because I, I just didn't understand it. But committee rule seven does um, speak to the fact that, and let me just find it here. I'm happy to restate Senator Carney. I'll go ahead and restate, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you know, Mr. Mandel, if we've had any other bills similar that have sought to give online gaming rights exclusively to the Wabanaki nations? I believe not representative, not to my Thank knowledge, you. at least. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Carney, I would like to know, it would be very helpful to have um, the bill analysis for LD 1352 available for the work session. Thank you. Yes, and I think um, we will, I think you can find it now and I will, uh, after this hearing, send you a link to it as well, but um, appreciate your request. And Representative Harnett, I know that you have been not only timing, but helping me um, with the rules. Can you point us to the part of Committee Rule 7, and I know it's in here, about um, the hearing pertaining only to the bill before the committee? And uh, you're, we're not able to hear yeah, you. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, rule 7 states procedures for public hearings. The purpose of a public hearing is to invite public comments on proposed legislation before the committee. Thank you. Representative Libby. I, I appreciate that. Thank you for finding where that is in the rules. And I assume that all who testify will be held to the same standard of not bringing up other legislation from here henceforth. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanna clarify that I, I have let people refer to other testimony briefly. My concern here was that this um, particular individual who has provided helpful information regarding 585 was advocating, specifically advocating for other legislation. And I think that's different than just mentioning it. Um, and so with that, I just wanna know if there are any other uh, committee member questions for John Mandel. I am not seeing any, but Mr. Mandel, you referenced a couple of pieces of information, including some maps about the, um, I think you called it the illegal, let me look at my notes here. The illegal market. And if you could provide for that information to our committee clerk, I think that would be helpful for the committee's consideration in the future. Absolutely, and I must give a shout out to uh, the committee clerk and, and, and particularly Janet, who's, who's done tremendous work in this space before without mentioning the bill's name. So thank you very much for your time, members of the committee. Thank you very much. And um, next we will take out of order, um, Henry Bear, who needs to go tend to a family member. And um, Henry Bear, if you could Please, um, I know that you've provided extensive written testimony. If you could uh, speak your three minutes on 585 and um, then we will wish you and your family member well. Thank you so much. Uh, I would enjoy talking to you about my brother who lives just down the river from where I'm sitting right now, but I don't want to chew too much into my three minutes other than he's recovering from triple bypass quite well. So thank you, but I am his cook, so I want to rush off. Um, I just want to comment that uh, uh, in listening to uh, the committee and to witnesses, uh, particularly Chief Francis, with whom uh, I feel uh, honored to uh, listen to, uh, and the points that he made to summarize the bill's purpose, which was to improve collaboration, to, uh, uh, to uh, set out economic uh, 
uh, tools uh, to create opportunities and to uh, provide greater uh, specific opportunities for for gaming for tribals tribes to benefit from, which these are these are points uh, you know that are well taken and uh, efforts that we've all contributed to uh, try to achieve. I just want to say uh, with regard to the bill that I I maintain my position as I have in the hearings uh, on Tuesday uh, and today, uh, and you'll see it in my testimony. And so I won't get into my testimony specifically other than to ask the committee and the public to, you know, go ahead and download and, and review uh, the points I made last Tuesday and uh, the additional points I've made today uh, that uh, I can neither support nor uh, oppose uh, this bill uh, for the reasons contained in the submission, but I would like to take note of the excellent points made today that uh, uh, and add to them. I am, uh, of course, uh, in agreement that uh, uh, these bills uh, offered by the state and the governor's office uh, through the legal counsel uh, are not uh, what 1626 purport to offer. Uh, and that's a danger. But 1626 is not where we need to go either, in my view, and I gave the reasons. But I won't get into that again, uh, other than to say there is no substitute for complying with existing treaty and constitutional law. But I would like to also point out that Sherry Miss Mitchell's call to action on uh, the committee and the state uh, government officials to you know, becoming more informed, I wanted to let you all know that I believe that uh, the Aristic Treaty Education Program that I direct uh, is available for all of you to benefit from, or to at least help uh, you uh, in, in achieving uh, that goal that uh, Attorney Mitchell points out that you should uh, seek. I'm, in, of course, uh, very much taken by uh, Mr. Neptune's comments of his ancestors' uh, position on uh, encroachments and on resource denial. And uh, I see the chairman's uh, you know, signal that time is now winding down. I just want to thank everybody uh, for the good faith efforts uh, that are so obvious in this proceeding. But I urge the cautions that I relate in my testimony. Uh, thank you. Uh, and again, greetings to my chiefs, my elders, and Waliwan uh, for you know treating me so good and up Jeech. We'll see each other again. Thank you very much, Henry Bear, and um, we are all wishing good thoughts for your brother. Thank you. Uh, and now committee members will hear from Dan Walker. And um, Dan Walker, thank you so much for your patience while we accommodated Henry Bear, and you can begin whenever you're ready. I will always accommodate Henry Bear. Um, Senator Carney, Representative Barnett, members of the Judiciary Committee and Tribal Chiefs. Uh, my name is Dan Walker. I'm an attorney with Freddie Flaherty and representing the Oxford Casino and Hotel in Oxford, Maine, and have been representing them even before their approval in a statewide initiative in 2010. I testify today in opposition to the proposed committee amendment to LD 585, as you've heard specifically Part J, which establishes a sports wagering program, which includes seven expanded sports wagering facilities at off-track betting parlors and exclusive licenses for the tribes for widespread online sports betting in Maine for the first time. We support the efforts of Maine's tribes towards self-determination and dignity, but not through these specific provisions, which exclude the existing casinos, good longtime partners of the state. Such exclusivity will harm the successful economic engine that has helped turn around Oxford County and the Bangor region. There are also only so many online, so many gaming dollars to go around in our small state. The current sports wagering proposal in LD 585, which we were only able to review a couple of days ago, completely excludes from every aspect of the program, the casinos who have been good partners to the state and are the entities in Maine, most able to handle such a broad expansion of gaming. The Oxford Casino is taxed at a rate close to 50% and provides a cascade of revenues to a number of worthy causes and programs, as you've heard. 
which includes millions upon millions of dollars to funding for K through 12 education, college, college scholarships, the harness racing industries, and yes, the tribes up to, uh, uh, to a total of nearly $25 million, as you've heard. Additionally, Maine currently has programs for problem gaming that are implemented and maintained by the casinos, including exclusion. They also work with the state to make sure overdue child support payments are collected and have been for a long time. The Oxford Casino is in the best position to advance the interests of the state, to protect the public, and to allow a sports wagering program to be implemented quickly and successfully as its parent company, Churchill Downs, has developed its own sports gaming program in other jurisdictions. Now, you heard from uh, John Williams some of this, but since Oxford Casino opened its doors in 2012 and has expanded three times, we've clearly seen the incredible economic benefits brought to the town of Oxford, the region, and the state. Currently, they employ 375 individuals, however, down from 450 pre-pandemic, they're hurting like everybody else. Um, but the success of the Oxford Casino has created an economic foundation, lifting this poor region this to, to higher levels now and has spurred additional growth in this area. Um, now, I just wanna say that we ask that this committee vote to include the casinos in this bill and to be allowed to apply for both online and brick and mortar licenses or simply use, simply use an existing bill that is sitting on the table to grow sports wagering and include all industry participants to grow this industry in the best way possible, including of course the tribes. Um, I'll conclude there and take any questions. Thank you very much, Dan Walker. Committee members, are there questions for Dan Walker? Looks like we have a question from Representative Babbage. Go ahead, Representative. I thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to inquire if Mr. Walker had submitted written testimony. I'd, I'd like to take a look. Later I will. I wanted to hear, <laughs> uh, listen to the to all the testimony, and be able to react to it and incorporate it into our testimony. So I will be I will be submitting testimony. Thank you. And we will, you know, in, in response to some to other questions um, around revenue, you know, the on the Gambling Control Board uh, webpage, uh, they include all of, you know, out there for the world to see all of the um, uh, the revenues that come through and all the revenues that that uh, that come through the slots that come through the table games, what's kept by the state, what's not kept by this, you know, what's what's passed through. So it's it's there every month and we can we will circulate that uh, that PDF that's on on their web page. Thank you and thank you for um, offering that additional information. Uh, Representative Thorne, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walker for coming forth and providing a testimony today. Um, I'm just curious, were you involved at all in any of the conversations uh, surrounding the conditions of, of this bill? No, we no, we were we have not been uh, involved at all in this. We've as of we the first we heard about it was about two weeks ago um, when I think um, we started to hear inklings that there was a, a deal happening. But you know, we we would have hoped that we would have been brought forward again, being good partners to the state um, for a long time. That we would have to, and we want to help the state go forward in, in these issues. But we no, we were not brought into any of the discussions. And a follow-up question, if I may. You may. Um, Mr. Walker, were you involved at all uh, at the point where Oxford Casino initially uh, negotiated with the state, as it were, for conditions or terms? Or was that so, before your time? No, <laughs> no. I, I've been there since the very beginning with, with them. It, 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 you know, it started with a group of locals in the Oxford area. Um, who thought they wanted to do something good for the area and create a, a foundation. Um, I worked with them to draft the citizens initiative, uh, worked with them on getting the initiative passed, worked through the recount, brought it forward to the legislature and, and perfected. So as I, I've been involved every step of the way and then worked with the, um, with the, with the VLA committee, the committee of jurisdiction to um, implement that and, and, and all the various um, the cascades have been involved, but you know, again, like um, you know, it, what what we follow was is the state law, which is that, um, and we followed that 
uh, Bangor followed that, and um, and here we are. Thank you for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Newell, go ahead with your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Walker. Hello, Representative Newell. I appreciate you being here and hearing your testimony. If I may just pose uh, one or two questions, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Walker, did I hear you correctly that you may have suggested that this proposal would cut out casinos out of sports betting? And can you comment on to whether any of the casinos in Maine are involved in the OTB or horse racing industry that would directly benefit from LD 585? Uh, speaking for my client, uh, the Oxford Casino, we do not have uh, an OTB in the state of Maine. Um, so we would be completely cut out of this, of this program. Um, uh, Hollywood Casino does have an OTB, um, which is connected to its track. Uh, so they would, uh, they would be able to have a, a physical facility. But I think as you've heard, um, really the, the, the 90% of the profits uh, from sports wagering are online. So everybody, you know, so I think if what has been discussed uh, in this debate over the last couple of years is that and what went forward was the ability for all the folks with brick and mortar and the, and the tribes to be able to have both a uh, physical presence and an online presence because that online presence is really it's where it's it, 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 for sports wagering that's where it's 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 happening as you heard from from my uh, colleague who represents um, uh, Hollywood that really to it, it, for a facility it, it, it brings more people in but it's just another amenity uh, that they bring that they that they bring in again it's it's all about the online portion. Thank you, Mr. Walker, for your response. Madam Chair, one more question, please. Go ahead. Um, Mr. Walker, can you comment on the amount of profits that your client sends out of state? And what, well, percentage, what percentage of your revenue is sent out of state? I haven't done the math, but uh, as, we, as I indicated uh, earlier um, with Representative Babbage, um, it's all on the... Um, you know, they're, they're taxed to the level of, of uh, 46% on slot, slot machines. Um, that's taken right, right away. And then they pay, you know, main taxes, they main, pay em employees. And then apart from that, uh, the percentage that is, is kind of, is a profit that is kept by Churchill Downs. I need to, I need to look at that, but I don't have that off the top of my head. But again, it's all on the gambling control board um, page and we can, we'll, we'll provide you with that PDF of, of, uh, all the revenue. Appreciate. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Committee members, are there any other questions for Dan Walker? I am not seeing any. Thank you for your testimony and also thank you for your offers to provide us with the additional information. We appreciate that a lot. You're welcome. Anything. And um, at this point, we have heard from the proponents and opponents for LD 585. And I did want to ask uh, those in the attendee space if there is anyone else who wishes to speak in opposition, just doing one final check. And now anyone wishing to speak neither for nor against 585? We have a couple who, of uh, people who would wish to speak neither for nor against. And it looks like we have six individuals and committee members. I know that we are sort of overdue for a little break. I think that it'll take us about a half, another half hour on 585. Would you like to break now and return for neither for nor against or um, do another half hour worth of work and then take a break? So let me just uh, take an informal poll here. If you want to take a break now, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like we're going to wrap up 585 before our break. So we'll start with Paul Tebow, and I will bring over um, then Michael Cushing and Debbie Patterson and James Day as well.
And Paul Tebow, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. You could begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you, um, Chairpersons uh, Carney and Harnett and members of the committee. Um, I am Paul Tebow, Managing Director of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. I am in the neither for nor against uh, category at this point because the proposal is so recent, the commission hasn't had an opportunity to completely review it. It will be on the agenda for our next meeting, which is scheduled for March 2nd. But at this time, I wanted to address things uh, in, in the amendment that relates specifically to tribal state consultation. Um, I note that the amendment includes some specific duties for MITSIC with respect to tribal state consultation. Promoting effective tribal state consultation has always been a high priority, probably one of the highest priorities uh, for the Tribal State Commission. MITSIC has done extensive work on identifying best practices for tribal state consultation, including in connection with the development of LD 2094 and then uh, by carryover to LD 1626, which includes significant work product of the commission on the issue of effective tribal state consultation. I would note that in the course of all that work, MITSIC has looked at other states uh, in terms of what they have for tribal state consultation provisions, including statutes in some states. On first reviewing the, the amendment, it appears to me that it may that the scope of issues which would be subject to tribal state consultation may be more narrow than exists in some other provisions in other places. Uh, it refers to matters that are that substantially and uniquely affect the tribes. I think that may be more narrow than in some other places, and I believe it is more narrow than what MITSIC has recommended in the past. I also want to note that uh, as has been pointed out earlier, executive orders have come and gone in the state of Maine regarding consultation. They've never been fully implemented and they haven't been effective. So legislation that institutionalizes a tribal state consultation process would be a substantial positive step that MITSIC has recommended in the past. Um, I just wanted to make those comments at this point as I say, MITSIC will be addressing, reviewing the bill at its next meeting, and MITSIC would be available for work sessions as the, the bill goes forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions for Paul Tebow? Representative Thorne, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Tebow. Thank you for coming forth and providing your testimony today. So am I to understand that it would be of benefit if we were to hold off uh, our work session on this bill until after you've had time to meet on your March 2nd meeting? I'm not, I'm not necessarily asking you to hold up committee work uh, on the bill. I just wanted to point out that, um, that you know, the, the, the amendment had come up recently and Metzik next meeting is scheduled for March, March 2nd. But I, if there is a work session before that, uh, we do have a committee, a legislative committee that I can confer with, and I could participate on behalf of METSIC in a work session, even if it is prior to our next meeting. All right, thank you. I just want to know where you stood on that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for the question and the answer. Any other questions? Oh, it looks like Representative Babbage has one. Go ahead, Representative. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hello, Mr. Thibault. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you because you represent uh, more than one tribe and um, I, uh, I wanted to ask about um, uh, the determination of disbursement to different tribes and um, how, how, that's how that's arrived at and how that could be changed if, if need be. Are you familiar with that from the? I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to in terms of disbursement. 
in another whoops i'm sorry i mean i'm still on uh in other in other words uh obviously the bill is designed to benefit means indigenous population i i wondered how when when we have the casino uh uh monies uh, uh with an identified cascade of recipients uh uh in, including the tribes from oxford but th that cascade is 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 public information and to change that cascade it's my understanding that the legislature would have to uh be involved i i wondered how the disbursement among the tribes is determined in in this bill and and if the tribes were if a tribal uh if a if a particular tribe were unhappy with the disbursement in future how that might be changed well i I'd like to be able to answer your question, Representative Babbage, but um, I, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to do that. Um, okay. I needed today. I needed to confine my my comments to the tribal consultation aspect of the bill, as I indicated. Uh, the commission really hasn't had the opportunity yet to fully review the bill, and I wouldn't feel comfortable um, trying to give you an answer to that specific question. F fair enough. Good to see you again. Committee members, any additional questions? Not seeing any. Thank you, Paul Thibault, for providing testimony today. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Debbie Patterson. Debbie Patterson, yeah, great, thank you, go ahead. Great, good afternoon, Senator Carney, Representative Parnett, and members of the Joint Standing Judicial Committee. My name is Debbie Patterson, and I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Harness Horsemen's Association. I would like to speak neither for or against the amended version of LD 585. Um, part I of this um, raised a few concerns um, because sports wagering uh, was limited to um, off-track betting facilities. And there is licensee language in another bill um, that if implemented, uh, in LD 585 could bring in a new demographic to our industry. And the second concern is kind of tied into that as well. Um, on page 20, uh, 1206, number one states that there would only be um, seven OTB facilities that could re receive licenses. If you look at the structure of our OTBs, uh, they're predominantly actually in, uh, we have one in central Maine, and then the others are in the southern part of the state. So I, I heard a few people say that part of this bill was to um, put revenue in royal, uh, rural parts of the state, um, potentially limiting that to seven. Um, we have five already, like I said. Um, that doesn't leave room uh, potentially for another OTB, if there ever was one that wanted to come online, it's a huge financial commitment, obviously. Um, but we've got areas like if someone ever wanted to open one in Sugarloaf, um, maybe up in Calais, uh, potentially on the coast in Rockland or Camden, in those areas that certain times of the year see heavy traffic. Um, so that was uh, something. And then also, um, in section two of that, it talks about OTBs um, being licensed through um, through 275D, which is in the harness racing section. Those OTBs, again, not limiting it to seven, the OTBs are somewhat protected because they cannot be within 35 miles of each other. Um, so again, being able to maybe possibly open those licenses up later on um, if anyone ever did down the road uh, want to open up another OTB in the in the uh, northern part of the state, uh, then that would be beneficial to harness racing. Um, that is all. That is all of our concerns at this point. Thank you um, so much, and thanks for your careful, detailed comments today. I just did want to mention that I believe the legislation. Uh, creates seven licenses for OTBs, and I think there are six currently. So just wanted yeah. to point that out. Thank you once again for your testimony. Committee members, are there questions for Debbie Patterson? 
I'm not seeing any. We appreciate you being here today. Okay. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Michael Cushing. And I did want to let James Day, Jane Thornton, Denise Terry, and Peter Connell know that they're going to be moved over to the panel um, at this time as well. And Michael Cushing, if you could activate your video and um, we'll welcome you to the committee. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and the, the members of the Judiciary Committee. I appreciate you taking the time to hear the public testimony today. Uh, and I also would like to personally thank you folks for extending your break, not having your break to get this in uh, while we're all still online. Uh, I am uh, Michael Cushing of Farmington, Maine. I have been in the harness racing industry my entire life. I'm going to be 53 next week. Uh, and I'm also the president of the Maine Harness Horsemen's Association, who represents uh, over 500 members in an industry that, that employs uh, an estimated 5,000 uh, that are affected by it here in Maine. Uh, I'm speaking neither for nor against. Uh, I think it's enlightening that this legislature is certainly seeking uh, to look out for, uh, to make things right with our, our Maine tribes. And, and I certainly support that. And I would like to see that this uh, possibly uh, in the work session, the amendment to, to be changed a bit that affects harness racing ought to be worked on. A couple of the concerns that we have are, uh, they've been mentioned, so I'll make them brief, but that the OTBs are uh, forced, uh, not forced, but are limited to only on-site gaming. I know in New Jersey, because I raced there some and I've spoken with those that, are, that have operated it, it's about 90% of the, of the revenue from uh, sports wagering comes online. So it really won't, I don't think, bolster the OTB businesses, hence hurting the industry that I represent and that I participate in. Um, that's a concern. And it also, uh, this language doesn't make uh, exceptions for the commercial tracks. We currently have a commercial track in Southern Maine that is uh, operating at Cumberland and, and looking to build new and if that sports waging component was not to be part of that, uh, it's putting an awful hindrance on that business. We appreciate much of the language. We realize that there is money, additional purse money that would come for us that we would compete for, which selfishly helps us. But I, uh, we are concerned that it disincentivizes people to go to the track and create new fans, and it especially disincentivizes one to operate a track in which we have to have one to compete at. I'd love to see those things get worked out. Again, I'm not speaking neither for nor against, just wanted to voice some of the concerns that we have. Uh, and yes, I don't want to go into it too much, but a language and a bill that is on a table addresses some of that. I know that's going to be part of your work session, but I hope you have uh, luck moving forward. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you folks this afternoon. Thank you very much for your testimony. Committee members, are there any questions? For Representative Babbage, go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Hopefully quick, but I, I would like uh, Mr. Cushing, if he could, to help me uh, understand whereas harness racing um, uh, is relevant uh, to 585. I, I, I wondered if you could tell me in the last two decades, the health of the industry. Uh, I, I, where are we? I'm trying to, at one time I knew uh, that you were in trouble, but I, but I don't know when that was and, and, and how we're doing in this last decade. Um, I would love to tell you that that's not still the case, but I'm not going to uh, tell you that that isn't the, that isn't the case. Uh, I think we certainly, you're right, in that 20 years ago, up until maybe five or six, it was a constant decline. It seems to have stabilized somewhat but in over the last two years we've actually seen a bit of an incline in harness racing's uh interest uh, and handle which is the money wagered on the event uh, nationwide some of that up, upswing may be from the pandemic and people had access over their phones at home they felt safe i suppose but uh in the state of maine which is i think our concern is we are in a, in a precipice right now where after a decline, we're now in a situation where we're looking at, uh, we've picked up 
a new entity to operate in southern Maine, which is crucial to our existence. And the construction uh, back to a healthy place, uh, as you referenced, say, 20 years ago. So we're still fragile and, and a little, uh, what might seem like uh, a little ding in the fender could be quite harmful. So it's a concern. It certainly is. But again, I'm, I'm not speaking for or against really getting it right. Would be would certainly be my preference that that considers all partners of the industry, commercial tracks, tribes, OTBs, harness racing fairs, and agriculture. That's where I come from. Those are my concerns. I appreciate the question. I hope I've helped you some. I don't. I hope. You have. So. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Representative Libby. Go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for being here today, Mr. Cushing. Uh, I wonder if you could just answer a quick question. How often have you testified on harness racing in judiciary versus VLA? I like that this is a, this is a first for me. Uh, VLA and agriculture, dozens and dozens of times. Uh, this is a this is a first for me. So it, it does seem like coming. an odd place for us to show up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming before us to speak today. You're very welcome. Uh, committee members, any other questions for Michael Cushing? Representative Babbage, is your hand up um, from before? Thank you. I apologize. Thank you. All right. Next, we will hear from, well, first of all, Michael Cushing, thank you for being here today. And next, we'll hear from James Day. Good morning, Senator Car Carney and Representative Harnett and honorable, <clears throat> excuse me, members of the J Judiciary Committee and Tribal Chiefs. My name is James Day. I'm president of the Winner's Circle OTB in Lewiston. I am speaking neither for nor against LD 585. I would be speaking for LD 585 if Part J, the sports wagering portion of the bill, reflected the hard work of this session's VLA committee who spent all se session vetting this issue. I keep hearing that the OTBs are being treated the same and that is just not true. This is a very complicated issue that Veterans and Legal Affairs has spent much time on. LD 585 and the proposed amendment have much that is in your area of expertise, but sports wagering is an issue unto itself it is a well-received issue nationally, and except for a deal with the Florida tribes that was thrown out by a federal judge, no state has tribes exclusively receiving online gaming rights. We are in a world that emphasizes inclusion, not exclusion, to benefit special interests. VLA included everyone equally, including the tribes. I believe that had the tribal nations understood the symbiotic relationship of online and retail, they would not have suggested separation. The model put forward in this amendment is not sustainable for the retail outlets without the addition of online gaming shared with them. I have supplied a detail of how the income is distributed under this proposal and submitted it for your review and would be happy to answer questions regarding the, the model uh, during your workshops um, at uh, workshop. VLA finally understood the importance of a tethered relationship for each retail outlet and an online vendor, including those run by the tribes. There is so much in that relationship that assists the retail business that is lost when this tethered relationship is lost. In addition, the main consumer is the big loser in this restriction of online gaming and the lack of relationship with retail facilities. And <clears throat> also illegal activity may not be deterred. Please amend the sports gaming portion of this amendment to include retail and online relationships for both tribes and the brick and mortar gaming facilities in this state. This will create a successful venture for all. I am happy to answer any of your questions and thank you for this opportunity today to speak in front of you. Uh, many thanks, James Day. C committee members, I see that there are a couple of questions. Representative Babbage, did you have a question? Can't hear. Oh, oh, Can I please? There we go, thank you. Um, 
Mr. Day, I apologize for that delay. Uh, could you could you just shed some light uh, regarding the ownership of OTBs in Maine? There are six of them, I guess. Is there? There's, are they franchises? Are they investment uh, group owned? Who? How? How does that work in Maine? In Maine, they're all privately owned um, by Maine residents. There are five of them, I believe. I believe that. Uh, um, it was reported earlier that Bangor has an OTB, and I don't think that is how they are referred to in the law. They are a commercial meet that is allowed to do full card simulcasting and would be excluded, unfortunately, by this uh, proposal. Um, the locations of the OTBs are Sanford, Brunswick, Lewiston, Scarborough, and Waterville at this time. There have been others in the state. There's a very difficult business with very with no chance to increase uh, pricing as your expenses go up and we have been struggling and it was very important to have uh, sports wagering be added to our um, opportunity to to bring in new customers however the online partner is critical component to that thank you for that and if i may madam chair i just wanted to ask are those owners uh primarily in state or out of state Oh, I think uh, all but uh, one is a Maine resident. The other one, uh, the one that isn't is a Connecticut resident, but spends more than half his time in Maine. Um, Thank you very much for your information. Bye-bye. Thank you. Representative Moriarty? We're not able to hear you, Representative. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Day, I couldn't keep up with your... Uh, uh, with your listing of the names of locations. I have Sanford, Brunswick, Lewiston, Waterville, and I think I'm missing one. Scarborough. Scarborough. Thanks. Thanks very much. Committee members, any additional questions for James Day? Representative Newell, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. James Day. If you could just quickly stand by um, while I pose my question uh, to the chair and or chairs. Madam Chair, could you speak um, to the reason as to why this um, particular part of this bill is being heard before the Judiciary Committee rather than VLA? Yeah, I, I think it's perhaps a good topic for the work session because it just is you know part of how the legislature works we've got um it's not unusual to have a bill or an amendment to a bill that crosses jurisdiction between one or uh two or more committees and sometimes you just have to make a choice as to where um the bill is going to be assigned that's something that the presiding, the um, clerk of the house and the secretary of the Senate can um, refer bills to committees. We also can, when we meet as the house and Senate refer bills, there are, are also processes for re-referring bills to another committee. If that committee is deemed to be um, more appropriate for the bill after some digging into the bill, in this case matters related to the, um, the Wabanaki Nation tribes is assigned to the jurisdiction of the Judiciary Committee. We also have had legislation that we were able to propose an amendment to. And so I know that um, it's unusual for us to have a bill that has um, crosses three different committees. We frequently have one actually that crosses either with IDEA or with the Criminal Justice and Public Safety Committee. This one is just a little different, um, but again, it is uh, within the jurisdiction of our committee. And I know that um, we're all hardworking, attentive, thoughtful committee members, not that other committees aren't, but I think that we have the capacity to, to understand and work through this bill very effectively. And we've been doing that all morning and just uh, wanna appreciate everybody's continued work on this legislation. 
Does that answer your question, Representative? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Day, thank you for your patience and uh, my question to the chair in uh, clarifying a, a point of your testimony as to why this is being heard before this committee. Any other questions for Mr. Day? Well, I am not seeing any. Thank you once again for being here and for the helpful information you've provided. Thank you. And next we will hear from uh, Jane Thornton. Welcome. And we, yeah, I think we're not able to hear you quite yet. There we go. Got it. Good morning, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett uh, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Jane Thornton and I am speaking on, a, on behalf of Gary Sagris from the Winners OTB in Brunswick who is ill in the hospital and cannot be with us today. Um, I'm not sure why we're at this point with the sports wagering bill. The, the VLA last year worked incredibly hard on this. And what I don't under, I guess what I don't understand is the bill that's on the table already, and I know we're not gonna discuss that, includes the, includes the tribal nation. It includes the commercial tracks, includes the casino, and it keeps us all on a, um, an equal path. Um, the, we're, we're, we're all treated equally, and isn't that what we all strive for? I mean, the bill did inclu does include the tribal nations and allows them to have an OTB, allows them to have online plus a facility, an online facility, um, just for the OTBs to have a retail um, place is not gonna be viable. We have to have a portion um, to be able to work with the larger companies with online. Um, in front of uh, LD 585 in front of you, has an amendment on it changing all the vetting that the VLA committee has been working on with much testimony, days of workshops, and finally taking the best sections of a lot of bills and creating a well thought out piece of legislation for this. LD 585's amendment gives all online sports wagering to the, to the tribal nation, leaving the commercial tracks, casinos with nothing, and with the guise of giving the off-track betting facilities retail, which alone is not a profitable or sustainable avenue. Um, the reason all of these groups are included is because of their involvement and knowledge in the gaming industry. Non-inclusion will in jeopardize the creation of a track and the continued operations of the OTBs and may cause horse racing in Maine to dissolve in all of its associated pieces. Farmlands, veterinarians, racing at main agricultural fairs, equipment retailers, feed suppliers will all be in jeopardy. While I know we all want to assist the tribal nations, we are including them in a well thought out prior bill. We create jobs for them in that other bill. Bottom line is, I think you really have to think, um, do you want I, do, I think it is why I think you bottom line is I think you have to look at what VLA has done in vetting. They become very educated about sports wagering. They've um, they know what is best for the future of harness racing, sports wagering and the economic benefits of the state of Maine while including the tribal tribal, the tribal nation. And I thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time. Um, testimony, Jane Thornton. Committee members, any questions? Go ahead, Representative Thorne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, welcome, Ms. Thornton. Thank you. Is it your assertion that you feel that perhaps this would stand a better chance of passing in judiciary than it would uh, ILA? No, I think it's, I think, what, are you saying the 585? Yes. Um, I'm just saying that we've been through this whole sports wagering thing. Um, we've 
try to figure out the best path for all the people in this gaming industry so that we, we would all benefit from it. I think the tribal nation will definitely benefit from this, but they can't. But if you give them all online, that leaves nothing for the rest of them. Your commercial tracks are not considered OTBs. They're considered commercial tracks with full simulcasting. So you've totally excluded them. So is that commercial track that wants to be built going to build it without being able to have sports wagering? Don't know. Um, that's going to be their choice. Um, the casinos have been, you know, you can do what you want with the casinos and, and that choice, but you're, you've got to understand that the seven OTBs you're talking about, five of them are taken and the commercial tracks are not considered OTB. So now you've got two left for the tribal nations. Um, I think I'm not going to say which committee it should belong in. All I'm saying is we spent all of last year educating the VLA committee and we took four or five bills and they pushed it down into one so that everybody in the gaming industry, the horsemen, everyone, Ming Agricultural Fairs all got a portion of this. It wasn't just for that for one community. The OTBs will not survive without online wagering. And it's not, we have to have both, a portion of both. Thank you for that answer. I'm learning as I go. Yeah, Thank it's, 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 a, it's a tough, it's very tough. And I hope you read my um, testimony online. It's, I didn't read the whole thing. Thank you, we will. Uh, committee you. members, other questions for Jane Thornton? Representative Babbage? A uh, quick one. Uh, you're not actually the person to ask, but I'm sure that you'll know. Uh, how many commercial uh, tracks are there? Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. You said she's not the person to ask. Is there someone well, else? She, I, she is knowledgeable. And I wondered, she mentioned commercial tracks. I wondered how many there are, Cumberland, Bangor, and what else? That's it. That's it. Thank yes, you. Cumberland, Cumberland is, 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 is transitioning. That, that I think that believe that's temporary and that the owner, the one that's the people that are running the Cumberland are in hopes of opening a brand new track, building a brand new track for the horsemen and for the industry somewhere um, that I don't know where, but I, um, that's where it's gonna be two total always. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any other questions at this point, Jane Thornton, thank you very much for- Thank you very much. information today. Thank you. And next we will hear from Denise Terry. Chairwoman Carney, Chairman Hartnett and distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Denise Terry and on behalf of my family and all the employees at Scarborough Downs OTB, I appreciate the opportunity to explain our concerns about the sports wagering provisions of the proposed amendment to LD 585 that apparently would replace LD 1352. Um, LD 1352 passed both houses overwhelmingly, although it would generate substantial net revenues for the state it is somehow stuck on the appropriations table where I'm told it may die. My family has faced great difficulty trying to preserve our family business and the great sport of main harness racing. When my mother took over Scarborough Downs following my stepfather's death in 2001, the track had decades of continuous losses. My mom, the best person I've ever known, saw two possibilities, turn the track around and go broke. The first woman owner of a main race track worked night and day and made the track marginally profitable. In 2003, Mainers voted to allow slot machines at both commercial tracks, but the fine print written by the then owner of the Bangor Raceway was designed to prevent the Downs from getting slot machines. The fine print worked and the Downs never got slot machines, but neither did Bangor Raceway. The law was amended to allow a detached casino. Rather than bring fans to either track, casinos in Bangor and Oxford County siphon the sports fans. Reduced revenues from lost fans far exceeded the down share from the so-called cascade that distributes a small portion of Bangor slot revenues. Every OTB also lost far more than it gained. Every business associated with harness racing is in serious trouble. As the Downs business declined, my mother sold assets, including the tracks timber, parcels of lands, and eventually the entire 500 acres using proceeds to rent back the track preserve the operation and keep Maine harness racing alive. Uh, eventually we reached an agreement with the industry to step aside and operate only as an OTB, hoping that sports wagering, sports wagering would 
make that possible and that the Chinchat family would be able to build the state-of-the-art harness racing and entertainment complex the industry needs. But the OTBs need real sports wagering to make it. Maine OTBs face much higher tax rates than casinos. We have America's highest OTB tax rate. The sports wagering we'd be allowed to operate under the amendment before you would prohibit us from accepting online wagering. I'm told many fans at sports wagering facilities place bets on their phones. So we could end up providing the service, but generally, but getting none, nearly none of the revenue. LD 1352 is not the sports wagering bill the industry proposed, but it's based in significant part on our proposal. It, like our proposal, was designed to be fair to all concerned the tribes, the casinos, the commercial tracks, the horsemen, the fairs, the OTBs, the internet providers, and the most importantly, the people of Maine. It will give my business a reasonable chance to survive. LD 1352 is a thoughtful product of years Excuse of work. Me. I'm sorry, I know that's the last yeah. time I'll say it. I, I'm sorry. Um, compromise and effort by all the interested groups and by the Committee on Veteran and Legal Affairs. Um, Thank you for your consideration, and I'll please be pleased to answer any of your questions. I'm, I I'm apologize. Glad. <laughs> I apologize. No, I, I appreciate that, and and I know that everybody is working hard and doing their best, and I, that's obvious in your testimony. We appreciate hearing from you. Um, committee members, are there questions for Denise Terry? Not seeing any questions for you. Thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, and finally, we'll hear from Peter Connell. And uh, you may begin when you're ready. Peter Connell, are you able to provide testimony today? Excuse me. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Connell and I represent the OTBs of Maine and um, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and distinguished members of the Ju Judiciary Committee. I am speaking today for Donald Barbarino, who operates the uh, Waterville and Sanford OTBs. Uh, unfortunately, Don is having a medical procedure and was not able to, uh, able to uh, deliver this himself. Um, his testimony is that he is, he's testifying neither for nor against uh, LD 585, However, he would not support the bill, uh, the sports uh, wagering without the sports wagering language from 1352 uh, regarding the license categories and the treatment. Uh, after reviewing a number of sports wagering bills and numerous work sessions, the VLA committee produced a sports wagering bill that was in the best interest of the main consumer, while also supporting businesses of the gaming license holders. Um, Mr. Connell, the bill also considered Mr. Connell, the interests Mr. of the Connell, federally recognized tribes. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Retail Connell. Retail sports wagering will certainly add. Excuse me, Mr. Connell. Mr. Connell. Connell. I have asked him to unmute himself, but he is not, not able to see that message. So we'll just have to wait. Point of Adam order, Madam Chair. Yes. I just, did Peter Cannell, mute himself or did no he I was trying to speak to him and he couldn't I was uh, trying to speak to him and he would not stop speaking and so I muted him so that he could hear me and now I can't unmute him to get his attention 
So oh, I don't think it's a point that. of order. I don't know how I, I it's a technological uh, I don't know issue, where I left off, which I will address. Uh, we, have, him. Uh, we have submitted written testimony. Ms. Mr. Connell, I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? No. Okay, I think that, um, Mr. Are you able? Are you able to hear me, Mr. Connell? No. Okay. So uh, apparently, Mr. Connell cannot hear us. I do know that he said he yeah. submitted written testimony. I can hear you. Okay. Let yes. me. Okay. Give me just one moment, please. Um, partway through your testimony. It appeared that you were speaking exclusively and extensively about 1352, and that is not a bill that is before this committee. We're just hearing about the uh, proposed amendment to 585. You were muted during part of your testimony because I was trying to, to get your attention. So we'd like to give you two minutes to testify, but if you could please focus on 585 rather than 1352, um, we would very much appreciate hearing your perspective on 585. And again, um, please don't advocate for 1352 because that's not before the committee today. Thank you. And you can go ahead whenever you start, we'll, we'll give you another two minutes. Chair, may I confirm that he has submitted written testimony? I don't have it on mine, but I haven't refreshed. Go ahead. Yes, Representative Parnett. There is no testimony under the name Peter Cannell, but he referenced another individual that he was testifying for, but I don't know what name that was. That was uh, Donald Barbarino. And I am not seeing that either. Okay, well, we can remedy that after the fact. I think at this oh, no, point- there, I'm sorry, there is, there is testimony from Don Barbarino in the file. Okay. Let's, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you both. Let's, let's try to help Mr. Connell um, speak to us. Don Barbarino. Don we, and we can hear you. Can you um, begin your two minutes of testimony, please? Uh, Thank you. We'll, 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 I'm sorry, there is, there is testimony. Yeah, and he's the, he's the operator of the water bill and uh, Sanford OTBs. Thank you. And did you want to provide um, your remaining two minutes of testimony just focusing on 585? Well, I'd like, like, um, uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll uh, I'll go off book here a little bit and just say that. Can you can you cut that? Um, so I'm going to go off book here a little bit and just you, you'll have his have his written written testimony. And he's it's it's basically an agreement with um, with Mr. Day, uh, Mrs. Thornton, and uh, Ms. Terry, uh, which are the owners of the of the other OTBs that I I uh, represent at the legislature. And um, we're in we're in 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 favor of the non gaming portion of the um, of the uh, LD. 585, and uh, we would like to see the uh, the gaming portion change to be all inclusive of the license license categories um, that have been mentioned a couple of times. And we'll happily provide um, any information uh, for the work session, uh, including Mr. Day's. Um, uh, offer a sent, a sent a chart to show show the revenues, uh, and if if um, if you need some explanation of that, 
uh, during the work session, we'd be more than happy to uh, to provide that uh, that detail and and answer those questions. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank and sorry you. Sorry about the technical. They don't. Uh, uh, I had an assistant one time that used to call me Fred Flintstone because I I uh, couldn't seem find my way around a computer very well, and uh, I don't know what happened, but my apologies. Um, well, we appreciate your persistence. Thank you very much. Okay. Committee members, are, are there any questions for Peter Cadell? I am not seeing any. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and at this point, we are, I'm just gonna check and see if there's anybody else um, in the attendee space who wishes to be heard on LD 585 as amended. If so, please raise your electronic hand and keep it up so that we can recognize you. And I am not seeing any additional um, persons wishing to speak on LD 585. And so with that, we will close the public hearing on LD 585. It is two o'clock. And so I would ask committee members if we could return at 2.30 and resume our public hearings for today. There are a couple of hands up of Representative Libby. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to speak on the record and I'm fine with doing that immediately when we return at 2.30, if that would be appropriate. Uh, I will be very brief, but I will then have to leave to get my kids for the day from co-op at 2.45. So I would appreciate the opportunity either now or when we return from break. Okay, if you are in a, a time crunch, you can speak now, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I do appreciate your explanation regarding why judiciary is the appropriate committee for the bill that we just heard. Uh, but I do need to be on record that I think that it is a disservice to all main people by handling something that in my purview seems so far out of our um, jurisdiction and judiciary, unless we are simply serving as a rubber stamp. And um, because it is an issue that is so far out of my wheelhouse, I would certainly appreciate um, a, a more than usual amount of time to prepare for the work session. It is a 34 page amendment with some very complex um, and varied topics in it for, from taxation to gaming. And I think um, we should give adequate time to make sure we, we have the ability to learn all that we need to, to um, handle it appropriately at the work session. The other piece that I wanted to address was the piece that came up earlier. And um, it seems to me that we have two choices moving forward as a committee. This is a delicate issue. These are delicate issues that we are handling here in judiciary on this set of bills. And we can either assume the worst of our peers and thereby diminish our ability to work together, or we can extend grace when it is needed, give feedback gently, and remember that none of us are perfect individuals. I understand that a colleague used a term that is considered derogatory, but I also know that it was not used with malicious intent. And as we deal with this complex collection of bills, I believe that we best serve the main people as a committee by seeking ways to work better together instead of looking for the worst in each other. And that is all I have to say. Um, I agree with you that we, do need to work well together. Um, I disagree with you that um, in your implication that some of us are looking to see the worst in others. Um, I thank you for your comments and um, Representative Evangelos, your hand is up as well, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just, I'm a little worried about our schedule today. Um, there's 43 attendees waiting, 44 now. Um, can we revisit the schedule after we hear 906 to see what time it is? And um, I'm getting concerned um, just about whether we're gonna be able to fairly conduct uh, these public hearings in the way the day's going, already been five hours, just a thought, but um, let's see how 906 goes and see what time it is. Okay, thank you for, for sharing those concerns. and. What we're going to do is we're going to take our break until 2.30, and then we are going to do language reviews very quickly before we start 9.06, and then we'll start 9.06, and we'll work as carefully and efficiently as we can. Thank you. 
All right, everyone, see you at 2.30.
Hi, Peggy. Now I'm the one clicking the wrong button. Yeah, everyone's clicking the wrong buttons. Um, and yeah. Senator Carney wants to start with the language reviews very quickly. Yep. So if we could zoom through those, she's going to do those. Then I'll do uh, 906 and uh, 1907, and then we'll reassess. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go in numerical order. Okay. Peggy, hey, what are the numbers of the language reviews? Oh, uh, 1581. 1895. In our okay. Hi, Peggy. Hello. How are you, Representative Angelos? I'm I hope good. you're feeling better. I'm doing good. Yeah, we don't get to see each other much, so I'm saying hi. I know. I know. I know. It's tough. Anyways, hi. Hi. <laughs> All right, did everybody at least have a chance to swallow a tiny bit of lunch? <laughs> I'm so Such sorry yeah. that that um, our days are so full, but I do really appreciate how hard everybody is working. Yeah, that was good. Good. Um, I think we've got six of us back. So we'll, we're going to start the language reviews, I think. Um, now we're up to seven. Yeah. Peggy, let's, let's move forward with the language reviews at this time, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, do you want me to share my screen? Yeah, that, I think okay. that's a super efficient way to, to do this. Thank you. Okay, great. So just holler if, if you have questions. This is LD 1581. Um, I did email this to you on Monday and the last page is the voting sheet. So he's very good at getting that to me so I can put it in the package. This is LD 1581, Senator Searway's bill, an act to require telecommunications companies to divulge location information to law enforcement when necessary to respond to a 911 call or locate a person in danger. The Minority report is ought to pass as amended. This is the minority report. The majority report is ought not to pass. We're changing the title of the um, of the bill to an act regarding access to location information, and we're amending the, this replaces the bill. It amends the current law with regard to warrantless access to location information. Um, and it strikes out the what's in current law that allows um, um, the possessor of that information, the location information, if it's not already um, responding to a 911 call, it's not already uh, consent given by the person or a family member. Um, and I'm blanking on the third one. Um, so if there's danger of death or serious physical injury, the possessor of the information actually um, has an obligation now to make sure that that's a legitimate request, that it's a legitimate situation. This would take out that and would include at the end, so this would apply to any time um, a government entity is seeking location information um, that the possessor of it shall provide the location information requested by a government entity under this section. Um, there is no fiscal note 
And here's the voting sheet if you wondered where you were on this. Um, so any questions? I, it looks like Representative Evangelos has a question. Uh, no. Oh, okay. No question, okay. Okay, so shall I go on to the next one? Yeah, for those who were, for those who were on the um, ought to pass as amended report, are you okay with that language? Well, let me reverse that. If, if you were on the ought to pass as amended and you disagree with the language, speak now, please. I think we're good to go on. No, Peggy. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move to 1871. Did my screen change? It changed for me. Did it change for you? Yes. Oh, okay, great. So this is LD 1871. This is um, the resolve about the, um, the pilot program that the Maine Human Rights Commission is doing to investigate and report on incidents of harassment due to housing status, lack of employment, and other issues. Oh, excuse me. Um, the majority report is ought to pass as amended. The minority report is ought not to pass. Um, what we were doing in the amendment was making it a legitimate four-year pilot program. It was originally two years passed in a previous legislature. Um, this is extending it by two years. So we just have to fix the dates. And because it will no longer be reporting to the 130th legislature, we can't call it the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. It's the Joint Standing Committee, the legislature having jurisdiction over judiciary matters. Um, so we're just fixing those dates like was uh, requested at the public hearing. There is no fiscal impact. So no fiscal note needed. And um, the majority is ought to pass as amended with these uh, nine people voting in favor of that. Okay, so I'm seeing a thumbs up from Representative Harnett. Um, if you were in the majority ought to pass as amended, uh, if you have any concerns about the language, speak now. All right, it's, I think we're great with that as well, Peggy. Thank you so much. Great. So the next one is LD 1895. This is Senator DeChambeau's bill, an act to prohibit invasion of privacy, uh, invasion of privacy on private property by cameras. The minority report is ought to pass as amended. The majority report is ought not to pass. We used the language pretty close to the language that CLAC recommended. So um, this is the invasion of privacy. It, it would include private residence and its enclosed yard um, as where the camera could not be um, um, focused in order to collect that information, whether it's sound or um, um, visual photographs or video. Um, because this is a minority ought to pass as amended report, even though it is a kind of creating a new type of version of crime, because it's a minority report, we do not have to take it back to the Criminal Justice Committee to review under um, Joint Rule 319. Um, so there's that language, and um, there is a fiscal note that says it may increase the workload. Um, and then there's no appropriation needed. And here's the uh, ought to pass as amended report is two people on that. Thank you, Peggy. And so, um... Representative Sheehan or Representative Reckett, if you have concerns about that language, can you uh, speak now? I am not hearing concerns. And I, I just to note, everybody has, has had these, um, the language to look at in advance. So. And actually Representative um, Reckett did email me that she was okay with everything. Great, thanks for, for highlighting that. So the last one is LD 1900. This is an act to amend the laws governing name changes. The majority is ought to pass as amended. The minority report is ought not to pass. The majority report is um, actually kind of cleaning up the statute to make it a little more clear, just um, using Representative Moriarty's language. 
upon receipt of a petition filed by an adult, the court may change the name of that adult and the court may not require public notice before approving the name change. Um, there's no fiscal impact. It's a divided report. Those who voted in favor, there are nine of you. And um, as I said, Representative Record had reviewed everything and signed off on amendments she was on. Thank you. Um, for those who voted um, in the majority report, the ought to pass is amended. If you have concerns, please voice them now. I think, I think the language is fine, Peggy. Thank you so very Thank much. Thank you very much. You were very efficient. <laughs> I think you made it very easy for us. <laughs> uh, the screen share worked really well. Uh, committee members, I think um, we are done with the language review. Supi, I know that you have something. If I could, I just, I'm gonna be really, really quick. And that's because Peggy said something about the voting sheet. And I just wanted to say, the reason I'm able to get a final voting sheet as quickly as possible is because of the cooperation of all of you who send me back the emails and also put up with the pages going up to you at uh, during session. So thank you very much for that. It's a team effort. Thank you. Thanks for all your hard work um, to get them to us. All right, everybody is, I think that's it for our preliminary work and um, this is the fun part of the meeting where I get to virtually hand the gavel over to Representative Harnett. I'm excited for when I can hand you a real one, but the virtual gavel is yours. Thank you very much, Senator Carney, and thank you to all in attendance. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. As we continue our public hearings this afternoon, I wanna start off by thanking everybody for their patience. I know a lot of you have been on this call since nine o'clock, or at least your names have been on this call. Our first hearing went long, uh, but we are going to move ahead with the three remaining bills that we have and uh, try to get through as much as we can. So at this point, I am going to open the public hearing on LD 906, um, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. This was introduced by our colleague, Representative Newell, as a concept draft, but you now have an amendment uh, to that bill. And with that, I would welcome our colleague, Representative Newell, to present LD906. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Greetings, Chair Harnett, Senator Carney, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. I am Tribal Representative Rena Newell from the Passamaquoddy Tribe, and I reside in Sabayak. As the Tribal Representative, I feel it is my duty within my role to foster positive tribal state relations and encourage the tribe's right to self-determination. Therefore, I am thankful for the opportunity to present in a good way for this committee's consideration LD906, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. This bill was first introduced as a concept draft pursuant to Joint Rule 208 during the first legisl legislative session of the 130th, proposed to provide drinking water to the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Pleasant Point and to nearby municipalities. Today, I would like to introduce amended language that will expand upon the original concept draft. However, before doing so, I would also like to include my own personal Wabanaki cultural perspective and connection to water which is relative to the subject of the matter before you. The word Passamaquoddy is derived from our language, Beskamukarik, meaning the people who spare Pollock. I have been blessed to have spent my entire life 
living in the most eastern point of this land. My home, when viewed from a canoe paddling in the Passamaquoddy Bay, sits along the water's edge, also known in our language as Sibayak. I was fortunate enough to position my home on a ledge that purposely faces directly to the east to be one of the first to receive the sunrise above the salt waters of Passamaquoddy Bay. As a Wabanaki, I take great pride in knowing that I, as a Passamaquoddy tribal citizen, originate from the people of the Dawn. I hold great appreciation to all marine life that live in these waters. I have paddled these waters numerous times from Indian Township to Sabayak by way of canoe or kayak. I have fished these waters. I have received sustenance from these waters. In difficult times, I have visited these waters. to sing, to offer a prayer, and in time of healing, I reach into these waters. I believe that if we take care of what provides for us, thus shall sustain us. As a Passamaquoddy tribal citizen, I am very much connected to the water. Samaguan, in my Passamaquoddy language, means water. Samaguan Pumausawagan, in my language, means water is life and is sacred to my way of living. Therefore, having access to clean, clear, odorless drinking water is vital to healthy living and is a basic human right that should not be denied to the Passamaquoddy tribal citizens of Sabayak. Just as the seasons change, so does the drinking water at Sabayak. The water that fills my cup of coffee is bottled, purchased, or filled at a local well because the taste and smell of my water does not serve me well to drink from it. I encourage myself to clean the basins with bleach because the color of the water contained can at times be tinged with varying colors. Showering now includes a filter attached to the shower head. Food preparation includes rinsing and cooking with bottled water. The old school clothesline used during summer months to hang white sheets to receive that fresh summer air smell have been witnessed to flow in the wind, tainted with the earth tones, shades of brown. These are my personal experiences in living with the drinking water received here in Sabaya. They are ever changing, just as the tides of Passamaquoddy Bay. However, do not promote a healthy way of living. For many years, I have been complacent in accepting the inconsistent quality of drinking water that my tribe, my community receives. Boil water notices have been commonly received over the years. However, 
when water quality testing notices that include language that have shown to have high levels of carcinogens known as trihalomethanes, which can cause cancer, organ failure, and birth defects after prolonged or concentrated exposure, I can no longer stand by and not lend my voice to elevate this public health concern and seek to work with others to find a mutual understanding of the importance to remedy this, for it is simply unacceptable. Since 2019, I have been involved and participated in internal tribal and multi-stakeholder meetings. While these discussions led by the Passamaquoddy tribe have been productive, we have not seen any changes improving the quality of drinking water delivered to my community. LD906 has three primary components. To amend the charter of the Passamaquoddy Water District. In 1929, legislation created the East Fort Water District. In 1983, legislation amended its charter, creating the Passamaquoddy Water District and became the only water district in Maine that pays property taxes. For 54 years, this public utility was tax exempt. This bill seeks to exempt the property of the Passamaquoddy Water District, a non-tribal entity from taxation by municipal governments. Thus, to provide critical financial support to the state regulated water district that serves Pleasant Point and the city of Eastport. It also calls to amend the Maine Implementing Act to add to the Passamaquoddy Indian Territory two parcels of tribally owned land where there is known to be available groundwater. This bill seeks to authorize two parcels of tribally owned fee land in close proximity to the existing Passamaquoddy Indian Territory through the federal trust acquisition process without local approval. In order to provide access to alternate supplies of groundwater, I will provide maps that identify these two specific parcels. This also calls to amend the main implementing act to allow the EPA and the tribe to regulate drinking water within the reservation in a matter similar, similarly to how water is regulated on tribal lands elsewhere in the United States. As it stands today, the state regulates all drinking water delivered to or located on tribal lands. This includes the current supply. Passage of this bill will also authorize the Passamaquoddy tribe to regulate drinking water standards to the, to the extent permitted under federal law. On behalf of the Passamaquoddy Tribal Citizens of Sabayak that I proudly represent, I stand before each of you to humbly ask of your consideration to provide the Passamaquoddy Tribal members of Sabayak access to clean drinking water. Did I ever think in my lifetime that I would be asking this question? My answer is no. However, today it is so. Following this introduction of this bill, you will hear additional testimony that will expand upon 
what I have just presented on this proposed legislation. I'll be happy to answer any questions that the members of this committee may have at this time. Should I be unable to answer, I would ask that an opportunity to present a response be provided for during the work session. Respectfully presented, Willie One. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Representative Newell, for introducing this important bill, LD906. I would ask if committee members have any questions for the bill sponsor, our colleague, Representative Newell. If so, please raise your electronic hand so that I can call upon you. And Senator Carney, is your hand up uh, for a question or is it getting ready to time later for a question? Uh, Senator Carney, go ahead. Thank you. Um, my, I have two questions actually. Thank you so much, Representative Newell, for your powerful presentation of this legislation. The first is a clarifying question. Did you say that the Passamaquoddy Water District is the only water district in the state of Maine that is subject to taxation? Yes, that is correct, Senator Carney. Um, I can submit uh, the legislative uh, record to that as well. Thank you. Um, and then the, may I proceed with my second question? Yes, you may. Thank you. If the you described two parcels of land that are already owned by the Passamaquoddy tribe that have groundwater, and so is the purpose of this legislation to, to add them to the lands that can be recognized as trust land so that you have a sustainable clean water source? Yes, thank you for the question, uh, Senator Carney. That is the understanding that these two parcels of land, one currently serves as a, a, an alternate supply uh, of well water. However, after two years, we do not have that short-term goal up and running due to additional um, testing that is required um, that will occur in the spring um, that will allow those testing uh, requirements to be fulfilled uh, following a prolonged flushing of sort, and where, whereas a, a permit will then be issued uh, from the state. Thank you. Could I just please ask one more follow-up question? Yes, you may, Senator Carney, go ahead. And so once that is accomplished, that and if this legislation were passed, then that would uh, secure a, a long range solution to provide clean water to the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point? Thank you for the question again, uh, Senator. Uh, what we are proposing is specifically for these two parcels that have been identified uh, as potential uh, groundwater sources um, so that we can move forward um, towards long-term solution. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carney, for the questions. Thank you for your answers, Representative Newell. Representative Poirier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a few questions and I can just ask one or two right now if that's okay and I can take them later um, also. Um, in reference to the lands acquired, um, is there a reason why you're not going to the municipalities for approval or have you done so and has there been objection? That would be my first question. If I heard your question correctly, Representative Poirier, Perhaps you need to restate your question. Okay. <laughs> Having it's some bit of a difficulty in, in hearing you, please. If, if you could get acquired. closer to your microphone, um, Representative sorry, Porter, we're having a sorry. hard time. My, my internet connection is a little sketchy here today as well. Um, as far as the lands acquired, 
um, putting them through this legislation without having to go to the municipalities. If there are a specific reason um, why the tribe wants to go forth that route um, or has the municipality objected to the lands being taken out of the municipality. Thank you, Representative. I believe I, I have somewhat of an understanding of your question. These uh, two parcels of land have already been acquired um, and uh, are owned uh, as fee land um, by the tribe. Um, what we are looking to do, as stated uh, in my testimony, is directly amend the May Implementing Act that would remove um, the local consent. Mr. Chair, can I ask the follow-up as the remainder of my question? Where what, why don't you uh, just do a follow-up and then I'll get through some other questions and go back to you if, if you still have additional questions. Okay. Um, what I was trying to ask with that question, is there a reason why you're skipping over the town approval on that? Thank you for the question, Representative. I wouldn't necessarily say that we are not giving the consideration to our local town, our neighboring town. I wanna say, um, to be completely direct and completely frank, I met with our local town selectmen um, two evenings ago, I believe it was, after our, our very long day of public testimony on Tuesday, uh, following uh, LD 1626, after eight and a half hours of, of receiving testimony, I made it a point to accept the invitation by the local town to join them at their town meeting to specifically go over the language of LD 906. And just as frank and direct as I was in, in responding to your question, as far as wanting to make changes, direct changes to the main implementing act, that is what I, that is the message that I conveyed to the Perry Town Selectmen. And I absolutely encourage them to participate in this process, either to submit testimony in support of what we are seeking to accomplish or against exercising their concerns, exercising their ability to voice their concerns or to submit testimony either neither for or against. The reason why I chose to present that in a way to the Perry Town Selectmen was because I wanted this committee to have the opportunity to not only hear from people that are directly affected by this, public health crisis, in my opinion. I wanted the committee to also hear from anyone that opposed this and felt that they would be directly affected by the changes proposed in this legislation. And I would also welcome testimony that would be neither for or against in order to better inform this committee as they move forward in their deliberations in regards to this proposed legislation. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative Poirier. Thank you, Representative Newell. Representative Thorne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Representative Newell. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, are you familiar with Toma Water LLC? Uh, yes, I believe I'm somewhat familiar, sir. Okay, it, and do you know what the source of that is, and is it is it owned by a, a individual entity or is that a, a tribal ownership? My understanding that that is um, the resource is owned by the Passamaquoddy tribe. And do you know where that that water initiate or comes from? Our sister reservation is located approximately 
60, 80 miles from us, 60 miles from us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank Representative. you, Representative Dorn. Thank you both. Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Newell, just a, a couple of uh, rapid fire questions here. Are the two parcels uh, contiguous? They are not. And okay, but how far apart from each other are they, would you say? Less than a mile. Uh, thank you for the question, Representative Moriarty. The first parcel of land is actually located um, about, uh, I would say, one mile, half a mile half a mile from my house. Uh, the second parcel that I am speaking about is potentially located just more than two miles from my house. Um, I, I, please excuse, uh, you would have a, a better aerial of viewing had I submitted the photos that I had intended to share uh, in my testimony. Mr. Chair, if I could just ask one or two more related questions. Yes, you may. What is the combined acreage of the two parcels? Oh, Representative Moriarty. If you, um, if you, if, if you don't know, that's okay. I did not print these. Um, I can certainly make them available at, for the work session. Okay. Finally, the summary portion of the bill indicates that the intent of the amendment is to improve uh, the quality of water, not only for the tribe, but it says surrounding communities. So are there other towns which would draw water from your two parcels? I think I would answer your question in two parts, Representative Moriarty. Currently the district serves the residents of Sabayak and the residents of uh, Eastport, okay. um, a, a city that's located uh, approximately eight miles, I believe, from my house here. Mm -hmm. um, I can't, at this point, a representative, um, speak to the long-term goals um, um, pending you know, passage of this legislation. However, um, we may have some testimony um, uh, coming forward that may be able to um, offer a response. Okay, thank you, Representative Newell. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Moriarty. Representative Poirier, did you have an additional question you wanted me to get back to you on? Yes, thank you very much. And I'm not sure, Representative Newell, if you're able to answer this or if it would be something for our analyst, but I'm hoping that one of you would be able to um, give us better direction on this. Um, in regard to um, the taxation, um, in my research on the bill, I did find that in 1998, the Maine Supreme Court had ruled against the tribe um, and they cited in, and this was in an appeal um, to a couple of court cases. Um, and they had cited that the purchase of the water district was from a private water utility that had in fact been taxed all along. Um, so where it was decided in the main Supreme Court, can we as a legislature actually put this into law and override that Supreme Court ruling? I'm not sure if either one of you can answer that for me, please. That kind of puzzled me a little bit. <laughs> I, I think that sounds like an appropriate question for our analysts to bring back to the work session, unless Representative Newell wants to go ahead with an answer. I leave uh, that thank you, all. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the question, Representative um, Poirier. I would certainly, uh, I would certainly welcome uh, that question to be posed to our analysts uh, so that we can provide a better response to you during the work session. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Poirier and Representative Newell. Are there additional questions from committee members? Seeing none again, Representative Newell, thank you very much for your powerful testimony in bringing LD906 before us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank um, you, Mr. Chair. 
Before moving on, I notice we have been joined by our colleague, Representative Hagan. I would like to give him the opportunity to introduce himself. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I am David Hagan. I represent House District 101, Hamden and Newburgh. Thank you. Thank you, and nice to see you again, David. Um, I would now ask if there are any other legislators who wish to testify, um, present testimony on this bill to please uh, raise your hand in the attendee room. And, and I'm gonna ask anybody who has their hand up in the attendee room to uh, put it down for now, um, because I'm gonna explain how we're going to move forward. Um, and I th thought I saw Representative Collings with the hand up. Um, Supi, if you could move Representative Collings over. Representative Collings, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. It's nice to see you again. Uh, please begin with your testimony when you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative uh, Arnett, uh, Senator Carney, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. I'm Benjamin Collings. I represent part of the city of Portland. Um, very quickly, I strongly support this bill. I believe it to be a very important emergency piece of legislation any community um, in, you know, in Maine, um, this is specifically, of course, in a tribal nation, but, you know, it's neighboring a Maine community. Um, and any, any citizen in the state of Maine should have access to clean drinking water. And so for that reason, I hope that we move uh, appropriately and help address this crisis. And I know there are a lot of people left to speak and there's still bills to get to. So I'll end it there um, and just want to um, strongly once again encourage people to help this community with this uh, emergency situation of not having access to safe and clean drinking water. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Collings. Are there any questions for our colleague, Representative Collings, from committee members? Seeing none, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, next, I will call upon Representative Talbot, Rachel Talbot Ross. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, please begin your testimony when you're comfortable. Thank you so very much. Senator Carney, Representative Parnett, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary, my name is Rachel Talbot Ross. I represent House District 40, which is part of Portland. Thank you for the opportunity to support LD906 an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. For decades, the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point has suffered from a lack of access to clean drinking water. Maine's failure to recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Wabanaki nations, combined with the lack of funds to fix inadequate public infrastructure in low income rural areas has made it impossible to rectify this critical public health and safety issue. It is important as you debate this bill to recognize the efforts the tribe has already made with multiple stakeholders to address these water quality issues. They have developed a multifaceted health research project in collaboration with Maine Health and Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness to better understand the impact of water contamination. They continue to apply for and obtain grant funding to help support efforts to improve water quality and have engaged in ongoing internal and stakeholder talks since January, 2020. But LD 906 is necessary to address the roadblocks the tribes have faced and to provide long-term solutions. This bill would take critical steps to finally address this issue it provides the Passamaquoddy Water District with the same property tax exemption that all other water districts across the state receive. It also protects access to alternate supplies of groundwater from the tribally owned lands, allows the EPA and tribe to exercise jurisdiction over safe drinking water within Passamaquoddy territory and authorizes the tribe to access the same protections 
that every other federally recognized tribe in the country can already access. This is an issue of justice and human rights. All individuals deserve access to safe, clean drinking water. That right has been denied to the Passamaquoddy tribal members for far too long, and it's long past the time that we consider and address this issue. It's time for action. I thank you for your consideration. And I just thank um, Representative Newell uh, for the courage and the strength that she has shown throughout all of the deliberations today. Uh, it has been uh, a very long day for all, but I um, wanna just recognize uh, and honor all of the work um, that she's done and for the education that I believe that she's brought uh, to this committee and to the, all of the people of Maine. Thank you, Representative Newell. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Representative Talbot Ross. Are there any questions from committee members for Representative Talbot Ross? And I am not seeing any. I know you've, you've been jumping back and forth today. I don't know how long you're going to be able to stay, but if uh, please know that we appreciate your being here and the time you've spent with us today. Kind thanks to you all. And I'm going to ask one more time if there are any additional legislators in the attendee room who would like to speak on LD906. And seeing none, I want to explain to the, our audience how we are going to proceed. We have a lot of people signed up to testify on this bill. Most persons are testifying in favor. I have not seen anyone registered to testify in opposition. I am going to begin by going to persons testifying in support, but please hold off on your hands. I wanna start with any tribal chiefs, vice chiefs, other tribal elected officials, employees of the tribes, and a tribal, a, a tribal attorneys. If you fall into those categories, if you could please raise your electronic hand, I would appreciate that. If you do not fall into that category, if those categories, if you could please lower your hand, it will be easier for me to manage this meeting. So at this point, I am going to ask uh, Supi to move over Vice Chief Ernie Neptune, Vice Chief Daryl Newell, Michael Corey Hinton, Molly and Dana, and Sherry Mitchell. And I will begin with Vice Chief Ernie Neptune, who looks remarkably like Vice Chief, like Chief Maggie Dana. Uh, and welcome Chief Dana to the committee. Um, uh, thank you for being here to testify. Oh, LD. Sorry, we share a same uh, account and he was on earlier. It's okay. I knew it wasn't so Ernie could, and uh, I, I, I knew it was Chief Dana. So I'm going to change it here. Okay. Uh, as soon as, welcome to the Judici Judiciary Committee. As soon as you're comfortable, please begin your testimony. Sorry about that. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yeah, I was absent earlier. There's uh, a couple of deaths in our community and I appreciate you being um, supportive of that. Um, so thank you for your time and I'll just get started. So, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and members of the Judiciary Committee, Maggie Dana and Deliwiz, Beskadamuka, Zagamas, Ujao, Zibayig, my name is Elizabeth Dana, or also known as Maggie Dana. I'm the chief of the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zubayi. And I'd like to start with a quote from a letter de delivered to the tribe by the state water district that serves Zubayi and the city of Eastport. Some people who drink water containing trihalomethanes in excess of maximum contaminant levels over, the, over many years experience problems with their liver, kidneys, and central nervous systems, and may have an increased risk of getting cancer, end quote. 
for many years, the tribe has received information like this in public notices from our local water district, which is a state utility. The notice always comes weeks after the water is tested. For a while, they came every few months. They usually come after the water turns brown. Seeing these notices are scary. They suggest that our municipal water could be slowly killing us. We don't know for sure, but seeing brown water come from our faucets and then get in these notices really makes you wonder. That is why I am here today to testify in support of LD906. In its simplest terms, this bill is about clean drinking water for the residents of the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Zibayig and for the residents of Eastport. But LD906 is also about the need to protect human life. It is a vision for the future where people in our state will know what it looks like to see clean water flow from their kitchen faucets. A future where telling our children not to drink out of their school water fountains is a distant memory. This legislation is also about achieving a right to self-governance and the benefits that this would provide to our state as a whole. I cannot think of a topic that illustrates this fact more plainly. We have been dealing with drinking water issues at Pleasant Point for generations. Pleasant Point is where I was born and raised and is where I currently live with my family. Never in this entire period have I felt like the water delivered by the local water district is safe to drink. For the past 40 years, the tribe has paid well over $100,000 per year for municipal water to be delivered by the Passamaquoddy Water District or PWD to Pleasant Point residents. The water is almost always discolored certain times of the year. It can be brown, yellow, or a sort of greenish blue. At certain times, it smells foul and it tastes bad. The water quality can swing wildly in a matter of hours from clear to brown because the municipal supply comes from a very shallow reservoir. Heavy wind and rain stir up organic matter in the supply that the district then tries to clean out of the water using chlorine. After weather events, the district is typically unable to fully clean the water. So instead of clear water, we get something else, something foul that ruins loads of laundry and that makes you wonder if it's safe to drink, bathe in, or use for anything at all other than toilet water. When this happens, the tribe receives reports of parents unable to give their children's baths without fear of kids unable to swim in pools and of adults and children whose skin burns after, the wa after washing with PWD water. Aside from the bad appearance of the water, chloroform, a type of THM, is a constant presence in the PWD system. Just this past fall, we detected levels of twice the legal limit for THMs in our water on the reservation. We only tested the water after receiving reports of the water causing skin irritation following a bad storm. The district told us that the water was fine, but we needed to see for ourselves. We tested 10 locations across the reservation all 10 failed federal and state drinking water levels for THMs. The levels were particularly high at our elder center where our elders live and gather to eat. According to information published by the EPA and PWD, the constant presence of these THMs in our water could be slowly killing us. So who is responsible for this water supply? The state of Maine. PWD is a quasi-municipal water district created under state law and regulated by the state government. It, is, it was established with the board of trustees that has elected representatives from the city of Eastport, the town of Perry, and Pleasant Point. It was created as the only state water district that pays property tax. I will repeat, the, the Passamaquoddy Water District is the only district that pays property tax in the state. Today, the district served just two communities, Eastport and Pleasant Point. The legis this legislation is about helping to ensure that the residents of these communities have better access to clean drinking water. 
Importantly, this is not a short-term fix or a band-aid. The legislation is about addressing the source of the problem. It is about protecting our people for the long-term. Make no mistake that we have been doing everything we can. For example, we have been meeting quarterly with local, state, and federal stakeholders for the past three years to examine different aspects of this problem. We have engaged research institutions to document the public health impacts. My tribe has invested and continues to invest significant resources in this effort, spanning many fields and industries. We have taken funds intended to, co to combat COVID-19 to finance upgrades at PWD, all, of, all in the name of helping a state utility provide clean drinking water. It is not just that we are investing time and money in bringing together stakeholders, applying for grants, supporting increased testing, financing a better infrastructure, identifying new water supplies and developing wells. Remember, we are also paying customers of the PWD. We are not getting what we pay for, what we are paying for year after year. It should not be my tribe's responsibility to fix problems associated with a state chartered public utility, but to the extent we have taken on this role, we need the tools and the power to do it right. The bill sets the groundwork for a real path forward in three key ways. First, LD906 would provide financial assistance to our local water district by exempting it from property tax. Like all other water districts in Maine, this will help it pay for much needed upgrades to our water system. Second, LD906 would allow the tribe to protect and use water from tribally owned lands where we have available supplies of water. Third, LD906 would allow the tribes to access federal law and to regulate drinking water on its lands like other tribes do across the United States. The Maine Settlement Act blocks us from protecting land where we have water. It gives municipalities the right to veto common sense solutions to serious public health problems. We made it to the point where it's obvious that the status quo is never go going to add up to a viable long-term solution. This is why I'm before you today. Water is sacred to my people. Water is a way of, is, is life. Access to clean drinking water is a human rights issue. By supporting this bill, you will not only be protecting our culture and our way of life, you will be improving access to clean water, safer water for our fellow Mainers as well. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Chief Dana, for your testimony today. And I send the condolences of the Judiciary Committee for your loss of, you. of tribal members. Yes. Are there questions from committee members for Chief Dana? Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chief Dana, I just want to make sure I understand the bigger picture, so to speak. Does the city of Eastport experience the same water quality problems or similar problems uh, as you do uh, uh, on, on tribal territory? Well, I'm not a resident of Eastport, so I probably could not answer those questions um, well enough. Um, we do have our attorney, Corey Hinton, on, and he could probably answer that. Um, but from what I remember is all the testing that they do um, seem to come out, I don't know what the word I want to use here, um, like fine. And I mean, not all the time. But um, that's why we started testing our own water because we seem to be getting, you know, more things here. Oops. So the, the THMs are present in your water, but may not be present elsewhere in the region? I'm no engineer. And I I just, what, do you, what do you that. know? What do you hear? I defer to my. Uh, attorney, Corey Hinton, he would know okay. better. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Representative Moriarty. And Mr. Hinton will be testifying uh, today as well, which might address your question. Uh, are there additional questions from committee members for Chief Dana? And I am not seeing any. So again, thank you very much uh, for taking the time out today to present your testimony on LD906. Committee appreciates your time. Thank you all. Uh, the next person to testify will be a Vice Chief Ernest Neptune. Vice Chief, as soon as you are comfortable, uh, please begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator uh, Carney, Representative Harnett, and the members of the Judici Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to address you today. My name is Ernest Neptune. I'm the Vice Chief of the Passport 40 Tribe at Sibayag, also known as Pleasant Point. I'm here today to testify regarding LD906. As you heard from, uh, from Chief Dana, we are dealing with a very serious situation at Pleasant Point. Certain times of the year, a water is simply undrinkable. Our water comes from a reservoir that is fed by a local lake. The lake is a, is a feeding source for livestock. It's used for boating and swimming and recreation. The water flows from the lake through a swampy stream that reaches the reservoir that service, services my com community. Along the way, water turns into the color of the organic material that it collects. The water becomes dark brown and brackish color. The job of the local water district is then to clean this water enough so it is passable under state and federal law. Sometimes they succeed, sometimes, particularly in the summer, they fail. When they fail, the water we receive is horribly discolored. It's offensive to taste and smell. Based on the tribe's water quality tests, we believe this brown water is most likely laden with THMs because the state utility cannot truly clean the water. They try and they tell us the water is safe, but the water is either brown and full of who knows what, or it's color and full of chlorine from cleaning. You can smell it and taste it and see it. It's not okay. Would you want to drink this water? Well, all people do not always have that choice. Some people don't have the money to buy bottled replacement water or a car to drive 15 to 20 minutes necessary to find an off-reservation location with clean water. Few have the money to dig a personal well or buy an in-house filter system. We try to deliver water and put it put new community wells in line in the reservation. Still, bottled water won't help when you're trying to clean dishes, wash clothes, and shower, and shower. In those instances, it's almost impossible to avoid exposure to the water. We see this problem and we have tried to be part of the solution for many years. The tribe has organized regular meetings among local stakeholders to find a solution. We brought hundreds of thousands of dollars to the local water district to help clean the current water better. We've directed resources from pandemic response efforts to help the local water district do a better job. In the midst of the pandemic, we needed to grapple with state and federal agencies over who had the authority to license the well. This wasn't just any well of thought. It was a well needed to deliver safe drinking water to children attending a brand new facility funded school on the reservation that was under the jurisdiction of the tribe. Because the school officials won't let the kids drink the state regulated municipal water, a new well was dug to provide clean water directly to the water fountains. We were told by the state that it had exclusive, exclusive authority to tell us when and how our children could receive clean drinking water. This is, this is all after 40 years of Maine allowing its utility to send brown water through the water fountains in our school. Because of the Settlement Act, however, there was no clear answers as to whether the state, the tribe, or the EPA should be regulating that well for the kids. 
As a result, we had to go to great lengths and were forced to co compromise our desire to self-govern just to get clean water for our school children. At the local level, we are the subject of discrim discriminatory ordinances that prevent us from using our own tribal, tribally owned land to make water available. At the federal level, we were told that Maine holds the strings to the future of our drinking water unless something changes. Unfortunately, we cannot trust that Maine has our best interests in heart. We cannot trust the local towns with financial and political leverage over state utilities will do the right thing to fix this problem. Instead, we, choose, we chose to trust ourselves. We chose to self-govern and to solve our own problems. We choose to work with the United States to protect drinking water on our lands. We choose to stand up and to protect our drinking water for future generations. We choose to make a stand for clean drinking water to say enough is enough. We want clean water for our children, our elders, and for our neighbors. Maine has failed to properly regulate this issue, but we are, we are here to help. We are here to provide alternate supplies of water, financial resources, and land to solve this problem. However, we can do this if, if uh, we can do this, these things, if LD906 is law. Without LD906, the chances are that the water supply will become worse and worse until it fails. Chances that no one will find a long-term solution unless the Passapakwadi tribe is that solution. This is our homeland. This is the place where our ancestors li have lived and died since time immemorial. We want nothing more than to see our homelands have clean water so our future generations can not just survive, but thrive. This is what LD906 is about. It's about clean water for the future. It's about a tribal government pushing solutions to complex problems. It's about the Passapakwadi tribe ri ri rising to regional challenges and coming forth with solutions for the greater good. I implore you to support LD906 in your committee and on, your and on the floor. Vote for the clean water in Washington County vote for LD906. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chief Neptune, for being with us both this morning and this afternoon. Greatly appreciate your time and testimony. Committee members, are there questions for Vice Chief Neptune? If so, please raise your electronic hand. And I am not seeing any. So again, thank you very much for your time today, sir. Next call upon Vice Chief Daryl Newell. Vice Chief, welcome back. Uh, it's good to see you again. Please begin your testimony when you're comfortable. Good afternoon, uh, committee chairs, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. We are acquainted. My name is Daryl Newell. I'm Vice Chief of the Passamaquoddy Tribe at Madakmigug Indian Township. Um, my energy and um, my preoccupation of late is uh, the restoration of tribal sovereignty. But this bill um, that I'm about to uh, remark on is, is of uh, particular importance to me. So, uh, Wolewin, thank you for allowing me to address you today in support of LD906, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. The mm -hmm. land now known as Maine is world renowned for clean water. People all over the world can buy bottled water from Maine. But what, what many people may not know is that there are communities in Down East Maine that, that do not have access to clean water, and they never have. The Passamaquoddy Water District, which is a state regulated entity, has struggled for decades against a poor water supply, an inadequate uh, infrastructure, 
in a failing attempt to provide both tribal and non-tribal citizens with drinking drinkable water. This bill will allow the Passamaquoddy tribe to access necessary resources to improve drinking water quality at Sibayik, Pleasant Point, and the city of Eastport. LD906 does this in three important ways by allowing the Passamaquoddy tribe to regulate water quality in partnership with the federal government, by exempting the Passamaquoddy Water District from property taxes and by allowing the tribe to access water through land we already own. This po these, policies, <clears throat> these policy goals all represent barriers for Wabanaki tribal communities that no other federally recognized tribes face. If this legislation passes, the, the tribe would be able to coordinate with the Environmental Protection Agency to regulate drinking water at Sibayak, Pleasant Point. The tribe would have oppor uh, the opportunity to build capacity and to regulate our own drinking water under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, just as all other tribes outside of Maine are able to do. This would open the door to new federal funding opportunities that could be used for urgently needed water quality improvements. This would also benefit our neighbors, the people living in, in the city of Eastport who have the right to clean water as well. The bill also puts the Passamaquoddy Water dis District on equal footing with every other water district in Maine. Passamaquoddy Water di District is the only water district that pays property taxes. This is an additional financial strain that no other public water supplier is subject to. If LD906 becomes law, the property tax savings are estimated to cover the planned cost of state and tribally funded infrastructure upgrades. Finally, LD906 grants access to a new clean water supply using land already owned by the tribe. Sources of, of groundwater on these parcels have been pre previously tested and determined to be capable of serving as community water systems. No matter what color your skin is or where you come from, we all need clean water to drink to cook and to clean ourselves and our families. But, it'll, but the Land Claim Settlement Act is a roadblock to clean water for, for people living in Zipayek, as well as those served by the Passamaquoddy Water District in the city of Eastport and the town of Perry. Generations of our people have lived and died without clean water because of state laws that prevent, prevent us from caring for our water, our land and our communities. Today, we have the opportunity to join together to reject the policies that have held us all back and allow the Passamaquoddy tribe to be the stewards of the water for the people of Zibayak, as well as our neighbors. All of our communities can thrive when we have a voice in these decisions. Thank you for your time and consideration of this bill. We respectfully urge you to support LD906 Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chief Newell, uh, for your testimony this afternoon. Are there questions from committee members for Vice Chief Newell, Representative Evangelos? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Very briefly, um, Vice Chief Newell, um, it was either you or uh, Vice Chief Neptune that said um, that the pond um, includes the use of uh, cattle or in the area of it at times. Um, so do you experience coliform bacteria in your testing? Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Representative. I, I don't have specific information. I, I would um, be in line with the chief to um, um, direct my um, responses from um, our attorney, um, Corey Hinton. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Representative Evangelos. Representative Hagan. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe my question would be for uh, Attorney uh, Hinton, so I'll hold off. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Representative Hagan. Seeing no additional questions, uh, I want to extend our thanks to Vice Chief Newell for being with us this morning, this afternoon, and Tuesday, early this week. All week. Well, thank you.
That's right. Thank you. Uh, I will next turn to the attorney for the Passamaquoddy tribe, Michael Corey Hinton. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, sir. Please begin your testimony, and I know there are some questions out there for you as well. Ah, good to you, all one. Thank you, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee for the opportunity to address, to address you today. I am here to testify in support of common sense drinking water reforms for tribal and non-tribal members in Washington County, one of the poorest counties in the state of Maine. We are here today because the water delivered to the residents of Zubayek and Eastport is riddled with carcinogens that by admission of the state water district can cause cancer. LD906 would level the playing field regarding access to clean drinking water for these two communities in Washington County. This legislation proposes reasonable policies aimed at addressing a major public health risk that has grown for 40 years under the not so watchful eye of the state of Maine. For years, the Water District has struggled mightily to maintain compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. A variety of publicly available documents illustrate that the Water District is consistently unable to maintain legal levels of carcinogens in a public water supply at certain times of year. For two years, the Passamaquoddy tribe has spearheaded efforts to provide customers of the state water utility that serves the tribe and the city of Eastport. Just before we started this effort, the local water district had failed about 50% of its water quality tests over a period of multiple years. Things reached ahead when the water turned a bluish green in the summer and fall of 2019. That disturbing situation prompted a fresh, tribally driven approach to solve a long-standing problem in the region. We brought Maine, the United States, and the local water district, including its representation of multiple local municipalities to the table. We, the tribe, instituted the push for reasonable solutions to a clear public health threat. Those collaborative efforts have confirmed, have confirmed several key points that LD906 strives to address. One, the state water district struggles financially and needs support. Two, the current water supply is in an irreversible downward decline that will lead to failure in the coming decades. Three, the tribe has access to supplies of water and financial resources that can significantly improve the long-term availability and quality of drinking water in the region. Unfortunately, current law does not support solutions to these problems. The local water district is the only water district in Maine that pays property taxes. Thus, the first way that LD906 would level the playing field is by ensuring that this water district is exempt from property taxes like other water districts in the state. Equality among state water districts is logical from a public policy perspective. It is a reasonable, straightforward change that will quickly increase funds available to improve infrastructure in the near term. Second, the bill would protect tribally owned lands where tribally owned water resources are located. The land that would be included in the tribe's territory are already owned by the tribe and are in close proximity to or are, or are adjacent to Zibayag. The tribe is currently unable to fully utilize its own water because of local ordinances that were specifically passed to obstruct tribal attempts to access clean drinking water. These lands must be protected and they must be placed in trust status under the Maine Implementing Act. Third, and perhaps most significantly, LD906 would level the playing field by allowing the Passamaquoddy to enjoy the same protections and powers enjoyed by other federally recognized tribal nations with respect to drinking water. These protections would come under the Safe Drinking Water Act. Because of the Settlement Act, the tribe is effectively blocked from regulating its own water and from accessing certain types of federal funds available under the Safe Drinking Water Act for that purpose. We have seen the result of this paradigm in this, in, we have seen the result of this power paradigm in the form of brown water and recurring drinking water notices. Now it's time for common sense, reasonable reform of the paternalistic power structure that has allowed this problem to metastasize under the eye of the state of Maine. If the bill passes, the EPA will be the primary regulator responsible for overseeing and enforcing drinking water standards within Passamaquoddy territory. 
The tribe has met with the EPA multiple times and has solicited written technical advice regarding the impact of LD906. If enacted, the bill would not have an immediate impact on the water district other than an increase in available funding. Instead, the EPA would enforce the same water quality standards currently enforced on the water district by the state. It would not be possible under federal law for the EPA to impose requirements on the district that it is not already subject to under state and federal law. This change is important, however, to remove jurisdictional roadblocks for the tribe to get permits for wells on its own land and to be able to adopt and enforce ordinances so the tribe can police itself with respect to the regulation of drinking water on its lands. In closing, LD906 is narrowly crafted to be a reasonable approach to leveling the playing field and helping the Passamaquoddy tribe improve drinking water for its residents and its neighbors. Waliwan, thank you. Thank you very much, Attorney Hinton, for your testimony this afternoon. And as you were aware listening, there are some questions out there for you. So I'm gonna open it up to committee members uh, with questions for Attorney Hinton, beginning with Representative Moriarty. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Hinton, whose ordinances are standing in the way of the tribe uh, accessing the water on its own land? In 2010, the tribe obtained federal funds to conduct a feasibility study to examine alternate supplies of water. Yes. The tribe began to implement this grant and began testing water located on tribal lands to determine if there was a sufficient quality and quantity of water to meet the needs of the local water district. Yes. In response to water quality testing for that federally funded survey, the town of Perry passed a water ban. The town of Perry then followed up with a comprehensive uh, water extraction ordinance, which placed significant and costly um, burdens on anybody seeking to use water for anything other than private domestic purposes. Well, if I may, has, has Eastport challenged Perry uh, on the validity of its uh, ordinances? To my knowledge, nobody has legally challenged the ordinances. As you can probably imagine, the cost to going to court and doing battle with your neighbors would not just wreak a financial toll on the already strained financial resources of the tribe, but it would result in significant political strain among our neighbors. We have not taken legal uh, mechanisms uh, just yet. And we have engaged in this cooperative effort for multiple years so that we can all walk hand in hand with the city of Eastport and the town of Perry as we solve this problem together. So we have not sued. I don't believe that Eastport has sued either. Okay. Mr. Chair, may I just continue momentarily? Just with one, one follow-up and, okay. and then I'll get back to you after other all right, members have funny. a chance to question. So Mr. Hinton is, is, uh, the city of Eastport uh, standing in the same shoes of the tribe as far as the town of Perry's water extraction ordinance is concerned? No, because the city of Eastport is a city of Eastport and our lands fall within the town of Perry. Therefore, our lands are subject to the town of Perry's discriminatory ordinance, whereas the city of Eastport's lands are not subject to that same discriminatory ordinance. And I'd like to note just really quickly, Representative, that the city of Eastport does have THMs in their water. And there are complaints of water quality problems in the city of Eastport. Several years ago, an Eastport citizen um, put together a concerned citizen survey and polled local residents at the local grocery store and at public places around the city of Eastport about whether or not they are comfortable using and do in fact use PWD water. That survey out of approximately 75 people showed that the overwhelming majority of the polled residents do not use PWD water. They don't choose to do use a different supply of water for any reason I would imagine other than they do not trust the water that they receive. They receive brown water, we receive brown water. In the course of preparing for this hearing today, I have in fact talked to Eastport residents, both current 
and past, and they all echo similar concerns to what the past from Quiet Tribe is bringing forth today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Moriarty. And thank you for your response, Attorney Hinton. Representative Hagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nice to see you again, uh, Mr. Hinton. Uh, I have, I'm at a bit, a bit of a disadvantage as I am a teacher and I, I work all day long and I don't get on these uh, Zoom chats until late, late in the day. So I apologize if my questions have already been covered somewhere um, in advance. So, uh, and Mr. Moriarty took two of my questions. So nicely done, Steve. <laughs> anyway, uh, you have two parcels of land. So my question is, why can you not use that at this point? Thank you, very good question. As I mentioned earlier, and it's good to see you as well, Representative Hagan. It's, uh, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, I hope, hope school went well today. Um, as I mentioned uh, a little while ago, um, the tribe attempted to use water on one of its parcels to provide uh, an alternate supply to the water district. That land is one of the two parcels that's subject to this legislation. And it was efforts to use that land in particular that prompted the, um, the moratorium and the ordinance that has effectively um, prevented the tribe from being able to use that water. So there's been, there are very real reasons why um, we've been unable to use that water and, and they generally flow from um, local zoning ordinances um, that we are unable to um, essentially afford to deal with right now. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, I guess, uh, okay, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Hagan. Thank you, Attorney Hinton, for your responses. Uh, Representative Poirier. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for being with us today, Mr. Hinton. Um, the question that I have um, stems back to 2020 when the main CDC chief engineer, William Doss, Representative was offered um, to participate in um, grant funding to take care of some of. I'm sorry, I, I cannot. Re Re Representative Poirier, your connection is, is, is breaking up. I, 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 I know it's unusual, but if you could shut off your video, it might make it easier for us to hear your question. For us to hear your question. We'll give it a try. I apologize. Our internet is a little bit in and out here today. Um, I'll start over. My question stems from a 2020 um, Maine CDC Chief Engineer William Dawson um, had spoken about grants offered to this tribe to um, rectify some of the water issues and also funding offered for studies for alternate water supplies for the tribe that the tribe denied. Um, so I'm just wondering why the tribe denied the assistance from the state at that time. Thank you for your question. I think there's um, some inaccuracies in your question that I'd like to clarify as a part of my response. First of all, we work very closely with, with Bill Dawson. We worked very closely with the Maine CDC and it is the state and the tribe that collectively put together funding to, to pay for the cost of key upgrades at the water district. But I wanna make something really clear. Your question suggested that these grants were offered to the tribe. The tribe does not own this water district. The tribe does not operate this water district. The tribe does not regulate this water district. These are the responsibilities of the state of Maine. The state of Maine offered a grant to the water district. The water district did not have enough money with that grant to pay for the upgrades that state CDC, Mr. Dawson had recommended. The tribe using um, funding from its nonprofit partner, Wabanaki Public Health, was able to bring a significant amount of resources to uh, essentially fully fund that upgrade. That upgrade, however, would not be possible 
if it was just up to the Passamaquoddy Water District. They are totally unable to fund the necessary upgrades. And not only are they unable to fund the cost of installation, but they do not have the costs to maintain this infrastructure. That is why this legislation would exempt it from property taxes so that the savings in property taxes can be directly applied to cover the cost of maintenance that Maine CDC deem necessary to maintain the compliance of this water district. With respect to that feasibility study that you repre referenced, Madam Representative, I mentioned a little while ago what happened in 2010 when the Passamaquoddy tribe received a feasibility study funding from the federal government. To be clear, the feasibility study funding that you're referencing was not from the state of Maine. To be clear, the feasibility study funding was applied for by the tribe from the United States federal government because of the unique government to government trust relationship that exists between the tribe and the United States. It was not the state of Maine that suggested that the feasibility study be done. It was the tribe who pursued this in tandem with its federal partners. We approved, we were approved to receive this funding in 2020, as you mentioned. At the same time, there were also discussions around this upgrade that we've mentioned with respect to the infrastructure at the water district. The upgrade at the water district would entail the installation of uh, carbon filters to the water cleaning process. Um, and it was uh, everybody's sincere hope that the um, cost of that would be covered and that the installation could be completed before the 2022 bad water season, as I like to say. The bad water season for us is spring and summer. Unfortunately, we've learned in the past several months that the necessary upgrade that the state of Maine and the tribe have invested significant resources in, we've learned that it will not be installed before the bad water season. We did not decline to, in, to pursue that feasibility study because we don't want an alternate supply of water. We declined to use that feasibility study money at that time because we wanted to give additional space for upgrades in the system to occur and for the state and the water district, its water district, to clean up the water. We have been patient and our patience has been rewarded with nothing, nothing. As of now, the Passamaquoddy tribe will proceed with a feasibility study in coordination with the Indian Health Service so that we can look for alternate supplies of water. We hoped to avoid this route, but we see, as my leaders have suggested, that the status quo and simply waiting for a state regulated entity to do the right thing is not good enough. That is why we will be proceeding with the feasibility study now. Thank you very much. I hope that answers your questions. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Poirier. Representative Babbage. Yes, thank you, that was all very helpful. Um, uh, Attorney Hinton, I uh, would like to ask, I mean, I, I, I read somewhere that about $14 million has actually been uh, funneled to the PWD um, over the last two decades. I assume that that is to um, uh, uh, install those uh, filtration system. Uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, I only see three ways out of this, a filtration system, uh, d the digging of wells or a pipeline. And, and because you don't have, well, I don't know how far your lake is, but obviously the St. Croix that's fresh water is w a long way from you. So, um, so I, I'm, so my question is, uh, filtration is what is being attempted by PWD, but you're hoping that the acquisition of this land would allow you, without obstacles, to dig, dig a well to provide an alternative, alternative uh, source. Yes, sir, that's, that's correct. And <clears throat> to provide a little bit more context for why we believe that securing alternate supplies of water is necessary in addition to the water filters. The filters will clean the water that's in the water system. As has been mentioned, the water in the water system comes in and it is very, very dirty. The water source itself, void and reservoir, 
has become increasingly shallow over time. I met with the water district in 2019 and I heard um, one of the representatives say that in the 80s, it was 30 feet deep. Today, at its deepest depths, I believe that it's between 10 and 15 feet deep. The increasing shallow of shallowness of this uh, water source means that the battle to clean the water will become more and more challenging because rain and wind will become, um, it will more easily be able to whip up all of the organic material when there's less water. And so filtering and cleaning water that will become more and more dirty seems like a losing battle for the long term. The filters that we've talked about, they are by definition ter uh, temporary. They will wear down, they must be replaced. There's been no pilot studies done for this particular upgrade. No one knows how long those filters will last or how quickly they will need to be replaced. I feel like for all of these reasons, it's the best possible, most prudent course of action to identify and protect alternate supplies of water. That's why this legislation would seek to do just that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Babbage. Representative Moriarty, I said I would come back to you if you had additional questions, but I do want to remind the, the committee that we're, we're at a public hearing today. We will have a work session, and I think we're going into some technical questions, and I'm, I've given quite a bit of leeway. I also know we have 50 people who have signed up to provide testimony. So I ask committee members to please keep that in mind um, when they are developing questions for people providing testimony. But with that, uh, Representative Moriarty, did you have a follow-up question for Attorney no, I, Benton? I, well, yes, but I'll, I'll pass. Thank you. And um, Representative Poirier, I saw your hand up. Are you good now as well? I am. I would just like to make sure that Mr. Hinton might have himself available for our work session. Should we have any further questions for him? I wouldn't miss it for the world, Representative. Thank Ms. you. Attorney Hinton seems to find find the time to be with us on, on multiple occasions. So I'm, I'm assuming that the work session would be one of those. Thank you, Representative Poirier. And thank you very much for your testimony and your response to the questions, Corey. Greatly appreciated. Next person we will hear from is Ambassador Molly and Dana. Uh, welcome, Ambassador. It's good to see you again. Doesn't seem like a very long time. Uh, please begin your testimony when you're comfortable. Great. Thank you. And good afternoon, Representative Harnett, uh, Senator Carney, and members of the committee. Good to see you again after these short few hours. <laughs> Uh, I am honored to lend my voice in support of LD906, sponsored by Passamaquoddy Tribal Representative Rena Newell, and I am honored also to support the efforts for clean drinking water for the people of Sabayag. I stand in solidarity with my Wabanaki family and the Passamaquoddy tribe, and I ask you to honor their request today. You'll probably hear this line baked into just about every testimony, but not having clean drinking water is a human rights violation. There should be no excuses given to the tribe about jurisdiction, authority, location, or bureaucracy. There should only be seeking solutions in a timely and fair manner. The good news is Representative Newell's bill does just that. I trust that if there was another way to fix this problem, it would have been fixed by now. When a group of people do not have their basic human needs met, they suffer. They internalize that suffering and they manifest that suffering. And with each generation, that suffering compounds. Children in Sabayak have to live with the knowledge that they live at a standard less than other children in the state. The process that Vice Chief Neptune described about having to jump through hoops to provide clean drinking water in an elementary school in Maine in 2022 is not just unconscionable, it is discriminatory. I urge you all to think about how you would feel yourselves, if yourselves, your children, your parents, your grandchildren, uh, grandparents, or anyone that you may love and care about didn't have access to clean drinking water in your homes. There is really no answer here, but to honor the request of the Passamaquoddy tribal representative that she brings forth so beautifully and humbly on behalf of her people. 
there is no answer but to help and to take a stand for what is right for all the people of Maine, no matter where they live. I urge you to vote ought to pass and uh, to support this very important bill in all future votes. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ambassador Dana, for your testimony and time today. Are there questions for Ambassador Dana? Uh, Representative Babbitt, your hand is up. No. Or if there are no questions, uh, again, you have the thanks of the Judiciary Committee for being here to testify today. We greatly appreciate your presence and time. Um, the last person from this group that we will hear from until I go back to the attendee room is Attorney Sherry Mitchell. Good afternoon, Sherry Mitchell. Uh, when you're comfortable, please begin your testimony and welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Welcome back. Thank you, Thank you Representative Harnett. Uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee, thank you for hearing my testimony this afternoon in favor of LD 906. Uh, my name is Sherry Mitchell. I am from the Penobscot Nation. My family is Bear Clan from the Penobscot Nation and Crow Clan from the Passamaquoddy Tribe at Tabayak. Uh, I'd like to start out by recognizing Representative Newell for bringing forward this important piece of legislation for the benefit of her people, both today and into the future. Uh, Willie one for all of your good work. Contaminated water is pervasive in tribal communities. In the United States, it's estimated that one in 10 Native Americans lacks access to clean tap water. Here in Maine, the Passamaquoddy tribe is connected to the only water district currently taxed by the state of Maine. They are taxed for a water source that is contaminated and that is being moved through failing infrastructure. The lack of access to clean water poses serious ongoing health risks, as well as financial burdens and significant inconveniences to tribal members. For 40 years, the Passamaquoddy people have been forced to deal with limited access to unhealthy water. This time period is five times longer than the one that residents of Flint, Michigan have endured. After only eight years, the people of Flint, Michigan have reached a settlement with their state and are being offered solutions. Yet the Passamaquoddy people are forced to come back to this body and to the courts time and again to try to get relief. Just to remind you, the legislative body is responsible for making the laws that the court is required to follow. When the laws fail to work for the good of the people, the recourse that the people have is to come to this body so the appropriate changes can be made to those laws to ensure the health and safety of the people. That is why the Passamaquoddy come to you today. The taxation of the Passamaquoddy Water District, the only taxable water district in the state of Maine, saying it again, amounts to a tax on indigeneity that must be alleviated for the tribes to enjoy its human right to clean water. The human right to water was first recognized by the United Nations Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights in 2002. It stated that access to water was a condition for the enjoyment of the right to an adequate standard of living, inextricably related to the right to the highest attainable standard of health, and therefore a human right. It went on to say <clears throat> that the human right to water entitles everyone to sufficient, safe, acceptable, physically accessible, and affordable water for personal and domestic use. In July of 2010, the UN General Assembly formally recognized the human right to water in Resolution 64-292, the human right to water and sanitation. This right is currently being denied to the Passamaquoddy people through inaction. It is now time for the state to act on this emergency request and provide the Passamaquoddy tribe at Zabayak with the ability to access clean drinking water. It is my hope that this committee will recognize the Passamaquoddy tribe, the Passamaquoddy tribe's human right to water and will vote ought to pass on LD 906 to take the first real step toward ensuring that the Passamaquoddy people have their right to clean drinking water honored and upheld by the state of Maine. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Sherry Mitchell, for your time and testimony today. Are there questions from committee members 
for Attorney Mitchell. I am not seeing any, so thank you very much for your time and testimony today. I am now going to go to the attendee room and I'm going to call on the four persons. I'm gonna ask people to stop putting their hands up, please, for a second. I'm going to call on the four people that want to testify in support of the bill. And then I'm going to turn, we've been uh, 90 minutes listening to persons in support of the bill. Uh, I will take these other four um, and then I will switch to those who wish to testify against and then neither for nor against. And then we'll go back again to uh, those in support. And I will remind everyone testifying from here on out we will be on a three minute clock. Uh, my co-chair, Senator Carney, will hold up a phone with a timer. There's the phone when there's about 15 seconds left. And then she will hold up a yellow sticky when the time is up. And I am going to have to enforce that uh, religiously this afternoon for us to get through this hearing. So with that, I would ask Committee Clerk uh, Supi Panette to please move over Michael Cabetta. William Altivator, are you testifying in support? If you are, I will have you moved over. Hannah Slattery and Dana Colahan. And again, that's where we're gonna stop with the persons in support of the bill, but I will come back to you. So Supi, if you could move those four individuals over. And thank you, Supi. I will try to go in the order that I called upon people. I will start with uh, Michael Cabetta. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your test three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you, uh, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney and members of the committee. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Cabetta and I'm policy counsel for the ACLU of Maine a statewide organization committed to advancing and preserving the civil rights and liberties guaranteed by the state and federal constitutions. On behalf of our members, we urge you to support this bill because it will advance the sovereignty, independence, and dignity of the Passamaquoddy Nation. Sovereignty is a legal word for an ordinary concept, the authority to self-govern. For long before the United States became a country or Maine became a state, tribal nations operated a self-regulating sovereign governments. The US Constitution recognizes Indian tribes as distinct governments and quote, only Congress can abrogate or limit an Indian tribe sovereignty, end quote. Early in Supreme Court jurisprudence, the court recognized that Indian tribes are nations who entered into treaties with the federal government. The Supreme Court continues to acknowledge tribes as separate and independent from states. This bill will lay an important plank in the sovereignty of the Passamaquoddy nation. It is scandalous that people who have inhabited this region for thousands of years lack access to clean drinking water. This bill would improve Passamaquoddy tribal members' access to safe drinking water. We urge you to vote ought to pass. I thank you for your time and attention, and I'm happy to try to answer questions. Thank you very much for your testimony, Michael Cabetta, today. We greatly appreciate you being here. Are there questions from committee members for Attorney Cabetta? Seeing none, thank you very much. The next person testifying in support of LD 19906 uh, is William Altivator. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Mr. Altivator, are you testifying in support today? Well, I was actually neither for nor against. Okay, I'm gonna ask you just to hold off for a minute. You'll be the first neither for nor against we get to as I get through just two other persons in support and then we're gonna switch over. If thank that's you. okay with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would turn to uh, Dana Callahan. Uh, welcome back to the Judi Judiciary Committee. Please um, begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you. Good evening, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Dana Callahan, and I'm the main state director at Community Action Works Campaigns.
I strongly support LD906, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. At Community Action Works campaigns, we believe that environmental threats are big, but the power of well-organized community groups is bigger. That's why we work side by side with everyday people to confront those who are polluting and harming the health of our communities. We believe that everyone deserves the right to breathe clean air, drink clean water, and live in healthy and vibrant communities. And as we've heard today, this is not the case in Zabayak. The water at Pleasant Point is at times dirty, brown, filled with toxins like trihalomethanes, exceeding federal drinking water standards. Sustained exposure or consumption of these chemicals can lead to increased risk of cancer as well as kidney, liver, and central nervous system problems and other health effects. The main beacon reported that in 2018 and 2019, the Passamaquoddy Water District had THM concentrations above the maximum contaminant level for three quarters of both years. We know that water is life. It is deeply disturbing to know that Passamaquoddy tribal members have not had access to safe drinking water for decades. Many members have had to purchase bottled water at the store and individuals who cannot afford to do this have had to drink contaminated water from the tap. We would never see a crisis of the scale occur in Portland, Augusta, or many um, other more affluent communities in the state. This is an issue of environmental injustice, which is why it is critical that the committee votes LD906 ought to pass. This legislation would enable the Passamaquoddy tribe regulate their own drinking water under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act in coordination with the EPA, make federal funding available for tribal communities in Maine. This bill would also give the Passamaquoddy Tribal District essential funds needed to address this crisis by aligning the district with every other water district in the state, by exempting them from paying property taxes moving forward. Lastly, it protects access to new groundwater sources in the future. LD906 is a critical step needed to ensure that indigenous and non-indigenous residents in Sabayak have access to clean drinking water. I urge the committee to pass LD906 because it is clear that when the tribes thrive, we all thrive. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time and testimony this afternoon. Are there questions from committee members for Dana Callahan? And seeing none again, we thank you very much for your time. I'll now turn to Hannah Slattery. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and members of the Judiciary, Commission, uh, Judiciary Committee, I am testifying today in strong support of LD906. My name is Hannah Slattery, and I'm a Mi'kmaq descendant of the Great Bear River Tribal Nation. I'm a medical student at Tufts University School of Medicine and a member of the Board of Directors at Native American Lifelines and Urban Indian Health Clinic. I'm also a member of the student section of the Maine Medical Association, and I've been a student researcher on the Passamaquoddy Water Project for the past nine months. I'm the current president of the Passamaquoddy Tufts Partnership, a community engaged program in which medical students mentor a class of Zabayak eighth graders. Over the past three days, I've circulated a petition for LD906 and the Pass Passamaquoddy's pursuit of clean drinking water. The petition has been signed by 119 students, community members, and medical professionals across 11 universities, <clears throat> including Tufts University School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School and School of Public Health, the University of New England, Boston University, Boston College, Duke, Dartmouth, Southern Maine Community College, Brandeis, Northeastern, and UCLA. Signees include professors, physicians, nurses, concerned citizens, and most notably, upwards of 80 medical students within the state of Maine. This issue is deeply cared for by many who believe that drinking water is a basic human right and that stand by LD906, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. I wanna pose three questions to the committee today. And I ask that each of you take the time to think of your own answer to these questions before I move forward with my answer. Number one, is a lack of access to clean drinking water a public health issue? I think we can all agree, yes, fundamentally, water is a very basic and essential component of both health and life. As mentioned by several past uh, testimonies, the reservoir for 
the Passamaquoddy drinking water Bowdoin Reservoir is uh, becoming more shallow over the course of the years and organic meta um, material in the waters has combined with chlorine to form trihalomethanes. The trihalomethanes formed are both carcinogenic and teratogenic. It is the moral responsibility of health organizations and health professions in the state of Maine to support access to clean drinking water. Question number two, is access to clean drinking water a sovereignty issue? Yes, fundamentally. The limited limitations of self-governments placed on the tribe and the Maine Settlement Act of 1980 have made it impossible for the tribe to interface directly with the EPA in critical pieces of legislation like the Clean Water and Safe Water Drinking Act. Finally, my third question, is a lack of sovereignty a public health issue? Unequivocally, yes. It is important to reiterate that LD906 does not uh, restore sovereignty to the, to the tribe, but addresses critical aspects of autonomy related to obtaining access to clean drinking water. It is not a solution, but a stopgap and uh, a public health emergency. Hannah, <laughs> Hannah Slattery, I apologize for interrupting, but I'm gonna to have to do this to all your three minutes is Absolutely. up. If you could please wrap it up in one sentence. My last sentence is just that this is a socioeconomic determinant of health and to properly support the tribe moving forward, it will be vital to support both the sovereignty as a socioeconomic determinant of that lack of access to clean drinking water. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Hannah Slattery, for your time and testimony today. Are there any questions from committee members for Hannah Slattery? And I am not seeing any, uh, but uh, much appreciation from the committee for your time and testimony. I'm going to go back to the attendee room and ask for anybody whose hand is up to testify in support of the bill to please put it down uh, because we are now going to switch briefly because there's not a lot of testimony on the other side, but I need to be fair in terms of the time. I would ask if there are any persons who wish to testify against LD906 to please raise your electronic hand. And I am not seeing any, so now I will ask if there are any persons who wish to testify neither for nor against LD906 to please raise your electronic hand. And I would ask the committee clerk to please move over Lizbeth Wierda and Jerry Reed to the panelist status. And I will begin our testimony of persons testifying neither for nor against with uh, William Altivator, as I promised him when he came over a short while ago. Thank Welcome back much. to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. I was hoping to get more than three minutes, uh, particularly being a tribal government employee, but I will try to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, the only reason that I am neither for or against uh, this legislation is uh, going either way would, in my mind, legitimize what I con consider to be uh, an illegal um, Maine Indian land claim settlement in that it was uh, codified as a result of fraud, duress, undue influence, and racially, racial discrimination. Um, oh, Opinions don't seem to change quickly in Maine. I hope yours have. To quote the case of Murch versus Tomer in June 1842, which was never questioned and in reference to my ancestors, and I quote, imbecility on their part and the dictates of humanity on ours have necessarily prescribed them to their subjection to our parental control. Emphasis on parental control. 418 years ago, Champlain spent the winter of what is now known as St. Croix Island. 35 of the 79 had already died, and had my ancestors not brought provisions, all 79 would have perished. You won't read this in your history books because most of the history that is written hides or does not tell the whole truth. Before I go any further, uh, I just want to uh, say thank you to Representative Rena Newell for bringing this very important, critical issue to the forefront. Chewili Winrina, Kuligwazat. Here we are today pleading for the very essence of life, water, good water, 
Sabayak is surrounded by water. Water, water everywhere, and not a good drop to drink. Uh, my position right now is facilities manager for Maine Indian Education. This past summer, we constructed a brand new school called Sabayak Elementary School. During the construction of the school, one of my co-workers says, this is a good opportunity to drill a well so that the kids can have uh, good drinking water and the kitchen can have good uh, water to cook with. He planted the seed, I watered it, and today we have a well that is supplying the school 30 gallons a minute. Awesome, awesome, awesome water. Unbelievable. So along comes this paperwork from the state. And they, 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 they asked me to fill it out, ask who you, who you, who's your uh, designated water operator going to be. So I signed my name after having 27 years experience in the Merchant Marine, doing water tests on 1,200-pound PSI boilers. But then about two or three uh, days, weeks later, they said, oh, you have to have this license from the state to be able to do this. And I said, what? I said, you mean to tell me? that I, as a tribal member, a graduate of Maine Maritime Academy with a Bachelor of Science of Engineering, can't draw a sample, send it to the lab for analysis without the state saying it's okay? W William, therein, ultimator, call, therein comes the parental oversight, William, which we do not need. William, Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry for, for having to do that. And I do need to ask you, I, I don't think I heard, if you could please state uh, your residence as well, name and residence. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, my name is William Altfader Jr. I live in Eastport. I'm employed by Maine in Education as a facilities manager. Thank you very much for your time and testimony today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I, I would now call upon uh, Jerry Reed, the governor's counsel uh, for his three minute testimony on LD 906. Welcome Mr. Reed back to the Judiciary Committee. Thank you, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett, members of the committee. My name is Jerry Reed. I'm uh, counsel to Governor Mills, and I'm here to testify neither for nor against LD906. And I did submit written testimony, but I'm not going to read it. I just want to try to make a few points very quickly and allow you to move on. Um, first of all, I want to say that this is an issue that I personally care very deeply about. Um, I first learned about it when Representative Newell very graciously invited me to visit Sabayak, the Pleasant Point Reservation in 2019 when I was DEP commissioner. And I heard that this was the leading frustration among tribal members at that time. And my reaction to it was, I think what I would expect your reaction to it has been, which is that this is just an unacceptable situation. And in 2022, we have to do better and, and find a way to provide a safe and reliable supply of drinking water to the reservation and to the neighboring communities. The governor feels exactly the same way. So we're committed to trying to find a permanent solution. The second thing I wanna say quickly is I wanna strongly encourage the committee to invite the drinking water program in Maine CDC to the work session. They've been working on these issues for a long time and I, I'm confident that they would have information and answers to a lot of the questions that I think committee members were expressing curiosity about today. So I think that would be very helpful. The problems that I see uh, underlying uh, the situation at Pleasant Point and in Eastport and Perry are twofold. As you've heard so far, there is a serious problem with the water, with the quality of the water source in Boyden Lake. And secondly, there are inadequate resources to deal with the engineering challenges. We support uh, section one of the bill which is uh, the provision that would exempt the water district from property taxation. That's a very sensible way to inject more resources into the effort to find solutions. And we likewise support section two of the bill, which would amend the main implementing act to allow the tribe to take into trust those two parcels of land that you heard about in the town of Perry, where wells could be drilled that could be could provide an alternate source of high quality drinking water and provide part of the solution here. That makes perfect sense. We've heard a lot in the last few days about potential amendments to the Impl Implementing Act and the administration's willingness to entertain those. This is an exa exactly an occasion where we think it makes sense. We do have concerns with the jurisdictional provisions of the bill 
That's explained in more detail in my written submission, but very generally where we're coming from with that is that this water district, as you've heard about, is not a tribal entity. It's a non-tribal entity that serves three communities, Perry, Pleasant Point, and Eastport. And we feel like its operations cannot be segregated and so it should be regulated as a coherent whole. It's impractical to, to uh, entertain the possibility of this, this unit being regulated uh, by two different entities. Council Reed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna need you to wrap up. In, in and that's all I have to say. I just wanted to quickly make those points. Thank you Thank very you much. Very, Thank you very much, uh, Council Reed. Are there questions for the Governor's Council, Jerry Reed from committee members? And I, I, I see Senator Carney, is that a question or your hand is still just up? Okay, um, up for a good purpose, not a, not a latent hand, a uh, residual. Um, Representative Reckitt. I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Reed if, um, if there is a, um, if, if his testimony includes a proposal on how the third section of your concern could be rectified. Uh, my submission does not, but I want to emphasize that we are eager to work with Representative Newell and Attorney Hinton to see if there is an alternative way of addressing the uh, what they were trying to accomplish with those provisions in the bill. We're very anxious to, to work cooperatively to uh, see if that can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Seeing no additional questions from committee members, thank you very much. Uh, Council Reed for being with us this afternoon. And I'm sure that our analyst has noted uh, the availability of the CDC to attend a work session. Thank you. Great, thank you all. I will now turn to the last person who has indicated they wish to testify neither for nor against. And I will welcome to the Judiciary Committee, Lizbeth, I hope I get this right, Weirda. Um, when you are comfortable, please begin your three minute testimony. Thank you. It's a tricky name. I, I don't mean to speak out of turn, but I did see that Representative Newell's hand is raised. Oh, I apologize for that. Um, a lot of things going on on this screen. People just keep jumping around. I apologize, Representative Newell. Did you have a question for the governor's council? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you um, for recognizing my hand. Um, I just want to comment very quickly. You know, I, I appreciate the governor's uh, counsel. Attorney Reed, I thank you for being here. I, I know we've been in the same room before, and I know we've absolutely agreed to disagree at various times. And, and I know that uh, we've worked together on uh, mutual interest in, in trying to find a resolution. So I just want to comment that uh, I look forward to these discussions. And I'm following up with uh, Representative Reckitt's um, question on whether or not you had written um, uh, anything. So uh, I look forward to our continued discussions as uh, we approach your concerns in, in regards to the third portion of this bill. Thank you, Representative Newell, I appreciate that. Thank you, Representative Newell, and I will do a better job with the bouncing boxes on my uh, screen here today. And they just bounced again. Uh, Lizbeth, I'll let you tell us your last name as you begin your three minute testimony. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Hartnett, Hartnett, excuse me, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. I'm Lizbeth Verda, Research Program Director for the Maine Medical Center's Research Institute, Center for Outcomes Research and Evaluation, located in Portland, Maine. I'm here to testify neither for nor against LD906. Maine Health is a nonprofit healthcare system that provides the full continuum of healthcare services to the residents of 11 counties in Maine and one in New Hampshire through its nine acute care hospitals, physician practices, lab, home health care services, inpatient and community based behavioral health services, and to me, most importantly, through a broad spectrum of research within the Maine Medical Center Research Institute. I'm here today not to take a position on the specifics of the bill, but instead to share our ongoing work undertaken at the request of and in partnership with the Passamaquoddy tribe to quantify the impacts 
quality at present, Pleasant Point on tribal members. Through our partnership with the tribe, we are working to quantify the effect of the water on cancer rates, cancer types, and adverse birth outcomes. As you've already heard, the public water for Pleasant Point, Eastport, and Perry has tested high for contaminants for more than 40 years. And in an effort to treat the water, the aggressive use of chlorine beginning in the 1980s has resulted in the production of toxic byproducts. These product byproducts called trihalomethanes have been associated with adverse outcomes across the human lifespan, such as adverse pregnancy outcomes and liver damage. In addition, trihalomethanes are classified by the US Environmental Protection Agency as a probable human carcinogen. And in studies have found that trihalomethanes are associated with increased risks of bladder, colorectal, and renal cancers. The appearance of these byproducts were first recorded in the waters surveying Pleasant Point, Eastport, and Perry when regular testing began in 2004. As a part of our work, we have also begun conducting interviews with community members to gather information about the psychological and social impact of living with contaminated water. Our community advisory board has met with the researchers regularly over the past several months and shared many personal accounts. During these meetings, we have heard from community members that they describe feeling dirtier after bathing in the water as it leaves a brown film and an odor on the skin. And they feel guilt about bathing their children in this water. Thank you. We've heard that they have chronic skin issues. We've heard that stress has put, the stress that this has put on the tribal government in terms of time and money and how it has colored their world and the view that, that other people have of them. The personal and community harm resulting from this water crisis is undeniable. Lizbeth, uh, I apologize. The three minutes is up. If you could wrap up in 10 seconds or so. Sure. Um, hope that research will shine a light on the effects this water crisis has had on this community. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time and testimony today. Are there questions from committee members for Lizbeth Verda? And I am not seeing any. So again, the committee greatly appreciates your time uh, and testimony this afternoon. Thank you. And before we continue, and I hate to, you know, part of this job is you have to be the Grinch and tell people what they can't do. Uh, the chat function seems really helpful when you're in the audience. It's not helpful when you're trying to run the meeting. And what is said in the chat is not part of the record. Uh, the chat is to be used for technical questions. Um, so people that are weighing in with evidence or questions that that's not going to be part of the record. So I would ask you to um, keep that in mind before you click on the chat. I'm now going to turn, uh, I'm gonna turn back to those persons who wish to testify in support of the bill to please raise your hand. I'm going to call on as many people as I can until we break at 5.15, um, where, where we will make an assessment about what will happen after 5.15. So I will begin by asking the committee clerk to please move over the following five people, Andrea Sakabasin, Lisa Sakabasin, Lakota Sanborn, Michael Alpert, and Nikki Sakara. And I will wait as those folks get transferred over. Chair Harnett, could I please uh, mention that um, I know that people have been putting substantive information in the chat and if they could instead just provide supplemental written testimony containing that information, uh, that way we can uh, get it in a format where it's useful and becomes part of the record. Thank you very much for your always practical advice to solve a problem, I greatly appreciate it. So I would welcome to the Judiciary Committee, uh, Lisa Sakabasin, uh, please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, 
and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Lisa Saka Basin. I am a Passamaquoddy citizen and a public health professional. I have the honor of helping to lead a large and quickly growing nonprofit, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness. I am here today as a concerned tribal citizen testifying in favor of LD906. I also want to thank Representative Newell. Thank you for your leadership. We often hear of generational poverty, generational disparities, and the generational wealth gap. Each of these complex social issues are highly visible in our state and well known to the Wabanaki. Have you heard of living in a generational water crisis where generation after generation, people experience dirty water coming from their faucets, where young children go, grow up without access to clean drinking water and elders struggle to haul water into their homes. This picture that I am describing is the Passamaquoddy experience, an experience with devastating consequences. This picture can change and you can be a part of creating the conditions where all people in Maine have access to clean drinking water. LD906 will improve access to clean water for customers of the Passamaquoddy Water District, people that are both tribal members and not. It will allow for the Environmental Protection Agency to work with the Pleasant Point, Zubai community, tribal nation and coordinate with them and help build the capacity to regulate their own drinking water under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act, like all other federally recognized tribes. As I mentioned in the beginning of my testimony, Wabanaki Public Health and Wellness is an organization that serves tribal people and the tribal nations in all corners of the state. We are quickly growing, but we are a nonprofit. We came to the table because this is a crisis and public health and water is deeply connected. We put a lot of dollars towards this effort, towards the Passamaquoddy Water District to pay for the upgrades so that everyone in the region can have clean water. That's the thing with indigenous people. We just don't care for ourselves. We care for our neighbors. And that is what we are intending to do with LD906. We have also created a water delivery system along with the tribe that, can, that is about lugging water, hundreds of gallons every single week. We have also been busy collecting data, as was mentioned before, doing the research needed to measure the harm that has already been done to tell that story so that can't happen to any other communities in this state moving forward. I thank you for your time. I ask you for your partnership, for your advocacy and your vote. It's time we change this. It's time we protect us who are still here and the generations that we know are coming. I thank you, Chi Williwen. Thank you, Lisa Saka Basin for your time and testimony today. The committee greatly appreciates it. Are there questions from committee members for Lisa Saka Basin? And I am not seeing any. So again, the committee expresses its deep appreciation for your time today. Uh, I'll now turn to Andrea Sakabasin. Uli Gizga, Cito Wen. Good day, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Angie Wiz, Andrea Sakabasin. New JL Wenawabskeg. My name is Andrea Sakabasin. I live on Indian Island, and I am both Passamaquoddy and Penobscot. I am here today as a concerned tribal citizen and would like to share my concerns regarding the act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean water. This bill is about a public health concern that entitles tribal members to have access to sufficient, safe, and clean drinking water to fulfill their basic human rights. I am in support of this bill as clean drinking water is essential to every person's life and is a step towards promoting public health and safety. This issue is very near and dear to my heart as my family lives in Zubayak, Pleasant Point, 
and we frequently travel to visit. I have seen firsthand how the effects of climate and seasonality can affect the quality of water that is being delivered to Sibayak from the Boyden Reservoir. When the water levels are low in the summer months, or when there is a storm with rain and high winds, the water delivered to Zibayak will have sediment that can be often seen in the water. The water is discolored and there is often an odor. The lack of access to basic clean water resources is often associated across the globe as a rising concern around economic, social, and environmental aspects. Because access to clean water has been thought of as a global issue, Many Maine citizens may not know that there are entire communities in the state where the available, availability of clear, clean, and safe drinking water is not guaranteed. The passing of this bill is an important step in promoting public health and safety, as well as addressing the systemic issues in order to ensure that there is a long-term access to safe drinking water. Chi Wooly One, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea Sakabasin, for your time and testimony this evening. We greatly appreciate your presence. Are there questions from committee members for Andrea Sakabasin? And I am not seeing any again, so we extend our deep appreciation for your presence today. Next up, we have Michael Alpert. Uh, and again, let me just, uh, every now and then I would need to remind people, please state your name your residence, and if you represent an organization. Michael, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three-minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and other distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. <clears throat> Thank you for allowing me to speak today in support of LD906. My name is Michael Alpert. I am a resident of Bangor, and I am speaking today as representative of the Greater Bangor Area Branch, NAACP. I agree with Representative Newell, water is life. I've submitted written testimony and I'm not going to repeat that except to say that the present situation is indecent and disgraceful. Last September, the United States Environmental Protection Agency issued a definition of environmental justice. And I want to read that now. Environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, the implementation, and the and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. In my opinion, the fact that the drinking water issue that, that's being discussed today has endured is a stark example of environmental racism. The state's inability to resolve this issue for this long is shameful. As people of goodwill, the members of this committee and legislate, legislator, legislature cannot let this situation continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Alpert, for your time and testimony this afternoon. It's greatly appreciated by the committee. Are there questions from committee members for Michael Alpert? If so, please raise your electronic hand. And I am not seeing any, so again, I extend our thanks to you. We'll now turn to Lakota Sanborn. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. It's good to see you again. Uh, please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you so much. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Hello again. Uh, my name is Lakota Sanborn. I'm a Penobscot community organizer who currently resides within Pugwocket territory in Western Maine. Um, I don't wish to speak for the Passamaquoddy. I'm speaking as a relative, a friend and an ally. I grew up on Indian Island. Um, our community has also experienced severe contamination and ongoing pollution of our closest relative, the Penobscot River, and I empathize heavily with the water crisis at Sibayak and can only imagine the level of psychological impact on community members there. Water is sacred. It is the source of all life on this planet. 
all people deserve access to clean drinking water. There's a reason why the phrase water is life is often repeated in indigenous spaces by those seeking justice and equity. The tribes, the tribe of Sabayak's water supply has frequently been found to have dangerous levels of neurotoxins and carcinogens. As you've heard, at times the water out of their faucets runs yellow, brown, black, and at times bluish green due to the sheer amount of chemicals and organic material found therein. The tribal members report showering or bathing in the water leading to skin irritation and difficulty breathing. Oftentimes community members will receive letters in the mail warning against the ingestion of water, notices that at times arrive several days or weeks after the initial testing that spawned those results. The main implementing act must be changed to mirror the authority and treatment of other federally recognized tribes across the United States. To quote my relative, Maria Gerard, if water is life, then what does that mean for a tribe that has been plagued with inadequate drinking water for decades? LD906 will allow the Passamaquoddy tribe better ability to, to seek short, medium, and long-term solutions to this ongoing crisis. I want to end by seriously commending the leaderships of Representative Rena Newell, Attorney, uh, Attorney Corey Hinton, and all other tribal members and leaders who have put forward this critical legislation. My heart goes out to you all. I deeply implore all members of the committee to vote ought to pass in support of LD906. Nabi Amosawagan, water is life. Kajiwiliwani, thank you. Thank you very much, Lakota. Thank you for your time uh, on so many of the bills that we've been hearing this week. Are there questions from committee members for Lakota Sanborn? Seeing none again, we thank you very much for your time and you have the appreciation of the committee. Next up will be Nikki Sakara. Nikki, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and the members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Nikki Sakara, and I'm a resident of Freiburg, the unceded territory of the Pocket, and a co founder of Community Water Justice, which is a statewide network of frontline communities working to secure protections, rights, and accessibility to clean drinking water sources through education and action for future generations. I am testifying today in support of LD906. On July 28th of 2010, through Resolution 64-292, the United Nations explicitly recognized the human right to water and acknowledged that clean drinking water and sanitation are essential to the realization of all human rights. Though Maine has yet to fully actualize this most fundamental right in its constitution, the state did, however, recognize it as a necessity when they passed LD 1121, an act to acknowledge potable water as a necessity in the 129th legislature in 2019. I have been blessed to spend time on the Passamaquoddy Reservation in Sabayak with friends who have taken me in like family. I have seen this water, smelled this water, tasted this water and have showered in it. Water of this quality is not life affirming, but a slow poisoning that creates much stress to those on the receiving end as Representative Newell, Chief Dana and others have currently previously attested. I've also traveled the nine mile distance from the reservation to the only clean water source two towns away that has been made available to people as an alternative and refilled empty containers as many on the reservation do on a regular basis. The labor, time, and resources it takes for each household to collect drinking water is an additional burden and compounds this injustice. Providing bottled water to the people is not justice, but delivering clean tap water from its source is. It is deeply troubling that Passamaquoddy people and others within the water district have been paying for water that is not safe to drink for decades. And there is an attempt as least as far back as 1986 to find an alternative source in the 122nd legislature, LD 1829. And Nikki, actually, Nikki, yes. I apologize for having to do this, but you, you've exceeded the three minutes. If you could oh, wrap okay. up in, yep. a, in a sentence or two. Thank you. Sure. Yep. Um, the Passamaquoddy Water District, as all districts, they're um, quasi um, 
municipal entities and that have not exercised its right um, in the exercise of powers within its charter to find an alternate water source through eminent domain as in title 35A chapter 64, section 6408. Mm -hmm. Nikki, I, Nikki I'm, I really am gonna have to ask and, you to, um, to, Yeah, to, I thank to, you for your time. And I did submit the, the full testimony. So um, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Um, are there, and we greatly appreciate your time. And I know it's yes. been a long day and it has been. Around <laughs> and then be told you can't finish your, your thought. No problem. Um, committee members, are there questions for Nikki Sakara? I am not seeing anyone. So again, thank you very much for your work and your time uh, with the committee today. Um, we've asked uh, Representative Newell to let us know if there are elders in the uh, attendee room. And the, once I get a list of, the, of those persons, I will call upon them as, as quickly as I can. Uh, but right now I would ask the committee clerk to please move over uh, Molly Obensawin, Celia Canavan, Morgan Pottle Urquhart, and Luke Sakara Flanders. Good afternoon and good evening and welcome back to the Com Judiciary Committee, Molly. It's nice to see you again. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Hello, uh, my name is Molly Obamswin and I am also speaking um, not for, but in solidarity with the Penobscot, uh, sorry, Passamaquoddy tribe. Um, I speak for myself as a Wabanaki person from Odenak um, and I also want to honor all of the Wabanaki leaders, representatives, and attorneys who continue to work tirelessly to educate and advocate um, on these issues, especially Representative Rena Newell, only one. Um, I honor you. The community at Zabayak has been living with this drinking water crisis for generations, as we've heard. And I imagine that most people in this legislature have never had to live with contaminated water, let alone a lifetime of it. I myself have not. But when I visit my elders and aunties at Zabayak, I feel for them too. One elder warned me not to brush my teeth with the water and that showering might give me a rash. She said not to use hot water in the shower because it will open your pores, letting more contaminants into your body. Showering and brushing your teeth, daily activities and exposure points for contaminated water. We helped her when we were visiting Zabayak by filling jugs of water 10 miles away, carrying them to her home. And when she was awaiting a heart surgery, she was unable to lift the one gallon jugs to cook with at risk of triggering her heart complications. So she had a young nephew there to help with merely lifting the water she needs for daily use. What if she couldn't have, what if, excuse me, what if her nephew couldn't have been there to help? And what are other elders doing if it is this complicated to complete daily tasks? What about all of the children who are growing up exposed to this carcinogenic water? At 26 years old, these considerations make me afraid to have children. Is this the intention of those who have blocked the tribe from pursuing solutions to this problem? The Passamaquoddy tribe could solve this problem if they didn't have to answer to the whim or prejudice of a neighboring municipality in order to provide, to provide water to their people. Resolutions sought by the tribal members have been stumbled at the state and municipal level, not the least by the application of the long controversial 1980 Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act. While short and medium term solutions are being pursued, including the costly upgrade of municipal water treatment filters, it is the location of a new drinking water source that is necessary for long-term solution. From my understanding, the filtration being attempted by PWD is causing the con contamination because Boyden's Lake is too, sh too shallow and requires high chlorine processing, which creates the THMs. When the Passamaquoddy attempted to use their fee lands in Perry as a possible new well source, the town of Perry was able to block this measure through the Settlement Act because the act allows municipalities to prohibit activities occurring on tribally acquired fee lands. LD 906 and LD 1626 would both stand to solve this decades long problem and many future problems. The legislation would state affirmatively and explicitly that the Passamaquoddy tribe would have the authority to regulate its environment under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And I implore you to vote ought to pass for LD 906. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you very much for your testimony today, Molly, and for the time that you took to spend with the committee. Are there questions from committee members for Molly? And I am not seeing any, but please uh, know you have the deep appreciation of the Judiciary Committee for your time today. Next up will be Morgan Pottle Urquat. I'm going to go with, but uh, I stand to be corrected if I am wrong. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee, and please begin your testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you. Good evening, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Morgan Pottle Urquhart, and I am the Acting Communications Manager for the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations. I'm honored to offer testimony in support of LD906. We extend deep gratitude to Representative Rena Newell and to all of the Wabanaki leaders who have been here today for introducing this bill and for their leadership on this issue. No matter who we are, where we came from, or the color of our skin, everyone deserves access to clean water. It's the most basic of human needs and human rights. Clean water is absolutely essential for thriving communities. The people of Zabayak, Pleasant Point, and Eastport have not had clean water in my lifetime. I grew up in Perry on Boyden's Lake, the shallow water supply of the Passamaquoddy Water District. Growing up, I would sometimes accompany my dad and uncle as they navigated their boat up into the lake's outlet to clear the beaver dams and milfoil that had blocked the water flow. Unlike many other lakes that serve as public water supplies, swimming is allowed. I learned how to swim in that lake. Over the 17 years I lived there, I watched the health of the lake deteriorate. As much as that lake is part of me, I can tell you for certain that it is not a suitable public water supply. I know this because the neighboring communities of Perry, Sabayak, Pleasant Point, and Eastport were and are all intricately connected. My grandparents lived in Eastport and I spent a great deal of my childhood on Moose Island. We never drank the tap water there. Even on the days it ran clear, the smell is enough of a warning. Many of the people served by the Passamaquoddy Water District are forced to either buy bottled water or to drive to nearby springs or wells to collect drinking water. My grandfather's death was the result of a car accident that occurred on such a trip. The Passamaquoddy tribe and local partners have tried for many years to solve the water quality problem, but time and again, they have been met by the roadblock of the Land Claim Settlement Act. LD906 would provide necessary tools for the tribe to finally make clean water a reality for the people of Sabayak, Pleasant Point, and their neighbors in Eastport. The bill does this in three important ways, by allowing the Passamaquoddy tribe to regulate water quality in partnership with the federal government, by exempting the Passamaquoddy Water District from property taxes, and by allowing the tribe to access water through land they already own. These policy goals all represent barriers for Wabanaki tribal communities that no other federally recognized tribes face. Today, we have the opportunity to right that wrong and allow the Passamaquoddy tribe to be the stewards of their water for the people of Zabayak Pleasant Point and the city of Eastport. Thank you for your time and consideration of this bill. We respectfully urge you to support LD906 and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your time and testimony, uh, Morgan Urquhart. Um, we greatly appreciate it. Are there questions from committee members for Morgan? I am not seeing any, but I've missed people before, so I'm just checking. Again, thank you very much. You have the appreciation of the committee for your time this evening. Next up um, is Luke Sakara Flanders. Welcome back. I believe we saw you yesterday. Um, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Luke, please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Great, thank you. Uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, members of the committee, my name is Luke Sakara Flanders. I live in Freiburg, Maine, and I am speaking on behalf of Community Water Justice today. I am also a Changemakers Fellow with the Maine Environmental Education Association and a Maine Seed with Seeds of Peace. Uh, I would quickly like to offer my sincerest appreciation for um, other people who have testified today, as well as those who haven't been able to make it, who have been working on this issue um, for years. Uh, for the last decade, I've been a part of community water justice. 
We are a statewide network of frontline communities resisting water privatization. The fundamental principle of our work is that water is and ought to be treated as a universal right. The water crisis on the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Sibayak is a glaring example of our systemic failure to ensure this right. It also demonstra demonstrates the very real consequences of the state's hegemony over Wabanaki tribes, which it has aggressively maintained for decades. I have been to Sibayak. I have seen, smelled, and tasted the contaminated water that the Passamaquoddy people are expected to live with, and it is abhorrent that the state has deemed it acceptable for human consumption. Recognizing the tribe's right to self-determination over their own drinking water is an extremely low bar for the state to meet and one that will save lives. Every day we delay a resolution to this crisis, more people are condemned to potentially devastating long-term health effects. This crisis would not exist were it not for the state's long-standing practice of paternalism and constriction in its policy toward the tribes. It is long overdue that the state honor indigenous sovereignty and pass treaties through action. And this bill is one crucial step in that direction. I therefore urge you to vote ought to pass on LD906 as it will save lives and help restore healthy water access and tribal self-determination. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your time and for your testimony this evening, Luke. Are there questions from committee members for Luke Sakara Flanders? If so, please raise your electronic hand. I am not seeing any. Again, you have the deep appreciation of the Judiciary Committee. We appreciate your being here. The final uh, person to testify in this round before I give an update of what's going to happen next is Celia Canavan. Uh, Celia is soon, been, you're right with the program. You've got your camera on and your microphone activated. Um, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney and honorable members of the Judiciary Committee. Um, I wanna start out with saying thank you for your time and commitment to hearing testimony on LD906. It's been a long day for us all, but I cannot help but give you my highest respects for hearing us on such an important matter. My name is Celia Canavan. I'm a student at the University of Maine at Farmington in my third year of undergraduate studies. I'm an activist, spiritualist, and honored to be serving as the vice president of the Maine College Democrats and president of the UMF College Democrats chapter. Today, I am representing myself and the UMF College Democrats in support of the Passamaquoddy and the need for clean, dependable water. You have and will hear the statistics and legislative malfeasances this bill gives you the chance to correct. My chapter will instead ask you for your humanity. This is a human issue. This is the issue of Maine continually getting in the way of the Passamaquoddy's inherent rights to clean water and sovereignty. This is the issue of helping our neighbors, the stewards of this land. This is a violation of human rights and the continued impact the 1980 Implementing Act has had on the Wabanaki people. When I first heard of the 40 years of contaminated water that has been flowing through the faucets of the very people who have cared for and maintained the health and beauty of this water for over 12,000 years, I couldn't help but think of the college students. I'm 20 years old, which means that this crisis has been going on long before my time, and I can't help but think of the Passamaquoddy students who are also my age, whose first time getting dependable, reliable, clean water was at their college dormitory. I'm wondering how we plan to heal those wounds, and the only way we can move forward is to accept that we are the problem. I'm asking you today to recognize that we are a place as a roadblock to dire resources and funding that could vastly help the Passamaquoddy. The Passamaquoddy water crisis is a financial, environmental, and public health disaster. Because of this, the call for allies have been made, and your young constituents are watching the way you respond to this call. We ask that you will pass LD906, not because it is only the right thing to do, but because we are discussing a life or death situation. The Passamaquoddy people are being poisoned by their water and the inability to rely on it. We're asking you to pass LD906 because water is an inherent human right and when the Waban Wabanaki hurt, we're hurting. Thank you so much and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for taking the time to deliver your testimony to our committee this evening. It's greatly appreciated. Are there questions from committee members for Celia Canavan? 
I am not seeing any. Uh, so again, thank you very much for your time. It's about 5.15. I said we would break at 5.15. Before we do, I wanna to turn to committee members. Um, first, I wanna let members of the, of the public who I know have been waiting for a long time that myself and Senator Carney are committed to uh, get through all of the persons wishing to testify on, on this bill this evening. I just wanna take an informal poll of committee members. Uh, if you could let me know if you are able to stay. We have, I believe, 13 more people signed up to testify. If you could just give me a thumbs up if um, you're able to stay. Thank you. Um, we are going to take a 10 minute break to uh, until 525. And we will get back and pick up testimony at that point. So get up, stretch, get a glass of water. Um, and I will see you all in 10 minutes. And committee members, you might want to deactivate your video and sound.
<clears throat> Committee members, as you return, if you could please activate your video so that I know we're gathering again. I've activated my video, but I need to turn some lights on in my office. You think uh, it looks like Representative Harnett? I'll be right back. Looking like a horror movie there. I'm getting a little nervous. Oh, uh, you're always full of compliments, Tom. Thank you. I meant that in a nice way, actually. I, I took it in a nice way. Oh, I'll good. be right back. Good. How are you holding up, Erin? <laughs> I'm all right. Got a couple, it sounds like we've got a couple of folks um, dropping off to attend to um, their farm chores, but. Right, we, and we're, we're going to, I'm gonna make an announcement. We're, we're not going to do the final two bills after this, but I'm gonna wait till people get back. Again, committee members, as you return, if you could please activate your video so that I know you have returned. It's getting dark here. You mentioned farm chores. I'm still listening. Oh. <laughs> yes. It's my, my former neighbor, Becky, um, has had to go to take care of her animals, but she's she's submitted written testimony in support of the bill so everyone can look at it. Okay, great. Well, anyways, I'm faking it. My wife did them tonight. Well, now the entire Twitterverse, uh, YouTubeverse knows all about that. No, they don't care about me. I don't even use Twitter. Who cares? We all, everyone cares about you, Representative. Right. We tweet about I wasn't you talking all the about time. me. I was talking about Twitter. Ah. <laughs> if uh, the previous president had stayed off, it maybe <clears throat> things would have worked out a little better. Okay, that's a good time to remind people that we are <laughs> on camera and audio. Welcome back to the meeting of the Judiciary Committee on LD906. I want to give people an update about how we are going to proceed. We have at least 13 more people to testify on this. We did have two additional bills scheduled. Given the hour, uh, we are not going to hear those bills this evening. That Those would be LD 1907 and LD 1665. Um, I apologize to anybody who has stayed with us that is here for, for one or both of those bills, but given the hour and the length of um, a hearing we had on, on Tuesday of this week, I owe it to the committee members and more importantly to the committee staff to uh, bring this to a close um, this session. But we will get back in touch as soon as possible with the rescheduling of the bills uh, introduced by Representative Collings, which is 1907 and Representative Babich which is 1665. Uh, and I see a hand up, a day, Representative Hagan, you have your hand up? Yes, I do, thank you very much. Uh, Representative Poirier had to go to a school board meeting. I think she's on the school board and has some questions for Peggy and wanted me to express that she will be sending them to her. I said, I'll take care of that. And I thought I better talk about it now because I'll forget later. It's so. good, good when you remember it because <laughs> if you're like me, it, it, they might not be there. In my head, then gone. Yeah. Uh, uh, Janet, had your you're waving your hand. I just wanted to point out um, if she could send them to me because I missed that for this bill. That's right. Yes, and I apologize. She actually did say you, and I looked at Peggy's name down there. Uh, um, it was you, so I apologize. Thank you for that reminder, Janet, and thank you for doing that for Representative Poirier. David, uh, you can let her know that even though she's at a school board, her box remains on the screen. Uh, I guess you can never you can never leave a Zoom meeting even if you want to. So let us continue with the public hearing on LD906. I am going to ask committee clerk Supi Panette to please move over Shamaya Laurel. Margot Lukens, 
Robin Hadlock Seeley, Maureen Druin, and Sarah Woodbury. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. And they are moving through the electronic universe. <clears throat> I am going to begin with, excuse me one second. I agree with that. Um, I'm going to begin with Shamaya Laurel. Uh, Shamaya, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you very much. Senator Carney, Representative Carnett and members of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to this hearing. My name is Shamaya Laurel and I live in Gouldsboro. I am here to testify in support of LD906. I am a member of MDI Racial Equity Working Group <laughs> but I am, not, I am here testifying as myself. Safe, clean drinking and cooking water is a basic requirement for health and well-being. Water that is not laden with harmful chemicals is also important for bathing and household tasks when chemicals can easily be absorbed through both skin contact and breathing of steam. I was very disturbed to learn of the lack of access to clean water on the Pleasant Point Reservation here in Maine going on for decades in spite of extensive persistent efforts by the Passamaquoddy tribe to resolve the public water supply issue. Structural issues in state legislation have especially been impeding progress. This situation has all the markings of environmental racism as we can be sure that a suburb of Portland that experienced drinking water of this quality would in short order see the problem addressed and fixed. We have of course seen in the news the problems in Flint, Michigan and in Detroit and the harm caused to communities of color by toxic water supplies. It is beyond distressing that toxic undrinkable water that is causing illness in the native community is also an issue here in Maine and that this has been going on for decades without resolution. LD906 will address this problem through protecting access to alternate supplies of groundwater from tribally owned lands and allowing the EPA and the Passamaquoddy tribe to exercise jurisdiction over safe drinking water within Passamaquoddy territory. It will also address providing a property tax exemption for Passamaquoddy Water District in order to align with the rules applied to all other water districts across the state and will authorize the Passamaquoddy tribe to access protections under federal law like every other federally recognized tribe across the country. For all of these reasons, I strongly encourage the committee to support LD906 and to vote ought to pass. Thank you very much for all of your work. I think you're rock stars for how long you hang in at these hearings. I'm like, wow. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shamaya. The committee greatly appreciates your time and delivering your testimony this evening. Are there questions from committee members for Shamaya Laurel? I am not seeing any, but again, we extend our deep appreciation for you sticking it out and uh, weighing in on this important subject. Thank you. Thank you. Next up will be Margot Lukens. Um, I think you're a repeat, you're a returner. Thank you for your testimony during the week and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Hi, thank you so much, uh, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and the members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Judiciary. Um, my name is Margot Lukens, and I reside in Orono, and I'm speaking in support of LD906. Um, I'm urging your active support of the bill, which probably, except for some existing bad legislation relative to the tribes in Maine, would not be on your desks. Under normal circumstances, taking care of a community's access to clean drinking water is a priority for which funding is earmarked and on which 
it is a no brainer to act quickly. We're talking about one of the most basic needs to human life. The contamination at issue in the Passamaquoddy Water District, trihalomethanes, can cause liver, kidney, and central nervous system damage and an increased risk of cancer with long-term exposure. The levels of trihalomethanes in Passamaquoddy Water District water are described as dangerously high. Where I live in Orno, 10 years ago, we discovered we had trihalomethane levels in our water exceeding the federal limit of 80 parts per billion. Orno's were as high as 96 parts per billion in 2012, as reported in a New York Times report on regulators' response to drinking water pollution throughout the country. In the same report, the Passamaquoddy Water District levels came in higher, as high as 150 parts per billion, about 60% high, higher than the level in Orono. Because Orono is a community with privilege, attention was quickly focused on our water purification infrastructure. By February 2014, the Bangor Daily News reported that the level of trihalomethane was below the EPA's limit of 80 parts per billion for all of 2013. And the Orono Vesey Water District had been released from a consent order to remedy the situation. The 2013 average was 76 parts per billion and the most recent test at, at the time of the report in 2014 was 66 parts per billion, according to the Water District Superintendent. In the Passamaquoddy community at Sabayak, and the and neighboring Perry and Eastport, this problem has dragged on for 40 years, the length of time since the initiation of the Implementing Act, a stark illustration of how specific systemic wrongs are perpetuated by the way the state of Maine's relationship with tribes in Maine is currently constituted. LD906 seeks in part to remedy the relationship by aligning the status of the Passamaquoddy Water District with other water districts in the state, and also to remove restrictions in the existing settlement acts, giving the Passamaquoddy tribe an opportunity to build capacity for safe drinking water and to regulate its own drinking water under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act in coordination with the EPA. This bill gives us another opportunity to stand by our tribal neighbors. The Passamaquoddy tribe is working to build a better world for tribal members and for Mainers as a whole, some of whom have never had access to clean water in their lives. I thank the committee for hearing our testimonies on LD906 and urge your support. Thank you very much, Margo Lukens, for taking the time to deliver your testimony to us this evening. The committee greatly appreciates your input. Are there questions from committee members for Margo Lukens? Seeing none again, we thank you very much for your time and concern. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now turn to uh, Robin Hadlock Seely. Robin, um, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you. Senator Carney, Representative Harnett and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Robin hadlock Seely. I live in Pembroke in Washington County, next door to the town of Perry. My testimony is short, but I've waited since 9 a.m. to provide it, and that's how strongly I feel about this issue. I'm compelled to testify in support of LD906, driven by my outrage when I learned that the Passamaquoddy community at Zabayak, my neighbors and friends, have been living with a severe water quality pro problem, not for four weeks or four months or four years, but four decades. As a native Mainer and current resident, I ask, how is it possible that a community in our state has been unable to get help to solve this problem of such a basic human right as clean water? This is absolutely shameful and unacceptable. We must work hard and quickly to right this terrible wrong. Please, oh, please vote ought to pass on LD906. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robin hadlock Seely, for spending your entire day with us and delivering your testimony this evening on LD906. The committee greatly appreciates your input. Uh, are there questions from committee members for Robin hadlock Seely? That's a good thing because I think that she is, oh no, she's still with us. But uh, uh, thank you very much again for your testimony. I will now turn to Maureen 
Druin. Uh, Maureen, good evening. Welcome to the Judiciary Committee again. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're ready to go. Thank you so much, Representative Harnett, and good evening to Senator Carney and the rest of the members of the Judiciary Committee. Again, I am Maureen Druin, Executive Director of Maine Conservation Voters, a statewide organization representing more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. I am testifying in support of LD 906. Clean water is the lifeblood of Maine. It's what we drink, where we boat, where we fish and where we swim. And if you've ever seen a Poland spring water bottle, you know that clean water is also the brand of Maine. But while Poland spring is able to tap, bottle, ship and sell hundreds of millions of gallons of clean water from Maine sources every <clears> year, <throat> Passamaquoddy tribal members whose people have been here from time immemorial are drinking polluted water from their taps. This isn't fair. Clean, safe drinking water is the basis of life itself. Investing in safe drinking water gives our kids a healthy start. But when our drinking water becomes contaminated, it can cause serious illness like cancer, reproductive problems, and learning disabilities. LD906 improves access to safe drinking water for the Passamaquoddy tribe at Pleasant Point and surrounding communities. This bill would open the door to new federal funding opportunities and gives the tribe more authority to regulate drinking water standards under federal law. It would give the Passamaquoddy Water District critically needed financial support and protects access to new sources of groundwater. The Passamaquoddy tribe, as with all people who live in Maine, deserve clean, safe drinking water. Maine Conservation Voters urges you to vote ought to pass. And thank you again for the opportunity to present this testimony. Thank you very much for your testimony, Maureen, and for uh, delivering it to us this evening. The committee greatly appreciates your input. Are there questions from committee members for Maureen Druin? And I am not seeing any. So again, thank you very much for your time. Next up, we have Sarah Woodbury. Sarah, welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please uh, begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you. Um, good evening, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, uh, Representative Newell and members of the Judiciary Committee. My name is Sarah Woodbury. I am the Director of Advocacy for Defend Our Health. We are a Maine-based nonprofit that works to make sure how everyone has equal access to safe food, safe drinking water, and toxic-free climate-friendly products. I was born in Skowhegan, but I currently live in Freeport, and I am here to testify in support of LD906. Access to clean and safe drinking water is a basic human right. Most folks in the US rarely think about where their water comes from or what it takes to make sure that it's free of toxins and safe for our kids to drink, bathe and play in. But we here at Defend have seen firsthand the stress and health impacts of those who aren't lucky enough to have access to safe drinking water. We have seen what happens when a family finds out that their water is contaminated with arsenic, radon, lead or pee. It can un upend a family's sense of safety and health. Now imagine that impact on an entire community. It is unfathomable, unacceptable, and this injustice must not continue. Usually the issue of contaminated drinking water, particularly here in Maine, tends to impact those that depend on residential wells for their drinking water. Public water systems like the PWD are tested and treated for contaminants such as arsenic and radon as a normal course of business. However, the PWD has been experiencing issues with their drinking water for decades. At various points, tribal members getting water from PWD have reported that the water is brown, smells like rotten eggs, and tastes bad. Tribal members have reported instances of skin rash or burns after bathing, potentially associated with high levels of disinfection byproducts known as trihalomethanes or THM, a side effect of aggressively treating inadequately clean source of water with older technologies. THMs are also associated with increased cancer risks and are a concern when inhaled in addition to ingested, meaning that bathing is also a concern. While PWD has technically met safe drinking water standards, members have noted that tests have not been done when the water was experiencing issues and may not be representative. For example, storms in the area can affect the water supply, causing these problems and likely increase THMs. The water is supplied by Boyden Reservoir, which has a diminished significantly over the years and is also used for agricultural and recreational purposes, contributing to this problem. The Passamaquoddy should have agency over the source of drinking water for their community. The Passamaquoddy and all other tribes in Maine should be afforded the same rights as other sovereign tribes in the US. That includes the right to provide safe drinking water for their communities. 
Access to safe drinking water should be a right that is afforded of all Maine people here in Maine. We would um, urge the committee to support LD 906 and unanimously vote ought to pass. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Woodbury, um, for your taking the time to deliver your testimony this evening. Committee members, are there any questions for Sarah Woodbury? And I am not seeing any. So again, it's with deep appreciation that we thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for your time. And I believe that is the last person from this group. I'm going to ask uh, Supi to please move over Ann O'Sullivan, Barbara Acosta, Caitlin Bernard, John Diefenbacher Kral, and Dan Morin. We will begin with Ann O'Sullivan. Ann, if you could activate your video, unmute your microphone. And as soon as I see you. Oops. I hear you. There you go. Uh, welcome to the judiciary. Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. I believe we saw you earlier this week. Uh, thank you for being here. Please begin your three minute testimony when you are comfortable. Thank you very much, Representative Harnett and Senator Carney and all the other members of the committee. My name is Ann O'Sullivan. I'm a member of the Tribal Relations Committee of the Committee on Indian Relations for the Episcopal Diocese of Maine. Our home is on Verona Island. When we bought the land, it had been a campground that had gone bankrupt. So we had a, a camp there that was condemned. We had to take it down. We built our house. Then we had to worry about sewer and water. Well, there, there's no municipal sewer water on Verona Island. Um, so uh, we were fortunate that there was a, a broken down cesspool <laughs> that happened to be on our land that used to be part of the, the campground. So we had no trouble getting a septic system, but nobody could remember where the um, common well was and nobody knew who owned it. And we certainly didn't have the rights to use it. So I called up a well company and they came over and they found that we had water underneath groundwater. So they looked, made sure that we owned the land. Um, they made sure that if they drilled in that location, it'd be far enough from the septic. It wouldn't impact the neighbors and it wouldn't um, do any harm to the road. So they drilled, we got it tested, we have water. We don't have to worry about elderly people drinking our water, our young people drinking our water. I don't have to travel into Bucksport to buy water. Maine, the way life should be. As far as I interpret that, that means the people of Sabayak should have the same rights. They own the land. They know that there, there's water underneath. They should be able to just drill, get water, and take care of their people. There should not be two different standards. I have been up there visiting with folks who happen to work with families who have lost folks and they help them with funerals. The day I was up there, my friend told me she had had 10 funerals that week. We've heard Chief Francis say that the lifespan is much less on, Sab on Sabayak than it is in the rest of Maine. It shouldn't be. Please, please get behind LD. I think I lost you. 906. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ann Sullivan, for being with us this evening and delivering your testimony. Uh, the committee extends its deep appreciation. Are there 
questions from committee members for Ann O'Sullivan? I am not seeing any again. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Next up is Dan Morin. Uh, welcome back, uh, Dan, to the Judiciary Committee. Uh, please begin your testimony, as, your three minute testimony, as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you, Chair Harnett, um, Chair Carney, members of the committee. My name is Dan Morin. I am here representing the Maine Medical Association as their Director of Communications and Government Affairs. Uh, for those unfamiliar, the Maine Medical Association is located in Manchester. It's the state's largest professional physician organization representing more than 4,300 physicians, residents, and medical students across all clinical specialties, organizations, and practice settings. Um, prior to the 130th legislature convening, the Maine Medical Association determined that public health disparities concerning minoritized populations would be considered a core foundational property as part of its advocacy efforts. Um, we're not a very diverse state and as has been um, you know, much publicized, um, there are very uh, serious health disparities, racial disparities, and um, all sorts of public policies that uh, we can do to help minoritized populations. And the physicians of Maine are really trying our best to, trying their best uh, to do better at uh, becoming involved. Um, we strongly support section two of LD 906 uh, directly relate to converting identified lands from fee to trust status, allowing those plots of land under ownership of the tribe to be drilled for groundwater. Uh, Boyden Lake's depth, depth from what we know is shallow enough that uh, can contaminants uh, make the water unusable and unsafe. Um, I was born and raised in Lewiston. I was told at a young age that our water came from Lake Auburn. I thought it was really cool driving by there every day. And I can be, I, I'm honestly, I can't remember a single negative issue, not one through the time I graduated high school uh, where there was any problem with our water. I was lucky simply because of where I was born. Um, the physicians of Maine last night at the legislative committee heard from Hannah Slattery. She's a medical student. You heard from her lately and she's gonna do great things in medicine and we're excited for her to become a, an attending physician. Um, our physician said there's no basic vital tangible need greater than water. Every cell tissue and organ in our bodies needs, to wa needs water to work properly. Um, many of us have heard about the rule of threes. It's the human body can survive three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. Aside from air, it's the most important thing. And you've heard today that they can't even drink water. And to us, that's a major problem that needs to be addressed. And I would finally bring to the attention of the committee that the top of the fold story for the Portland Press Herald yesterday had to do with high lead levels in public schools across the state. That's certainly an important public health issue, but I refer to the story only because it's the very first report of lead levels in public schools, and it was immediately deemed the most important issue of the day by the editors of the state's largest newspaper. We just heard today about major public health problems concerning drinking water in homes and throughout an entire community which has existed for decades. It's for that very reason that the Maine Medical Association strongly urges the committee to vote ought to pass on LD 906 as amended. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with the Judiciary Committee this evening, Dan. We greatly appreciate your presence and testimony. Thank you. Are there questions from committee members for Dan Warren? I'm not seeing any, so again, please accept our deep appreciation. Next up, I have a box with two names in it. Um, I'm gonna go with Barbara Acosta, but I also see a Mary Finn. So uh, you, I will let you identify yourself, uh, where you reside, any organization you represent, and please begin your three minute testimony when you're comfortable. Okay, thank you. Um, Representative Hartnett, Senator Carney, members of the Joint Standing Committee and Judiciary. My name is Mary Finn, and I am reading some of Barbara Acosta's written testimony that she submitted because she could not be here today. Um, she is a resident of Trenton and the Unitarian Universalist. She says, I am testifying on behalf of the Maine Unitarian Universalist State Advocacy Network. Musan links Maine's 26 Unitarian Universalist congregations and active legislative ministry. Our ministry is unified in support of the passage of LD 906. 
We acknowledge that the Wabanaki people occupied this land that we now call Maine for over 12,000 years, long before the European settlers arrived. They cared for its rivers, lakes, and forests in ways that we would do well to honor and emulate. As Unitarian Universalists, we recognize that the ancestors of many of us, including my own, committed atrocities against the Wabanaki people that continue to reverberate even today. Since passage of the 1980 Maine Indian Claim Settlement Implementing Act, the Wabanaki have been denied the right to make decisions of, over their own well being. This has created an unjust relationship in which the state of Maine has placed undue barriers to the provision of clean, safe water, a fundamental human right. The Wabanaki are our neighbors. LD906 will recognize the inherent sovereignty of the Wabanaki over their water. It will remove the barriers the state of Maine imposed that have kept places like the Bayek trapped in untenable and hazardous conditions for generations. It is well past time we acted to rectify this wrong. Musan urges you to vote ought to pass on LD906. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for reading in the testimony of Barbara Acosta. The committee greatly appreciates your presence here this evening. You're welcome. Are there questions from committee members for Mary Finn? And I am not seeing any again. Do you have the deep appreciation of the committee? Thank you. Next up, we have Caitlin Bernard. Uh, Caitlin, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. It's nice to see you again. Please begin your testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you very much. Good evening, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. My name is Caitlin Bernard, and I am the Natural Resources Policy Advisor for the Nature Conservancy in Maine. I was born in Fort Kent and I live in Gray, um, lifelong Manor. I appreciate this opportunity to testify on behalf of TNC in support of LD906. The Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends. Guided by science, we create innovative on the ground solutions to our world's toughest challenges so that nature and people can thrive together. Our organization has collaborated with indigenous peoples across North America and has learned that when indigenous communities have the authority to manage lands and waters, it leads to more durable conservation and stronger, more vibrant communities. Here in Maine, we not only have the opportunity to work with Wabanaki partners to advance the health of our shared natural world, but we also have the responsibility to do so. TNC has committed to work with and in support of Wabanaki tribes here in Maine to support this goal. Much of my written testimony has already been said, so I'll sort of touch on a couple unique points that I, I feel like haven't been brought into the conversation yet. Um, I will note that you know several of our staff through working with Passamaquoddy leaders and tribal communities across the state, but I guess specifically with Passamaquoddy leaders have heard from tribal members about this issue, including personal accounts of frightening experiences with brown and black water coming out of the tap. As the water levels in Boyden Lake and natural cycles change over the course of the year, the water requires significant chemical treatment measures. These problems are exacerbated after heavy rains, high winds, and severe storms wash organic matter into the shallow lake. You've already heard much of that today. However, the ongoing impacts of climate change has increased the severity and frequency of severe storms in our state, which will continue to deteriorate the conditions at Boyden Lake and the Passamaquoddy Water District. Um, I'll skip a little ahead to say, you know, safe drinking water is not only a fundamental need of any community, but it is recognized by the United Nations as a critical sustainable development goal. LD 906 would give the Passamaquoddy tribe agency over the source of drinking water for their community by putting the regulation of drinking water under the jurisdiction of the tribe and the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. This regulatory structure mirrors that of other federally recognized tribes in the U.S. Bill would also allow the tribe to incorporate two parcels of land that they already own into trust, which could serve as a new source of clean drinking water for their community. 
LD906 may even give the Passamaquoddy tribe additional avenues to access the $55 billion investment in water infrastructure available from the federal government through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. I'm happy to answer any questions now or in the future, and I urge you to support LD906. Thank you very much, Caitlin. Thank you for being here this evening, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Judiciary Committee. Are there questions for Caitlin Bernard from members of the committee? I am not seeing any again. Please accept the deep appreciation of the committee for your time and testimony. Next up, we have John Diefenbacher Kral. John, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. For welcoming me. Uh, when we first met, I didn't think nearly 40 years later <clears throat> we would still be trying to impact public policy, but we are. So, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and members of the Judiciary Committee, I am John Diefenbacher Kral, Executive Director of the Wabanaki Alliance. Heard lots of people uh, testify here today. I hope I provide you a little new information. You should have my written testimony before you. Few things are more fundamental to sustaining life than water. The Passamaquoddy tribe has endured a nightmarish ordeal struggling to provide its people with something most Mainers can take for granted, safe, clean drinking water. Maine governmental policy has greatly exacerbated the problems confronted by the Sabayak tribal government and its work to secure a basic necessity of life for its people. The Wabanaki Alliance strongly supports LD906, and we urge the Judiciary Committee to deliberate with urgency to consider this bill. Passamaquoddy lives and wellness will be affected by your action or lack thereof. Almost 14 years ago, the Maine legislature unanimously endorsed the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples through the action of Passamaquoddy Tribal Representative Donald Soctoma and Penobscot Nation Tribal Representative Donna Loring. And I was want to point out there are four articles of that declaration I think directly apply in my three minutes. I'm not going to have a chance to read all the articles, but you can see them. Article 23, Passamaquoddy Tribal Representative Rena Newell, Passamaquoddy Citizen and Attorney Michael Corey Hinton, and others have detailed the many efforts of the Sabayak Tribal Government to provide safe drinking water to its people. And the UNDRIP Article 23 affirms the Sabayak right to develop potable drinking water without interference from other governments. Article 26 has applicability to the Sabayak drinking water situation as the town of Perry has effectively blocked the tribe from developing a drinking water source that would provide safe drinking water. Article 29 supports the Sabayak interests in pursuing treatment as a state status and to implement the Safe Drinking Water Act with the federal government. And I will read Article 38. Article 38 states in consultation and cooperation with indigenous peoples shall take the appropriate measures, including legislative measures to achieve the ends of this declaration. UNDRIP Article 38 speaks to the urgency of this situation that I identified in the second paragraph of my testimony. The state of Maine should act and please support by passing LD906. Thank you very much for being in front of the Judiciary Committee this evening, John. And it is hard to believe it's been 40 years since we crossed paths in a different state capitol. Thank you for being here. Committee members, are there questions for John Diefenbacher Kral? Seeing none again, thank you very much for your time and testimony today. I am now going to turn to our final five people who have signed up, asking committee clerk to please move over Cyrilla Francis. I hope I said that first name correctly. Christopher Kayer, Rebecca Bulos, Glennon Friedman, Martin Chartrand. And I am going to wait until Carilla Francis makes it over.
And Carilla, I hope I'm pronouncing your first name right. I have no trouble with the second name. Um, but welcome to the Judiciary Committee. Please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you are comfortable. Thank you so much. You chopped it up just as much as they did when I was graduating from um, University of Maine for my master's program. It's actually Cirilla. Cirilla. Yes. I apologize. That's fine. Thank you so much. Oh, I feel like I know you all um, intimately <clears throat> by now. Um, I've been here since nine o'clock. So like you all, um, you have been too. I admire your stamina. Greetings, Senator Carney, Representative Harnett, and honorable members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Cyril Lewis, Reskidmoka Nil, Zibai Nujayo, Chik Nokchuk Nil Dolnabemu. My name is Cyrilla Francis. I live in Zibaik. I'm here to testify in support of LD 906, an act to provide Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. Please bear with me as I have mentioned a portion of this testimony earlier this week. When I was growing up in the 1960s in a little village of approximately 300 Passamaquoddies, my family and I were recipients of the state and or federal food commodities distributed by the Indian agent, a representative of the state of Maine. This experience was the first of many that told me we as Passamaquoddy people had no control over what we received. Therefore, what we ate affected how we lived our lives. Thankfully, this part of my life is no more. However, the feeling of not being in control of my life as a Passamaquoddy tribal citizen persists because I feel the state of Maine continues to dictate how we live our lives in many aspects. As a youth, I, in addition to my siblings, had certain responsibilities for survival and the maintenance of a co cohesive family unit. One of my jobs was to collect buckets of water from nearby pumps, summer, winter, rain, or snow. We had to fetch this water every day. It wasn't until years later that I learned this water was not fit for human consumption. Another example of how the state is exercising its perceived jurisdictional authority neglected our very basic need. Accessing clean water is a human right, yet the, here we are again facing the issue of having to live with poor water quality. For many years, we've, had, we've not had clean, clear, safe water available to tribal families. I didn't think I'd have to relive the problem of drinking water not fit for human consumption, but decades later, here we are again. Imagine for a minute you having to bathe yourself or your children or grandchildren in discolored water. Imagine your elderly parents or grandparents having to drink and cook with smelly water. Imagine washing your laundry and destroying your clothes from using dirty water. You probably can't. While these are the inhumane conditions I and my people live in. Because of the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement Act, we do not have the sovereignty to regulate our own drinking water. Instead, the state of Maine blocks us with restrictions. This is not right. So the passage of LD 906 would change that. We would move from this time of helplessness to securing the right to clean water as other federally recognized tribes across the nation. Self-governance is an inherent right we should be recognized to exercise. The self-rule will give us freedom to determine our economic, social, and cultural growth without interference from the state of Maine perceived jurisdictional authority. Currently, there are approximately 570 federally recognized tribes in the United States who exercise self-governance. We want to be treated as equals to other federally recognized tribes and regain the sovereignty once held prior to the main Land Claims Settlement Act. In closing, I ask you support the passage of 906, LD 906 to hold. I'll be happy to answer any questions the committee might have at this time. Thank you. Only one. Thank you very much, Cirilla, for your testimony and taking the time this evening to deliver it to the Judiciary Committee. Are there questions from committee members for Cirilla Francis? I would just like to second your thanks um, so much for hanging in there all day long with us as well. 
Thank you. Thank you. And please accept the deep appreciation of the committee for your time. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm seeing, it's like a reunion, seeing so many familiar names and faces on the board as, our, as we wrap up today's testimony. Uh, next up, we have Glennon Friedman. Glennon, um, nice to see you back. Please feel free to begin your testimony, three minute testimony, as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. It has been a long day for all of us. Um, my name is Glennon Friedman. I live in Bar Harbor and I'm speaking in support of LD906. It is an unbelievable affront to the Passamaquoddy people who have a legacy of thousands of years of responsible stewardship of lands and waters that this basic human right to clean water is being hampered by state regulatory roadblocks. These regulatory roadblocks would be cleared with the passage of LD 1626, a state acknowledgement of tribal sovereignty. In the meantime, the issues which have led to unsafe drinking water in Sapayak profoundly illustrate the ways the state has hamstrung the tribes in Maine. It is appalling that the people of Pleasant Point do not have safe drinking water. I have never had to worry about the water coming out of my faucet. Have you? Passapakadu. The Passamaquoddy tribe has been diligently working to ensure the health and well-being of their people. They have identified the obstacles in the way of achieving this goal and have drafted a solution in this bill. Drinking water is the very necessity, is the first necessity for us all. The state of Maine has a long history of racism and indifference with respect to the lives of the first people of this land. It is our first responsibility as white people to correct our course. A simple, humane, corrective first step is to pass LD906. This is an emergency. There's nothing more basic than clean water. Act now, vote ought to pass LD906. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Glennon, for taking the time to be with us and deliver your testimony this evening. Uh, you have our deep appreciation. Committee members, are there questions for Glennon Friedman? I am not seeing any, but again, thank you very much on behalf of the committee. I will next turn to Christopher Kayer. Um, I think it was also another familiar face. Um, so welcome back to the Judiciary Committee and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, distinguished members of the Judiciary Committee. <clears throat> My name is Chris Kerr and I live on Wabanaki Lamb, what is now known as Stratton, Maine. Today, I'm submitting my testimony in support of LD 906. I was honored to be here on Tuesday to provide testimony on LD 1626. I was moved by the 100 plus people who signed up to testify in person, and as I understand it, over 1,600 written testimonials. I've been working as a political director in Maine since 2015, and I've never seen such an incredible show of support for a legislative document, underlying the importance and urgency of addressing these tribal issues here in Maine. LD906 is an emergency measure to provide clean drinking water to the Passamaquoddy Reservation at Pleasant Point and to nearby mun municipalities. It's hard to believe that we have to be here today to discuss the merits of providing clean drinking water. I grew up believing that the right to clean water was implied in the protections of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness outlined in the U.S. Constitution, as well as through a U.N. resolution that explicitly recognized the human right to water and sanitation in 2010. I grew up believing that no one living within the borders of the United States would go, would go without access to clean drinking water. The truth is that people like me don't have to worry about clean water. According to a recent study, 2.2 million Americans lack access to safe drinking water. Latino and African American households are twice as likely as white households to lack this basic human need, while Native Americans are 19 times more likely, according to the report. 19 times more likely. As I understand it, people at Pleasant Point are having to travel up to 10 miles to fill jugs for cooking, drinking, and everyday water use. Most of us don't have to travel 10 miles to go to the grocery store, get our morning latte. This blatant inequity needs to be fixed. 
We need to stop brushing these issues under the rug. It's time to stand with the people in this country who have been systematically oppressed. Please do the right thing and vote ought to pass on LD906. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Christopher. And though I recognized your face, I mispronounced your last name. I'm sorry, it's Care. And uh, thank you for expressing that this evening. Um, are there questions from committee members for Christopher Care? I am not seeing any, so please accept the deep appreciation of the Judiciary Committee for your time and testimony. Thank you. Next up, we will have Martin Shortrand. Martin, welcome back to the Judiciary uh, Committee. The Thank you. Plus um, my video is coming on here, I think. But the 140 million. Uh, just a moment. Not seeing you yet. Take, take your time. Thank you. And please begin your testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you, uh, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. Thank you for uh, listening through this long day. My name is Martin Chartrand. I live on Penobscot lands as a settler in the city of Bangor, and I work as an insulation contractor and weatherization technician and writer. I am here to urge you to support LD906, an act to provide the Passamaquoddy tribal members access to clean drinking water. I've lived on Penobscot lands my whole life, uh, and I've had the opportunity to visit and work on the lands traditionally cared for by the Passamaquoddy. Uh, I'm grateful to live here and I also know that European colonists like my own ancestors took this land and that Wabanaki people still live here and face great injustices, among them the decades-long uh, lack of clean drinking water in Sapayak. So to me, the gift of living here comes with the responsibility to make that history and that present right. Uh, I am not an expert on water quality, so I hear what I've heard from all of the testifiers today and many, many uh, witnesses from the Passamaquoddy tribe for years that uh, this is a problem. And also, as, as I've been educated by my neighbors who are Wabanaki, the history of hurt of colonization is something that is ongoing and keeps happening and it's made up of many small hurts that add up to make life overwhelmingly difficult and, and large hurts like this. And uh, those include many things that were brought up today, like uh, racial slurs being used commonplace in public discourse, uh, children being taken from families unjustly, traditional hunting and fishing lands uh, being privatized or polluted. And this is part of destroying culture or trying to destroy culture, but the Wabanaki people survive and thrive, and they have the courage and generosity to lead the effort to work through this legislative process to correct the harms that are being done to them. And the least we can do is show up as settlers and put the same faith and work into that process of correcting those harms. So when the Passamaquoddy tribe at Sapayak being one of the few communities in Maine who have for decades had to drive 10 miles to access clean water or risk cancer or kidney problems. And when the tribe is actually disallowed from creating a new water source on its own lands due to the way the land is designated as fee land under the Maine Indian Land Claims Settlement Implementing Act, giving a municipality a jurisdiction to decide what they can do on it. And when the tribe is not able to regulate its own water source under the Clean Water Act, due to the same Maine Indian Land Claims Implementing Act. We can't just tell ourselves those are simply a series of unfortunate circumstances. They add up to something very devastating. And this is not any one individual's fault or institution's fault, yet each of us as settlers who benefit from living in this incredibly beautiful land have the responsibility to see that big picture and to work to fix it and you as legislators are in the most important position. Martin, I, I apologize yes. for having to interrupt, but you've exceeded your three minutes. So I'm gonna need you to wrap it up if you could in a sentence or two. 
thank you. I ask you to please take the responsibility of using your position to uh, vote out to pass on this and work to make sure it passes and is signed by the governor. Thank you for your time. Thank, thank you very much, Martin, and thank you for your testimony during the course of this week. It's greatly appreciated by the Judiciary Committee. Are there questions from committee members for Martin Shortrand? And I am not seeing any, but please accept the deep appreciation of the committee for your time and testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, <clears throat> we have, I think it was Becca Bulos. Um, and uh, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, Becca. Uh, and please begin your three minute testimony as soon as you're comfortable. Thank you um, and, and good evening, Representative Harnett, Senator Carney and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committee on Judiciary. It is nice to see you all again. Uh, I am not often in front of this committee and yet I've been here twice this week and it has been my honor to express MPHA's support of LD 1626 and now LD 906. Um, my name is Becca Bolas. I'm a resident of South Portland and executive director of Maine Public Health Association. MPHA is the state's oldest, largest, and most diverse association for public health professionals. We represent more than 600 individual members and 50 organizations across the state. The, our mission is to improve and sustain the health and well being of all people in Maine through health promotion, disease prevention, and the advancement of health equity. Potable and readily available water are necessary for the protection of public health, whether it's used for drinking, sustenance through fishing, or food production. Ensuring water potability and better management of water resources improves economic growth, lowers healthcare costs and disease risk, and reduces poverty. We know there are challenges to safe drinking water for people in Maine. We're aware of contamination from PFAS, arsenic, radon, and lead, which you heard about earlier from Sarah at Defend Our Health. We have strongly supported investments to address those contaminants. Unfortunately, we tend to see contaminated water in communities that are already at greater risk for and experiencing greater burdens of disease, including later stage diagnoses. And these tend to occur in communities where people who have lower income, those living in rural areas, and those with less access to health care. We believe the solution to this situation is different than those others that we've seen across the state. The ability to correct this contamination is prevented by jurisdictional barriers. That is not a barrier we see with other drinking water safety concerns. That it has taken four decades to rectify this contamination is a clear example of structural inequity. I don't typically share personal information in our testimony uh, because I am representing the association, but I do just want to share that yesterday we were discussing this in our board policy committee and I, I shared with the board that I turned 40 on March 1st, you know, just in a couple of weeks. And it's just incomprehensible um, to me that people have lived without clean drinking water for my entire life, um, that every time they turn on the tap to drink or to take a shower, they were concerned about their safety and the safety of their community. I live now in South Portland, but I grew up in Cape Elizabeth in Senator Carney's district. And I know that if this problem existed there, it would have been solved as soon as the first uh, it was first discovered. Uh, a similar sentiment to what you heard earlier from Margot. Um, I firmly believe, the association firmly believes that it is past time that policies change and that the structural barriers to providing clean drinking water are removed. Clean drinking water is fundamental for good health. We strongly support efforts to ensure safe drinking water for all people. We believe it is a matter of public health, safety, and equity. And we respectfully request that you vote LD906 ought to pass. And I thank you for your consideration and your time today. I know it's been a, a long couple of days. But we do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Becca, for taking the time to stick with us all day and into the evening to present us testimony on LD906. It is, it is greatly appreciated. Are there questions from committee members for Becca Bulos? And I am not seeing any, but again, please accept our deep appreciation for your input. And that is the last person that I have signed up to testify, but I always go back to the attendee room and I will ask if there are any other persons who wish to testify in support of LD906, if so, please raise your electronic hand. And I have one, and that is, could I please have Kerry Merrill moved over as a panelist, please? Thank you. 
Welcome back to the Judiciary Committee, Kelly Merrill. Uh, when you are set, please activate your camera so I can see you. We can all see you. And please begin your testimony when you're comfortable. You're muted, Kelly. One moment. Um... I'd like to open by expressing my gratitude to the Wabanaki people upon whose land we sit today. Good evening, Chairs, Senator Carney and Representative Harnett, Representative Newell, Tribal Chiefs, esteemed elders and members of the Judiciary Committee. Thank you for the opportunity at this late time to provide testimony today in support of LD 906. My name is Kelly Merrill. I reside in Abenaki territory in what is now known as Skowhegan. I'm not with any organization. I'm an activist and community organizer. LD906 will help ensure that the tribes of the state have access to clean drinking water, a basic human right, that the original inhabitants and 12,000 year stewards of this land have been unable to access clean water for decades is shameful and must be resolved. LD906 would free up resources for filter upgrades and maintenance of the systems necessary to treat a water treat the water from a shrinking water resource. Um, you've heard about boil water advisories and high levels of trihalomethanes, and that there are 618 households affected in Spayek who must travel 10 miles to fill jugs at a pump or spend considerable resources that most don't have to purchase bottled water for drinking and cooking. Chief Dana herself lugs water back to elders. And as you've heard from others, the water is so unsafe that caregivers won't allow children to swim or bathe in it because their skin is erupting in rashes and sores. Indigenous people of the Dawnland have survived genocide and all manner of destructive colonial forces, including the state of Maine itself. It's wrong that they should not, not now need to, that they should now need to fight for access to clean water and the right to protect it but here we are. The state of Maine's treatment of Wabanaki tribes has been noted by justice of the court, people here today, as well as the United Nations, um, whose 2015 investigation found that Maine in particular had limited the self-determination of the tribes. As Michael Kebede of the ACLU noted er in earlier testimony today, the UN found that Maine had created conditions of extreme poverty, high impact health consequences, lower life expectancy, and limited educational and economic opportunities. These are inadequate and sanitized words to paint the picture of what life looks like on the ground. It's time for the state to address the continuation of harms to Wabanaki people. Ensuring access to clean water is essential to being able to step in the right direction and it is no substitute for recognizing sovereignty in order to remedy some of the systemic oppressions imposed on Wabanaki people by the state. Respectfully, I urge the committee to vote LD906 ought to pass. Winnie Machoni, water is life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly, for taking the time to present testimony to the committee this evening. We greatly appreciate it. Are there questions from committee members for Kelly Merrow? I am not seeing any, but again, please accept our deep appreciation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. I'm going to go back to the attendee room one more time to ask if there are any persons wish, wishing to testify in support of LD906. Seeing none, I will ask if there are any persons who wish to testify in opposition or against LD906. As a, a final word, are there any persons who wish to testify neither for nor against LD906? And I am not seeing any. So having heard from all persons wishing to testify on LD906, I want to extend my thanks to the bill sponsor, Representative Rena Newell, for bringing this bill forward. I want to thank the members of this committee for yet a very another long day of listening to very emotional and important testimony. I wanna thank both of our analysts, Janet Stucco, Peggy Reinch, and our committee clerk, Supi Panette. Um, we could not do this without you. So 
uh, to everybody who's still listening. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. And with that, I will close the committee's work for today, except noting that we will reschedule as soon as possible, LD 1907 and LD 1665. Please um, get home to where you go safely and uh, have a good evening. Take care. Thank you. Well, well done, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well done, Tom. Thank you, Senator. You, you too, Senator. You did a great job. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, Rita.